Please take your seats. We're going to get started. My name is Daniel Messager. I'm a journalist in healthcare, and I have the pleasure of uh, moderating this two-day uh, seminar on emerging infectious diseases. We have over 300 people here, and we have dozens more attending remotely. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Stuart Cole, Director General of the Pasteur Institute. Thank you, Stuart, for welcoming us here in your beautiful premises. And also, yes, Daniel Stepanaha. Stuart Cole, you have the floor. Bon, ben, on y va. Um, Madame la Directrice Générale de l'Agence de l'Innovation Santé. Uh, Director General of the Healthcare Innovation uh, Agency, Director of ANRSMIE, dear colleagues, dear friends, dear Yazda and Yazdan Pana, scientific uh, research is one of the most uh, exciting aspects of the human adventure. This is something that Francois Jacob said. And I'm happy to reference him in welcoming you to this today science uh, seminar organized by ANRS MIE. Many thanks, dear Yazdan, for choosing the Pasteur Institute for this event, uh, an event that is both cross-cutting and collaborative. We bring to together the community of, uh, of players, who seek to advance healthcare and research. ANRSMIE plays an important role in this amazing adventure that François Jacob was referring to. And I would like to salute the work he's done on coordinating uh, the uh, fight against all those diseases, including uh, COVID, uh, tuberculosis, uh, etc. These are key to science, but also to the lives of our fellow citizens. As shown by the COVID-19 pandemic, There's always going to be new diseases. Charles Nicol used to say, it's as certain as death and taxes. And the NRSMIE will continue to fight those uh, EIDs, which constitute a growing threat to our societies. Uh, at a time of globalization, climate change, and social crises. Research on EIDs is a scientific priority as part of a strategic plan. The COVID-19 pandemic has led to efforts by over 500 scientists that are part of the Pasteur Institute, and they have generated over 130 publications, 25 patents, and the creation of a startup company. This was created by Truffle Capital in 2021 in collaboration with uh, the Pasteur Institute. So past, Spikin has received public funds to the tune of 15 million euros to fast track industrial and clinical uh, research on monoclonal antibodies that would work against SARS-CoV-2 as part of the uh, EID uh, acceleration strategy funded by France 2020-30. In addition, the Pasteur Institute continues to work hard in the areas of public health uh, in synergy with uh, basic research via its medical centers and also the various uh, units and uh, activities. Uh, we're proving how useful this is in the fight against the pandemics, including monkeypox. Uh, there are many exciting scientific uh, research currently carried out by the Pasteur Institute, uh, including uh, coordination of a new EU uh, network of laboratories uh, funded by the European Authority for preparedness uh, and uh, response uh, against uh, uh, health emergencies. Active participation in the work of the EU Consortium on Regimen, Regimen Acceleration Against Tuberculosis. And I have the honor of being the scientific lead of that effort. And there's also strong impetus for collaboration. And this is very uh, positive within the Pasteur Network, which brings together 32 members across the world. We're also laying the groundwork for the future with a new research center. 
in uh, vector-based uh, diseases. By 2026, this CMTV center will include the advanced imaging uh, platforms and uh, electron scanning microscopes and anything that's needed to research vector-based diseases. At the moment, uh, research is, uh, is a collective adventure. And I would like to thank and say hello uh, to all of our partners, whether industry or academia, not forgetting our many uh, sponsors and donors who support our research efforts. ANRSMIE is an important partner for the Pasteur Institute. We collaborate on a lot of projects. This collaboration is very fruitful, in particular, in particular, and that our Pasteur Institute uh, researchers are involved in the PEPR uh, uh, program funded by France 2030. This is an ambitious partnership designed to set up a infectious bio cluster in the middle of Paris as part of the uh, Innovation Santé 2030 plan. This is an active role in the current discussions carried out under the aegis of ANRSMIE for a national vaccination initiative. Vaccine research uh, is seeing more and more impetus at the international level. And I would like to say hello to Professor Adrian Hill, who is with us today. He hails from the prestigious uh, General Institute in Oxford, which uh, is a leading player in uh, vaccine research. Welcome, Adrian. The Pasteur Institute is determined to act as a leading player in that field. It currently runs an important uh, vaccine research and immunotherapy uh, center called CVI in connection with a number of public sector and private sector uh, partners. Lastly, allow me to reference uh, three uh, key uh, challenges for the future of research in France for healthcare biology. First of all, research funding. The recent report by Alain Fischer, president of the Science Academy, has a shed light over uh, how late and fragile our country is in that most important field. Measures have been taken via the LPA as well as France 2030, but those measures are not enough. They fall far short of the resources available to our partners and our competitors. If we want the country of Pasteur to remain uh, a leading light in the world of science, it is important to massively invest in research. Secondly, the regulatory framework for research. Well, there are so many constraints that the excessive constraints uh, that make uh, harder the lives of researchers. Uh, particularly when it comes to protection, uh, data protection, uh, GDPR, or clinical research. Fast-tracking, uh, streamlining efforts is necessary. And lastly, scientific mediation and, uh, and opening up society. Scientific research is an amazing challenge. We need to listen to citizens and we also need to educate them. Let us be citizens that are both creative and committed. These are such important challenges for the future of that amazing adventure. And I'm referring to scientific research. Uh, we're talking amazing advances and sometimes we do fail. Of course, sometimes we feel doubt, but there's always hope at the end of the tunnel. A quick, a quick reminder, this is the 40-year anniversary of the discovery of HIV-1 by Professors Luc Montagnier and Françoise Barry ducy On behalf of the Pasteur Institute and in partnership with ANRSMIE, I am delighted to invite you to the symposium that will commemorate the anniversary of the discovery of HIV, which will be held right here on November 29th and uh, December 1st, 2023. Thank you for your attention and uh, enjoy the seminar. Thank you, Stuart Cole. Now let us welcome Yazdan Yazdampana. Thank you. 
Director of the uh, Health Innovation Agency, dear Liz, uh, Director General of the Pasteur Institute, dear Stuart, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends. To you for hosting this uh, scientific uh, seminar. This is uh, particularly symbolic and important in 2023. As Stuart rightly said, 2023 marks the 24, pardon me, the 40 year anniversary of the discovery of HIV. And also, this is a testament to the joint efforts of both our institution for many, many years uh, in the fight against uh, uh, infectious diseases. ANRSMIE was created two years now, based on strong pillars, based on the strong uh, pillars of the legacy ANRS agency. This is a very important and a very innovative model. So <coughs> we were created in the middle of the COVID pandemic, which was not easy. We built our organization in the middle of the COVID pandemic, and that is something we need to continue. When it comes to HIV, tuberculosis, uh, uh, hepatitis, uh, these are some of the challenges that we need to address, but they're also emerging in major crises uh, that we need to address. Uh, so we know that coordination and uh, effectiveness, effectiveness and efficacy actually relies on a model that is based on collaboration. And this is why together we, the science board, that I'm very grateful to for their commitment. This is how we've built uh, the uh, program of this seminar. It's all about collaboration. This is part and parcel of our, IA, of our ideas, our identity, and our values. Daily collaboration is in our DNA. It's in the DNA of researchers. It's in the DNA of our institutions, our, our, our nonprofits, and representatives of the community who've turned out in such great numbers today. Many thanks to that. Many thanks also to our supervisory ministers and ministries for supporting us through the crisis. And also, they've supported the agency throughout the process. Stuart did reference the, the various sources of funding that we have received throughout the crisis. Many thanks to our donors and sponsors. So, I really would like to thank the HAS and Santé Publique France. They've sent many members to us today. Um, the director cannot be here today because she's attending a CDC meeting in Stockholm today. But uh, Ian Sen is also working with us. And I hope that in future we will also work with IES. Many thanks also to our many partners internationally. We work into them in the field of research. And we need those international partners. Without them, the fight against the pandemic uh, is neither possible nor effective. And this is why I'm particularly happy that we've been able to uh, complete a new partnership with two new countries. So we work with Senegal, Burkina Faso, and Mali, Cameroon. We work in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. But we also have new partnerships with Guinea, the DRC, thanks to the creation in particular of international health research platforms, global platforms with all of these countries. These partnerships bind us to health authorities and decision makers in those countries. And also we have even stronger connections with academia in those countries. And there's also an important regional and international aspect, which is based on fairness, equity, while taking into account the specific uh, uh, circumstances of those uh, countries. And we're also working together with all our partners in France. Also, on the international front, we've worked hard with international organizations such as WHO. We've signed a framework agreement with WHO. We're also working with ONIH very closely. Our collaborative model 
is something that we will need to further clarify. Uh, by developing a new scientific strategy, the strategy has already been introduced to many of you, but it will be disclosed in, 20, in, 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 in two weeks. I didn't want to do it today because I didn't want to ramp up the pressure on the agency, but uh, I promise that that information will soon be available. As I said before, it's, uh, we can always do better. And this is why the, the building process of our agency is, uh, is ongoing. As far as the next few years are concerned, as far as 2023 is concerned, we need to better define our research priorities. It's important. We need to set a course. And it is important for the researchers themselves to set that course because we are an agency that brings together communities and researchers. Um, Cross-cutting research is important. Vertical efforts as well, but we need cross-cutting uh, efforts around vaccines, cures, and modeling efforts. Also, it is important that finally, of course, things are not over, but uh, it's it's wonderful that we're able to take off our face coverings of course we need to be careful when it comes to the future but 2023 seems to mark the end of the covid pandemic and so we need to work harder on our facilitation efforts it's an important priority for 2023 and the next few years we need to bring in the new generation the new generation is going to maybe be your priority. We keep saying that we're 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 good at research, but I do think that we need fresh blood. We need young blood. We need young people, and we need to do things so for young people so that they will do more research. And talking about vaccination, we need more young people involved in vaccine development efforts. I read the Stewart's speech yesterday. I didn't know he was going to talk about it. And sorry, but this bears a repetition. We need advocacy when it comes to regulatory constraints. The only way to shift the lines is by working together with patient groups in particular. We also need to work with other institutions. I believe that is an important priority. In closing, I would like to thank you all for being here today. Our agenda today reflects what the agency wants to be. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's impetus, it's partners, it's uh, research efforts, it's science, many thanks to all of our guests, wherever they come from, the UK, of course, but further afield as well. Thank you for being here, even though you lost the recent rugby game. Many thanks to our South African friends for being here today, and our African friends at large, Senegal, Cameroon, Côte d'Ivoire, and Burkina Faso in particular. And thank you for being here to share this very special time for our agency. And as you know, that today is the first day of spring. It's also, it's also the new year in Iran and uh, I have a thought, let's have a thought for all of our Iranian friends who are fighting for their rights and their freedoms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yazdan Pana. We'll now hear a video addressed by Sylvie Rotaillot, Minister for Higher Education and Research. Director General of ANRSMIE, Dear Yazdan, Director General of the Pasteur Institute, dear Stuart, ladies and gentlemen, in your capacities, I could not be there with you today to open this science seminar of ANRSMIE, but I wanted to address those fortunate enough to be here in person in the auditorium of the Pasteur Institute. The fact that this scientific seminar is being organized shows once again that the NRSMIE, as well as the INSERM Institute, are determined to continue learning from recent crises and also to play their part in a government-backed strategy to make sure that France is prepared for future crises. 
The research program on the emerging infectious diseases <coughs> is part and parcel of the MIE NRBC acceleration strategy. This program is a major response building effort with uh, the first RFP ending on April 24th. We've decided to position an ANRSMIE as the go-to scientific player for the research component of the crisis response. ANRSMIE is in charge of establishing the state of the art and mobilizing the scientific forces present and reporting scientific and research requirements to the authorities in case of emerging diseases. Against this backdrop, HIV, which was discovered 40 years ago at the Pasteur Institute, but also viral therapies and, and tuberculosis can be considered as ongoing crises. The government strongly supports the agency's ambitious objectives in the fight against those diseases and the special strategic focus on implementation research, vaccine research, and research into treatments that allow for complete remission of those diseases. In order to achieve those objectives, working internationally has never been so essential. And today, I wish to commend the European commitment of ANRSMIE, which coordinates the Be Ready Consortium. The objective of that consortium is to formulate a European research agenda to fight against pandemics. We had the opportunity to enshrine the international commitment of ANRSMIE recently by formalizing the creation of an international global health research platform called PRISMA. This platform was created in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in the presence of the President of the French Republic. The creation of the PRISMA platform is a testament to the evolution and modernization of the agency's international efforts, which now include emerging diseases. Designed by ANRSMIE, in collaboration with its French and international partners, those platforms are intended to provide a discussion framework for multiple stakeholders and international consultations that it is based for pooling efforts and resources and finally to ensure a research continuum that ranges from identifying to showcasing research priorities. Lastly, France is hosting the European and Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership Forum this year in November. It is with support of from my ministry and, of course, of ANRSMIE. And this EDCTP is an EU-funded partnership between institutions that are mandated by the governments of 15 European countries, but also 21 African countries. Holding this event in Paris this year will, I'm sure, highlight our international collaboration on clinical research in order to better prepare for as well as better respond to emergencies and emerging diseases. We have strong ambitions for biomedical research. This science seminar is an opportunity to showcase those <coughs> ambitions and turn them into healthcare products for our fellow citizens. And that is why the government is extremely active in the transformation of research outcomes into health products. This mobilization has also resulted in the creation of the Health Innovation Agency to fast track the innovation process up to market launch. It uh, remains for me to wish you all the best for these uh, two days of scientific discussions. I would like to thank you all once again for this commitment, for your commitment to research. C'est donc un programme bien cher.
So we have our work cut out for us, a uh, very dense program for the next two days, five sessions. There will be 20 minute presentations and make sure I'm sure you, you, you know, I'll make sure that uh, everybody sticks to their allotted time. There will be 10 minute presentations for young researchers, no questions. Otherwise, there will be questions at the end of the sessions. There will be two moderators per session. For the very first session, we're going to, um, make a review of the stakes uh, of vaccination. Stefan Paul cannot attend uh, as a moderator. He has uh, transportation issues due to the current strike. So Anne-Sophie Bignon will be my co-moderator for this session. Anne-Sophie Bignon works on the immunological uh, mechanisms uh, underlying vaccination. The IDMIT uh, body, uh, Fontenay Rose uh, in the CEA body, and it's a transversal session regarding the challenges of zoonosis and emerging diseases. We will also discuss France 2030 and the national strategy. And Sophie Bignon, a few words by way of introduction. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to share with you the honor, but also the pleasure of being the co-moderator of the session on vaccines and the challenges uh, of vaccination today. I'd like to thank the colleagues uh, for putting together such an interesting agenda. It's going to give us a very accurate uh, picture of uh, research uh, for vaccines and the most innovating uh, discoveries. Uh, just to illustrate the challenges we are facing, and uh, in order so that we protect ourselves uh, in the best possible manner against the infectious diseases that have been around for, for, for some time, the new diseases and the future diseases. So it's going to be a road trip in the country of vaccines. We will talk about pathogen agents, uh, infectious uh, diseases, uh, malaria, COVID uh, with uh, Professor Hill, HIV with Yves Levy, hemorrhagic fever, especially the Lassa fever with Salvin Bez, tuberculosis with Roland Broche. And we will close by opening new perspectives regarding global health. There will be a presentation on avian flu and uh, swine flu. And uh, we, I wish you a very fruitful meeting and we can start without further ado. Back to Danielle. Yes, the first speaker is uh, Professor Adrian Hill. Please, Adrian, come on stage. Professor Adrian Hill, this is director of the uh, Jenner Institute in Oxford. He is uh, famous, needs no introduction. He's famous for his uh, malaria vaccine and the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, Professor Hill. For academic vaccine development and preparedness at the Jenner Institute, please. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Apologies for speaking uh, in English. I will be able to cover a little bit more uh, than in French. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we were involved with uh, in COVID-19 at the Jenner Institute uh, in Oxford, and talk a little bit about how this might, to some extent, influence other strategies in other institutes around the world that are essentially science institutes rather than companies or manufacturers, and what we can do to accelerate the translation of our technologies into useful products for public health. Next slide, please. Can I? Can, I, can do, I can do that. Okay. So very briefly, the presentation is in three parts, a recap of what we did during the COVID pandemic, why rapid progress was possible for an academic institute that had never licensed a vaccine before, and how this might impact possible new strategies for translational vaccine development. So you all know about COVID-19. Let me take you back about a year to April of last year. Over half a billion cases, various estimates of global deaths, at least 6 million officially, but in reality, probably closer to 20 million if you count excess deaths, not just COVID deaths. Well over 50 vaccine candidates in clinical development. Every university medical school I knew was developing its own COVID vaccine. And happily, many of these were already in license, licensed and in use by the beginning of last year, and well over 10 billion doses of vaccine already delivered. Now, 
Back a year earlier, or two years earlier, in January of 2020, when we first learned about the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus, we were all faced with the same question. What technology to use to make a vaccine against this unknown virus? Protein in adjuvant, the type of vaccine you've probably mainly had, we guessed was going to be too slow for a rapidly growing pandemic. And indeed, that turned out to be the case. Some major companies, even working together, took years to license a vaccine. An inactivated whole virus done very effectively in China, for example, was not something we could do. We could not make any virus at biosafety level three or four for global supply. So that was not an option. There were DNA vaccines around for decades, but not really licensed for anything, not very promising. And RNA vaccines <clears throat> in early 2020, essentially unknown. So that seemed a substantial risk. We had been using a technology based on safe, non-replicating adenoviral vectors for many years at our institute. Very importantly, these had been in clinical trials for decades, since the early 1990s. So there was a safety database, not on millions of people, but on many tens, hundreds of thousands of people, suggesting that there would be no long-term serious adverse events. So 100,000 uh, vaccinees, as it's said on the slide here, since 1991. We had been developing it as a T-cell inducing vaccine, but we knew from many clinical trials of candidate vaccines, particularly malaria, but also others, that it could also induce good antibody response. So this is essentially a DNA nucleic acid based vaccine. You take out part of the virus's own genome and put in whatever antigen you like, in our case now one for SARS-CoV-2, and that is very rapid to make both in the lab and in further development. Luckily, we had experience of a coronavirus vaccine. We had already made at the Institute in the lab of Sarah Gilbert, a MERS, a coronavirus vaccine. An outbreak is regular, but usually contained in Saudi Arabia. It comes from camels, but we had made a candidate vaccine in a very similar way with this adenoviral vector. And as this slide shows you, after vaccination, you get both antibody responses and T cell responses. And we weren't sure which we needed most for COVID-19. It was good to see both induced. So by April of 2020, a few months after we first heard of this virus, we were in a position to vaccinate the first volunteer, shown here on the slide. Uh, we had already done not just small animal studies, but non-human primate studies with a US lab led by Vincent Munster in the uh, Rocky Mountain labs and shown efficacy in monkeys, which was very helpful. And again, with our measures of immune response, both antibodies and T cells, we saw that with even a single dose of this vaccine, we could get good antibody titers and T cells, but these were boosted by a second dose given some weeks later. So this suddenly became a two dose vaccine based on the data we were seeing. The T cell responses, which this technology was originally developed for, uh, were also very potent. So what we ended up doing from April of 2020 was a rapid development program in the UK, 12,000 subjects in a phase one, then two, then three trial across 19 cities in the UK. A very important partnership with groups in Brazil, 11,000 subjects, some more in South Africa. By then we had our major commercial partner, the AstraZeneca Pharma Company, who took on a very large trial in the United States, 32,000 subjects, and another key partner in India that I will come to, the Serum Institute of India, doing a bridging study from the end of July that year. So in total, by the end of the year, we had 60,000 subjects in clinical trials, an excellent, really unremarkable safety profile, similar to previous uses of this viral vector. 
Our primary endpoint of the trial was prevention of clinical COVID. This is a busy slide, but essentially the combined efficacy for different immunization regimes was around about 70% in our clinical trials. But if you delayed the second dose, the efficacy went up to around about 90%. And indeed, when the phase three data from the United States came through, the efficacy there was 85%, very similar. Remarkably, a month after the vaccine was licensed on the last day of 2020, we got data from a group we barely knew working in Scotland, which has a population of around about four and a half million people. Within a month, both the Pfizer vaccine and our AstraZeneca vaccine had been used very rapidly and deployed. And simply by counting or identifying the people going into hospital with COVID from the national records and the vaccination records, they were able to calculate in weeks on a sample size of half a million now, the efficacy of both these vaccines given as a single dose. We were jealous, but delighted. We'd done all that work in 60,000 people with a laptop. They had data in half a million. This is the future of vaccine efficacy uh, measurement. So the FC again was very good, 85%, 82%, not significantly different. And further data from other population studies confirmed that. Then we came up, of course, against the biggest challenge of all. How do you vaccinate not just the country, but the world against a global pandemic. And remember, the vaccine market generally is a little bit unusual. 80% of sales by value, by income if you like, are in high income countries. But the vast majority of vaccine doses required and indeed sold are in low and middle income countries. And given that we're nearly 8 billion people now, and this is a two dose vaccine, how were we going to produce 16 billion doses of vaccine, ideally, in a year? The record, by the way, until then, had been close to half a billion for any vaccine, one flu vaccine. So nothing had been done at even one-tenth of the required scale. We knew demand would be immediate once there was licensure. Indeed, it was. And our wonderful CEO, Pascal Soriat, said, yes, we can probably to do two billion doses in 2021. What he didn't mean is that you would have a quarter of those in the first quarter. Like anything else, vaccine manufacturing takes time to perfect and to accelerate. So the approach we took to scaled manufacturing was to accept that one country could not do it all on their own. We developed a distributed manufacturing plan in February to April of 2020 with many countries, Italy, the Netherlands, China, India, and in India, this was the Serum Institute of India, I'll come back to that. And then AstraZeneca came on board after we licensed the vaccine to them in the end of April, and they found another 24 facilities in 15 countries. So we had this extraordinary number of manufacturing sites, unprecedented. The problem, of course, is how do you assure regulators that you're making exactly the same product in the same way in every one of those manufacturing facilities around the world? That's standardization, of course. Sandy Douglas at our institute led on this. He wasn't a, generally a specialist in biomanufacturing. He took this on. Crucially, his lab increased the yield, the productivity of each mill of culture fluid. He identified all of these partners and they all said yes. So by the tw end of 2021, this was the world's most widely used COVID-19 vaccine, distributed in 184 countries. Second came Pfizer-BioNTech in 121. Of the 1.3 billion doses made by August 21, two and a half nearly by early 22, the great majority of those were made in one place, the Serum Institute of India. This was already clearly the lowest cost vaccine at about $3 per dose that was prescribed by the head of our university, the vice chancellor, who said our university will not be making a profit out of a global emergency. And it was already the major vaccine being used by the WHO UNICEF Gavi CEPI COVAX program. Happily, some time later in the Lancet ID and also in the Economist, 
the estimates were made of how many lives were saved by different vaccines in 2021 alone. That was, of course, the worst year for the pandemic. And the number, remarkably, for one vaccine was 6.1 million, very closely followed by Pfizer-BioNTech. Sinovac in China made a lot, Moderna, etc., etc. And interestingly, viral vectors, particularly adenoviral vectors, were the most commonly manufactured and most impactful vaccine technology, not mRNA vaccines, which were very new, but also very effective. This is just one photograph of one room in a manufacturing facility in India. Yes, it has six uh, 10,000 litre bioreactors inside. This is the team when I visited sometime later. But in that one room, in one year, they made two billion doses of the COVID-19 CHAD vaccine. But it wasn't perfect. In fact, if you tell me where you were in 2021, I can probably guess which COVID vaccine you had. There was a maldistribution, if you like, there were richer countries buying up the doses for high prices before lower income countries, even with higher transmission, were able to access vaccine. It was inequitable. So by that date, in Africa, 4% of, of the population had been vaccinated. In North America, on the same day, it was 74%. Next time, we really have to do better and address that inequity. But for today's topic, how could an academic vaccine institute, who, as I said, had never licensed the vaccine before, be able to do this without large-scale manufacturing capacity? Obviously, we were lucky. We had a new technology platform, simian adenoviruses, that worked well for COVID-19. We found excellent industrial partners, AstraZeneca, a big pharma company, and the Serum Institute of India, a large manufacturer. The UK government, together with CEPI, came in early and funded us. But we also had some useful experience and a plan. We had been involved in responding to Ebola with a chimpanzee adenovirus working with GSK in 2014. We had almost all of the required pieces in the development pipeline, either in-house or accessible. And we had a really lucky break with a quite different vaccine trial in 2020, in January of 2020. I'll mention that briefly. So we've had a viral vector core facility for many years. They've made over 400 different chimpanzee adenoviral vectors for all sorts of diseases, for postgraduates, for postdocs, for collaborators, anybody who wanted them. Remarkably, we did inherited a small GMP facility where we had made more chimp adenovirus vectored vaccines than anywhere in the world, and we'd shown that they could be made quickly. Twelve of those had reached clinical testing, mostly by our colleagues, and one of those against MERS. Therefore, the regulator in the UK had seen this strange vaccine technology, if you like, before, unlike, say, regulators in India who had to learn more about it. We had an in-house bioprocessing research group, which increased the yield, as I mentioned, and we had lots of clinical teams around the country, as well as in Oxford, who liked doing phase one trials quickly. But what was a little unusual was how decades of research in our institute on malaria enabled that program. The chimp adenovirus platform was developed initially for malaria. The first clinical trial anywhere for anything was done in 2007. In Oxford, we tested seven different malaria antigens in that technology by 2020. Gates and Wellcome had provided funding for viral vector generation and improving the technology over many years. I'd mentioned scale up. And then we had a partnership with the Serum Institute of India already on malaria that did not exist at the start of January 2020, but by the end of January 2020, they were going full speed ahead. So very briefly, you know about malaria, perhaps the greatest killer of all time. It's co-evolved with us for at least 30 million years. It's changed our genome. And of course, it used to be far more widespread. There have been 113 years of malaria vaccine research that I'm aware of. The first paper came uh, published in a local journal here uh, from two Algerian Frenchmen, the Sargent brothers, who were doing work on whole parasite malaria vaccines, not unlike some companies still today. 
And uh, I tell the story that during 2020, we were involved in not just the fastest vaccine development program ever for a disease, which was COVID-19. We've also for decades been involved in what is arguably the slowest because after well over a century, we still don't have a licensed widely used malaria vaccine, but that may be about to change. So just a few slides on malaria. Our approach, like that of GSK before us, has been making antibodies against the sporozoite stage of the vaccine. This is not a new idea. 140 malaria vaccine candidates have gone into clinical trials since 1943. It's been tough. We've done 90 different clinical trials in Oxford alone. Both of the promising vaccines now, the RTSS one just licensed by the WHO pre-qualified and our R21 use the same protein. We have an improved nanoparticle covered in malaria rather than little islands of malaria. This is the graduate student in the lab who made the R21 vaccine. And this is our key principal investigator in Burkina Faso, Helado Tinto, who did a phase two trial back starting in 2019. And by early 2020, January to be precise, he had these data showing high efficacy of over 75% with a particular formulation that the Serum Institute of India saw for the first time in January 2020 and decided to invest heavily in this field and hopefully this vaccine will be licensed in the coming months. But it was data like this on high efficacy in the youngest children in high transmission areas of West Africa that encouraged Serum not just to go forward with the malaria vaccine, but to take a chance on our group from the same institute working on COVID-19. They tried lots of COVID vaccines, but ours was the one that they took forward into the billion dose scale and were confident would work. So the next steps on malaria are we're targeting regulatory approvals. There's a SAGE meeting actually tomorrow. The manufacturing scale can be huge, hundreds of millions of doses, not billions this time, but still pretty good. A low sale price, a few dollars a dose, and very thermostable for deployment in low-income countries. So to finish up with, what are the lessons here? There are lots of superb research institutes working on vaccines around the world. I'm, I'm, I'm standing in one of them. We're all good at doing preclinical safety and animal model tests and efficacy testing, followed usually by phase one trials, if you're lucky to get funding for manufacture, generating immunogenicity. And of course, you can nowadays often do challenge studies where we deliberately and carefully and safely infect people to test a vaccine. But often that's where we academics stop because we can't get the funding to progress uh, unless we get an industrial partnership. So the difference here that I'm recommending is that we look harder at large scale manufacturers, usually in Asia, because that's where most vaccines are manufactured in the world every day, who often don't have that R&D base, but have amazing manufacturing capacity and commercial uh, experience leading to field efficacy trials. Serum are funding the phase three for malaria. And this is different to what we've been doing for years, at least at our institute, trying to find a biotech company that would take the product or founding one, a spin-out company, or even hoping then you would go on to be bought out by a large pharma company, who of course might change their mind and decide that a low-income country vaccine is not their highest priority. So this really is an opportunity. These manufacturers exist. They are great to work with in our experience. They are able to fund clinical trials and clinical development and large scale manufacture, and they generally really know what they are doing. So I will skip that and just uh, stop here and take any questions. But before doing so, I'd like to thank the hundreds of people in Oxford, literally, who were allowed into work because they agreed to work on COVID-19 vaccines at our uh, institute, thousands in the UK and in other countries, and several of the principal investigators, including my colleague for over 25 years, Sarah Gilbert, Andrew Pollard, leading the clinical trial, Sandy I've mentioned, and two fantastic immunologists who contributed in very important ways. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup, Professor. Thank you, Professor Hill. Any questions? 
What a program. Huge perspectives. Are there any questions for Professor Hill? And Sophie, do you have a question? Would you like to uh, be the first to ask a question? There are roaming microphones available, so please wait for the microphone. Une question, c'est toujours la, la première. Don't hesitate. The first question is always the most difficult one. Well, while we wait for the first question, I light the, the factor of luck uh, in the capacity to, to, to respond. How can we um, favor luck in the uh, preparedness <coughs> phase and not in the response uh, phase? Um, of course, we want to sure. hear your feedback. Sure. So the key word is preparedness, and many agencies luckily now are funding preparedness, which is terribly important. I would say that you need to be well aware of all the pieces in the pipeline and have a plan for them and potential partners if you can't do them in-house. So on the non-human primate side, it's hard to do monkey experiments in the UK. We had a UK partner who had worked on MERS on our uh, collaborative program beforehand, and they performed very quickly. We very unusually have our in-house small manufacturing facility who downed tools on what they were making, which I think was a, a NEPA vaccine or something, and switched very rapidly to COVID-19. And then you need potential partners. There are lots of manufacturers in countries around the world, even non-commercial ones like in, in Brazil, where there's a major manufacturing capacity for South America and, and, and Brazil. And what we probably need to do is to network partners who are research institutes with access to manufacturing capacity. Because remember, you only need a small facility to get into the clinic and show that the vaccine looks safe and immunogenic. A totally different scale of problem emerges when you want to go for licensure and global global supply. But CEPI and other organizations are, are looking at that. But, but the, the, I think that the punchline really is to be aware of what's facing you if you really want to translate rapidly, especially if you're working on outbreak pathogens. Est-ce qu'il y a une question? Oui, je vois une main qui se lève. Est-ce qu'on peut donner le micro? Yes. Is there a question? I can see a hand raised. Here, Adrian. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I, I personally, I don't think it's luck. I think it's preparedness uh, to uh, to have the research in uh, your country uh, that are developing different platform for vaccinations. And so, I would like to know um, what are the lessons learned on the fact that we should have one platform or several platforms in each country for the development of vaccines. Yeah, so what's happened in the last three years is there's been a grand experiment in comparative vaccinology done not in mice, not in monkeys, but in humans and in hundreds of millions of humans comparing vaccine technologies. And the data, the information are fantastically useful. I remember after occasional scientific meetings in the bar afterwards, we would fantasize about what the ultimate scientific experiment would be to figure out what the best vaccine types were. Well, COVID has essentially done that. Groups all around the world tried their technology and tried to see what it would do, how manufacturable it was, how, how effective it, it was. So I, I, I think we're in a much better position than we were before. Old technologies like inactivating the virus and putting it in an adjuvant and immunizing can work very well, but there are biocontainment issues. But the Chinese were able to manufacture a lot of vaccines. The efficacy wasn't as high as the viral vector and mRNA vaccines, but it was still very useful to have. I would just emphasize that new technologies continue to emerge. mRNA vaccines have some challenges at the moment, even though they're great at inducing very high antibody titers very quickly, their durability could probably improve. The half-life of those antibodies is relatively short. But vaccine technology is, is evolving very quickly. So if I give you an answer today, happily, it'll be wrong in two or three years time because things are moving so fast. But look, we're really in a better place than ever before. It's not just that there are better technologies. We know more about how to manufacture them at scale. The world knows more about vaccines and is more interested in vaccines than ever before. So um, 
I tell the graduate student they're students they're entering the right field at the right time. Madame, je vous en prie. Merci. Madame. Professor Indriaman from the Ivory Coast, I'd like to thank Adrian Hill for his presentation. He's one of the pioneers in the manufacturing and development of vaccines. My question is the following. The genome that you use for uh, candidate vaccines, uh, was it diversified? Some came from African countries. And what kind of relationship do you have with the countries that decided to manufacture vaccines such as South Africa and Senegal? Uh, unfortunately for, uh, for the Ivory Coast, we're not part of the trend, but uh, what can we hope for? Thank you very much. I think I... ...of COVID is that African countries have really been standing up and insisting that they need not just the capacity to be more involved in the entire scientific enterprise, but also in vaccine manufacturing for Africa within Africa. Now, this is not a quick fix. The business model is challenging for all commercial vaccine manufacturers unless they can be very international. I'm delighted to see that almost every African country I'm aware of is keen to build manufacturing facilities. The answer is probably not 54 manufacturing facilities. It might be four or five, but big ones with a diversity of, of expertise. And that is, is really beginning to happen. I was uh, in Senegal only a month ago admiring the new manufacturing facility being built by the Institut Pasteur de Dakar right next to the, down from the, the airport with state-of-the-art modules from BioNTech, which is going to be a significant part of that mRNA manufacturing capacity. So I, I don't think there's any lack of will. I think there is international funding for this. The challenge is to get the scale just right, because too much capacity can bankrupt you as much as too little capacity, and it needs a lot of, of international collaboration within Africa as well as with other other continents. But it's fantastic to see the drive and the political will that is suddenly focused on vaccine manufacturing in many African countries. And, and you know, on malaria, we've had that pressure. We're, we're pleased to have it. Serum Institute of India are looking very hard at being able to manufacture, not just in their own largest manufacturing plant in the world, but in, in African countries. It won't happen overnight, but I'm pretty sure it's going to happen in the short to medium term. Concerning, just one word, concerning malaria, you gave us good news about uh, the vaccine against malaria. You were talking about several months. Or uh, we don't decide. Regulators decide. Uh, we have been submitting data to WHO for many months now. Um, the real question is, if you're doing a phase three trial of a new malaria vaccine, how long do you have to wait? RTSS, the first malaria vaccine, did a four-year trial and then filed for regulatory approval. That took quite a long time for various reasons. Our primary endpoint was after a year. Uh, we now are at about 18 months. We, we take the view that in COVID, very eminent authorities said two months of follow-up is adequate because you never see a new side effect after, after six weeks. So we're way beyond two months. We're not at four years. We're somewhere in between. The, the experts will decide. But our view is that the cost-benefit analysis of early registration of this type of malaria vaccine is, is very favorable. Peut-être encore une question pour uh, le professeur Adrien. One last question for Professor Hill. Is there a very last question? Yes, there's a lady uh, there raising her hand. Talk. So, uh, the Ast your AstraZeneca and the uh, Pfizer vaccine were obviously a fantastic uh, success against uh, COVID. However, it was uh, this vaccine were not a fully preventive vaccine, but vaccines that protected against uh, uh, severe uh, uh, effect 
of the, the, the disease, uh, do you think that uh, it can be applied, so such criteria can be applied for future development of vaccine, or would it be uh, uh, enough to prevent uh, uh, important diseases just, uh, such as uh, malaria or tuberculosis, or what do you think about? Yeah, great question. And, and, malaria, and diseases differ in their difficulty. As you know, tuberculosis, first vaccine in 1920, then a hundred years of struggling to, to, to do better, but there is, there is progress, of course. Uh, you're right, uh, the efficacy against severe COVID of all the vaccines was better than against mild COVID, where the vaccines did relatively less well was against upper respiratory tract infection and against transmissibility. There is efficacy against transmission, but it's of the order of 50%, not 80 or 90%. My view is, as others have said as well, what we really need improvement on is mucosal vaccination. Uh, we looked at our viral vector intranasally. It wasn't any different, any, it certainly wasn't better than intramuscular immunization. Others uh, have been working on intranasal vaccination. There's a different viral vector being tried by a different company in India, Bharat. They've actually got licensure for nasal administration. Uh, our view is that aerosol administration should be even better. There's a Chinese company, CanSino, who have licensed an adenoviral vector vaccine for aerosol administration in China. So these developments are coming, but I think most people would agree what's really missing for outbreak pathogen vaccination at the moment is a highly efficient, rapidly manufacturable upper respiratory tract uh, uh, vaccine technology. And even in our early monkey studies, we were not getting good upper respiratory tract protection. But, you know, a vaccine that saves lives is still pretty useful, too. Je crois une dernière question. Il y avait au même rang que vous. la main. Merci. Thank you for this talk. Um, I was wondering when, uh, um, as, as an academic institution, how do you um, convince industrial partners and, and manufacturing partners to, to make partnerships with you, especially in the uh, context of preparedness when you don't really know what kind of vaccine you will have to develop. So how, yeah, I, th I think you got the, <laughs> the question. Yeah, great question. Uh, short answer is it's not easy. I mean, the, the biggest problem with outbreak pathogens from a big company point of view is that of our long list of maybe 12 priority uh, diseases from the WHO and CEPI and, and others, there's a risk for every one of them that it may not ever reappear. And in business, that's a very, very bad plan to spend hundreds of millions developing a vaccine that will never be sold. It might be stockpiled a little, but you know, you don't get your money back. So it's difficult anyway, whether you're an academic institution or any other group, but the world needs to be prepared. We all spend money in rich countries on defense. This is defense. It's biodefense. You know, in the country I live in, there are nuclear submarines going around the world. We don't know where they are, but they're costing billions and billions and billions every year, and the taxpayer is happy to pay for them. We are much more likely to have another pandemic than a nuclear war, happily or unhappily, depending on your viewpoint. But should we not be spending at least some percentage of what we spend on, on military defense, on biodefense? It is not close. And the problem is it's coming out of our health budget, which is already massively overstretched. So I think we need political will, we need substantial change to take biodefense seriously. Otherwise, we're not going to have any new manufacturing facilities. Does anyone know of a new big facility that's been started since the pandemic? We were going to make one in the UK and the government cancelled it. So there's a lot still to be done. We're not, we're not prepared yet. I think that many in this community I think there are many of us in this community that probably agree with you on the, on the need to share resources. Thank you very much, Irene Hill. Now I'd like to call to the floor Professor Eve Levy. 
Who needs no introduction? You're a professor of immunology, the director of the uh, Vaccine Research Institute, former uh, director general of INSERM, and you're here to discuss the development of new vaccine concepts, particularly the vaccination platform of the Institute of which uh, that you're leading. Thank you to ANRS. Many thanks to Yazdan for your invitation. I would like to focus my talk today on a new platform that we developed at the VRI, the Vaccine Research Institute. This is a new concept, the goal of which is to directly target the vaccine antigens, uh, to actually target dendritic cells. My disclosures, this is a spin-off company that we created based uh, out of the VRI Institute. The VRI Institute was created about 10 years ago by the ANRS in association with a number of partners. You see the list on the screen, including the Creta University, but also teams at the Pasteur Institute, the INSERM Institute, the CEA, uh, particularly IDMIT. We've collaborated with them for many, many years. Also universities in Bordeaux and Strasbourg. The goal was to bring together a number of our colleagues that were working on a joint program. And the goal of that program was to develop a new vaccination strategies. That was uh, back in 2018, and that was part of an RFP initiated by the government at the time. So 16 laboratories are currently working together on aspects ranging from basic research to uh, clinical development uh, uh, trials, over 120 people working together, and we're covering the entire pipeline that Arian just referred to. We're trying to develop new concepts and also optimize bioproduction of vaccines. We are trying to have clinical research and uh, experimental medicine uh, approaches because we didn't have the resources to engage in uh, long, large-scale uh, trials. No, we want to use a methodology that will help us make us most of vaccine information based ourselves on immunomonitoring, uh, virology, and data science platform so that our uh, vaccine system approach helps us understand and identify protection correlates. And of course, this is supported by the data that we get from preclinical model, a wide variety of them. Uh, this includes human data. And in 2020, we created a spin-off of the VRA called Linkivax, and the goal is very clear. We want to push some of those mature products onto the market, and we also want to fast-track clinical development of those various vaccines. So, 10 years ago, the goal was to bring to the market a new vaccine uh, concept for HIV, and that's what we did between 2011 and 2020. I'll get back to that in a minute. And we worked on other traditional vaccines vaccines that were either available to ANRS or vaccines that were being developed as part of public-private partnerships. So this includes protein, uh, vaccine subunits or viral vectors, whether from the ANRS or as part of partnerships with Janssen, and more recently Merck. And also vectors such as adenoviruses or DNA or antibacterial vaccines. I'll talk about the strategies in a minute. I'll talk about the most recent clinical trials. Now, what's really innovative is that from the very beginning, we decided to focus our approach on developing vaccines based on our best knowledge on dendritic cell knowledge. So this slide shows you some of the trials carried out in recent years. To me, this is mostly an opportunity for me to thank all of our colleagues, all of our partners involved in those trials. The most recent trials are these two. These are therapeutic anti-HIV vaccines that bring in together lipopeptides and DNA on the left-hand side, but also dendritic cells and HIV antigens. And there's a series of prophylactic uh, trials on HIV, bringing together box viruses, MVAs, uh, and also DNA. And most recently, we worked on the first human administration of dendritic cell targeting vaccines. In 2014 and 15, when the Ebola crisis broke out in West Africa, 
At INSERM and ANRS level, we were quick to initiate vaccine research in partnership with European organizations, the London School, and also a number of industry partners, such as Merck and Jensen. And the most uh, recent uh, findings from their pre-vac uh, uh, trial in West Africa is available. And also we have an entire pneumococcus uh, vaccine, a, a conjugate vaccine uh, for sickle cell anemia in children in particular. And based on the findings of those uh, trials, uh, vaccination guidelines may change. As I said before, the goal 10 years ago was to design new strategies strategies based on dendritic cells, based on plasticity of those DCs. This is a cell population which is essential for initiating, stimulating, and modulating the immune response. So interaction with those cells and also educating the immune system. So the concept is based on showing at the surface of those cells a number of receptors. And the goal of those receptors is to capture antigens and also provide activation signals for DCs. And also they act as an antigen presenting cell. So we have a vaccine, vaccine prototype, which is a monoclonal antibody, which benefits from everything we know by biotherapy and the production of monoclonal antibodies. So this map, monoclonal antibody, as you can see, is completely humanized. This means you can repeat administration in humans, it's been selected as an antibody uh, out of hundreds and hundreds of antibodies for its specific properties. So we merge this antibody with antigens. And that's the second upside of that strategy, the second aspect, because you can select those antigens using epitopes. And we can select them to target the immune response and target the epitopes or regions of the pathogen that we select. So we develop this platform by targeting different receptors. And the most advanced clinically is the CD40 uh, molecule. So at the VRI, bringing together the different tools, working on the uh, preclinical model and all the Pasteur Institute tool, Pasteur Institute teams, we have dissected the different mechanisms. So this is a vaccine that targets CD40 and that we merge with a selected antigen. And we have shown all of the different steps involved in the process. Um, characterization of the connection between the antibody and the CD40, uh, um, stimulation of the DCs, production of factors that are important to stimulate the immune response, and also presentation to the immune system of the different fragments, the different vaccine fragments contained in the vaccine. And lastly, long-term activity induction of a cell and humoral response over the long term. So the initial in vitro preclinical results for those two candidate vaccines uh, target, for example, an HIV prophylactic vaccine where you have the HIV envelope on the left hand side. And that is the vaccine that moved into the clinical phase in 2021. And I will show you the most recent results. And on the right hand side, you have a vaccine that is currently being produced. We've changed the epitopes. The epitopes target the cell response and cytotoxic response. And on the right hand side, you see what happens when you stimulate in vitro cells of HIV infected subjects using very low vaccine doses. So you induce specific to the molecules present in the vaccine. And when you target those molecules, the same HIV epitopes, which are not directly targeted, CD40, as you can see in the lower <coughs> left right hand corner, there is no memory response that's induced. So we tested this vaccine with a specific adjuvant, a TLR3 toll like receptor 3 agonist. So in a humanized uh, um, mouse model. So you see here humanized mice that are infected with the virus. You you provide antiretroviral therapy and you look at the viral load. So you have two boosts, a prime boost in particular, and then the viral treatment was discontinued. In the lower left corner, you see in red the CD4 and CD8 responses, which were induced by the vaccine compared with the control group in blue or in black. As you can see, the vaccine was strongly immunogenic. 
in the upper right hand corner from week 12 to week 15 this is when the entire retroviral uh, therapy was discontinued by large you see that the mice that were vaccinated um, control or delay the viral replication process better. Now we analyze the repertoire, the number of cells that contain the viral DNA. Uh, so whether in the spleen, in the in in the bone marrow or in the lymph nodes, the vaccinated mice control to significantly reduce the viral reservoir. And this explains why the virological bounce back actually was delayed. So when it comes to inducing a prophylactic vaccine response in HIV, you need to demonstrate that the antigen is in the right place, that it is capable of inducing uh, uh, germ centers, mutated uh, antibodies, and neutralizing antibodies. These experiments were carried out by Roger Legrand and Romain Marlin, and they demonstrated in this experiment on monkeys that well, the monkeys received the CD40 coupled with the envelope, the envelope protein. And here you have the, en the protein envelope that does not target CD40. <coughs> what do you see? When, when you look at the lymph node in vivo in a live chimp, you see that there are many more DCs that present the vaccine antigen than when the uh, antigen is not targeted at all. So it's a significant advantage when it comes to the ability to induce a response at the germline sites. And if you look at the lymph node more specifically, if you look at the TRCD40, compared with the bottom images, there is one structure that looks like a germline centers, and that is fundamental for using that platform and inducing a sustainable antibody response. So on the basis of the data that we received in recent years, we have initiated that first uh, human trial. So a vaccine protein, CD40, associated with a uh, uh, HIV envelope, uh, envelope protein, so that this is a phase one multicenter double-blind placebo-controlled dose escalation trial. And many thanks to ANRS, many thanks for their volunteers, and in the solo group, the volunteers received three injections of that CD40 vaccine with an adjuvant at week 0, 4, and 24. And I will show you those results, for which we have the most advanced uh, data. So the first uh, result, uh, we observe the antibody response vis-a-vis -vis the different uh, virus uh, uh, envel envelopes, uh, class C, for example. So what you can see on the first line is that on week six, after two injections, so after week 26, after three injections, and for the most recent groups, response all the way until week 48. If you look at the five histograms on the left-hand side, uh, the response against class C viruses, the response is extremely high, detectable, irrespective of the dose administered. And mostly, the response appears after two viral injections. So this is a first uh, indication of uh, an anti-class C, antiviral response, and also cross-biting response vis-a-vis -vis the other envelopes. So this is the percentage of responders. Clearly, at week 6 or 26, 100% of the volunteers developed an antibody response against the different viral envelopes. Another important aspect, I'm not going to go into detail here, but the, the, the only trial that I showed 30% protection of the subjects was held in Thailand. Uh, the subjects received a vaccine, so it's important to look at the response to V1 and V2 viruses. So we looked at V1 and V2, which were homologous to the vaccine. This is the histogram all the way to the left-hand side. And what's interesting here is that the volunteers developed that very specific response, which is one of the best protection correlates found in the trial. And the response persists all the way until week 48. Also, we looked at the neutralizing ability of those antibodies against a virus that is easy to neutralize. But here again, each column is one dose, from the lowest on the left-hand side to the highest on the right-hand side. As you can see, there's 50% responders on week six, 100% responders 
for the two highest doses in the subjects that develop those neutralizing antibodies. And the last protection correlate is the CD4 TISA response, irrespective of the dose. In all three columns, the volunteers developed that polyfunctional response, that, that CD4 specific response to the vaccine envelopes. So immunogenicity is excellent. And because that was the first time this was used in human, we wanted to demonstrate safety. And safety is excellent, which means that we can Uberize, quote unquote, that platform use it over and over again. So the continuation of this trial is important we, uh, because the, uh, the, the most recent phase three trial was a failure and the entire scientific community is trying to look for either new pathways for administering uh, envel envel envelopes and, and inducing the response. So we are in the middle of discussions with uh, uh, NIH uh, colleagues also have or also have that uh, a vaccine to boost the uh, RNA response when we knew that the immune response is not sustainable. As Adrian rightly said, when you have a structure such as this institute and when you generate years and years worth of data, you're able to duplicate or roll out vaccine platforms much more rapidly because we have the right structure and we're able to move faster, even though we have yet to market a vaccine. And that's what happened in early 2020, when we used that technology to develop an anti-COVID vaccine. So with the uh, latest, uh, uh, with the latest link in the long chain of vaccine development, and this is, it took very little time to develop those uh, vaccines. So this is, and this will be a way to address the gaps. Uh, we wanted to develop a boost, quote, unquote. We worked in flux. Uh, we thought we would have to administer boost shots repeatedly, but we also want to reduce the sustainable long-term response to protect people. We also need to prepare new vaccines against new emerging variants or new pandemics that may be connected to SARS-CoV-2. So we developed two vaccines which are currently being produced which have moved into the clinical phase. One is a bivalent vaccine, uh, a vaccine that contains RBD, the region binding domain, which connects to the receptor with or without mutations. I'll get back to that in a minute. So the trials will begin in the next two months, uh, uh, promoted by ANRS and also a preparation vaccine. So we took this concept a little further uh, to fight against uh, future sarcoviruses. So I know this is a busy slide, but let me try and summarize. What you see at the top <coughs> is the different SARS-CoV-2 viruses. And also at the bottom, <coughs> the sarcoviruses found in uh, pangolins or, or, or bats, which are vectors for uh, SARS-CoV-2 SARS -CoV and other diseases that may uh, reach humans. So these are regions that we selected because they're strongly conserved between those different sarcoviruses and throughout that whole family. So we have selected those two regions, nuclear capsides, capsids, and RBD. And into those regions, we introduced what you can see at the bottom, a number of mutations. These mutations that will address the different variants. I'm not going to go into detail here, but these variants are common to all of the variants, including Omicron. And they are responsible for the, uh, the, the escape vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, neutralizing antibodies and the antiviral the response. So together with Roger Legrand and Romain Marlin, we tested that Pankov uh, virus, which seeks to target the different Variants, And as you can see on this slide, on the left-hand side, you see the neutralizing response against Delta, the Delta variant. And on the left-hand side, you see naive uh, uh, monkeys that received the first arrow, that's vaccination. And the second is a challenge using the Delta variant. 
and then you have the convalescing monkeys. Uh, you develop a boost, and they receive the Pfizer or uh, RNA vaccine. And then you have the Pankov treated uh, monkeys, and there's a strong immune response. And lastly, you have the convalescing monkeys, and they're showing an immune response, but only after the inoculation. So. You see the viral load in the trachea or the nasopharyngeal region of those uh, monkeys, which were broadly protected. And Pankov and Pfizer have, this, have a similar re response. But CD40 provides a more long-term response as well as a cell response vis-a-vis uh, -vis the nucleocapsids. Now, this was published. And the goal is also to compare this with the Pfizer vaccine in a different model. So in the center, on the two columns, you see the binding response, the response capable of recognizing the different variants. And we can see here that the response is equivalent between the Pfizer prime boost or the CD40 prime boost. There's even a less pronounced reduction with CD40 vis-a-vis -vis other uh, variants. And on the right-hand side, same thing, same observations when it comes to the neutralizing antibodies. This platform, well, once we had de-risked the clinical process, this platform has enabled us to develop a strategy against different pathogens. You see the list on the screen. And these efforts were funded at EU level as part of public-private partnerships with Linkivax in particular. So on the left-hand side, we've applied that platform to a virus against a therapeutic a therapeutic vaccine against cancer, HPV in particular. So we use CD40 to target the E6, E7 oncoproteins for a neck and for in for head and neck cancer that requires an immunotherapy using a therapeutic vaccine. So this will start in two months' time at the Gustave Roussy uh, Institute with Linkin Vax and the VRI partnership. And there are other platforms at different stages of development. But this has been demonstrated for the Nipah virus, the Pansarb vaccine, and those vaccine strategies have a protective effect. Now, the Nipah vaccine is part of the ANRS strategy for developing candidate vaccines against emerging viruses or re-emerging viruses. And we have candidate uh, vaccines against tuberculosis in collaboration with Renan Brock and the Pasteur Institute against Ebola as well, and Nipah. We wanted to develop this platform as a litmus test. We want vaccines that can protect against or control for a vaccine the mortality uh, with a mortality rate of 80 to 90 percent, which has emerged regularly since the year 2000 in Bangladesh, India, and Malaysia. And the latest outbreak was in China. Now, this is a new virus from that uh, family identified in 2022. So what have we done? In the lower left-hand corner, these are monkeys. <coughs> these are monkeys that are well suited for this pathology. We administered the CD4T vaccine against Nipah twice. And after the first administration, on day 10, there are antibodies already. Uh, against the uh, protein, the glycoprotein, envelope glycoprotein, and the response is stable and increases with the second boost on day 20 and it stays stable about two months after uh, inoculation. So what's interesting is that there's also an IgA, an immunoglobulin A response. And at the bottom, you see the neutralizing response against Nipah virus. This was done in partnership with the P4 uh, entity in Lyon. And after the first prime boost, uh, neutralizing antibodies are detected. And after the boost shot, uh, these antibodies remain for two months, to maintain for two months. And after two months, another challenge using Nipah virus uh, under BSL-4 uh, conditions. So we compare the vaccinated monkeys with the control monkeys. On the left-hand side, you see a pretty clear demonstration that the CD40 uh, vaccine against Nipah provided 100% protection to the monkeys that were challenged versus 100% mortality rate for the control group. In the upper right-hand corner, you see the viral load either in the blood or in the different organs. And clearly, Obviously, the control group shows a viral load that increases very much on day five, six, seven, as usual, and this means death. 
but there's no detection of viral replication in the vaccinated monkeys. In the lower left-hand corner, you see the clinical parameters that we looked at, including, well, in the, 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 the clinical score is, uh, is significant uh, in the control group, but very low in the vaccinated group. So there's no viral protein, whether in the lungs or in the spleen. So there's a protective effect, but also a sterilizing effect of the CD40 vaccine. I will close now. And it is by design that I keep this slide extremely busy. It shows that in recent years, the VRI has brought together a whole ecosystem of different teams, not just in France and in Europe, but also in the rest of the world. We work together with centers in Africa, uh, on Ebola in particular, and I would like to Thank the teams of VRI 06 Odile, Jean, Jean, our friends in Lausanne. Thank you for developing that trial. Everyone in Bordeaux uh, who worked on the biostatistics and methodology, also the immunology uh, studies, Aurélie, Christiane in Strasbourg and in Créteil, and everybody at ANRS. It hasn't been easy. Moving into the clinical phase. Uh, having this first human trial uh, with a new strategy that had never been used for any other vaccine. And lastly, the P4 entity. I showed their results. This is a very complicated experiment. This is a very severe pathogen that we worked on, and we were able to carry out those experiments uh, at the P4 entity. Many thanks to the team there. Thank you. Merci beaucoup cette présentation très complète. Thank you very much for this very uh, exhaustive presentation. We have time for just a few questions. Droite, je crois. À droite. À votre droite. Je me tourne un peu plus. Messieurs, est-ce qu'on peut apporter le micro Yes, ladies and gentlemen. Euh, bonjour, Michael Ploquin, TRT5. Michael Ploquin, TRT5, CHV. The uh, EVAP01 trial was very interesting, as you're probably uh, aware of. For the VMAP antigen V2 antibodies to be produced, uh, the antigenic presentation is it important because in mice we know that the longer the antigen stays in the germinative centers, the longer the B cells, the better the B cells will be at producing enough. So that's a question for you or Roger Legrand, I don't know. How long is the presentation and the antigen presence being uh, targeted in those trials? Well, we have not been in a position to evaluate in vivo the persistence of the antigen, but what really matters is where the antigen is and what cells will be produced. <coughs> and in the germinative center, the antigen will remain, but there is a generation of memory cells. And in the memory cells, in the germinative cell, that's the different versus the ARN function where there is an extra follicular response outside of the germinative centers. And that's the reason why antibodies drop rapidly. That's why I insisted on the fact that having germinative centers today, because we address the antigen with CD40 <coughs> in dendritic cells, that might be what induces neutralizing antibodies, because in the germinative centers, the somatic mutations are taking place, and that's where the very specific antibodies are being produced. Our colleagues from NGTM and NIS are very interested to develop the new CD40s with anti-immunogens that will generate uh, neutralizing antibodies. In the trial against Nipo, why a gem, not macacus? Well, because the model that reproduces uh, Best the NEPA physiopathology is AGFs and not macacus. And that's the reason why the manipulation is more difficult, but they reproduce the uh, disease in the best way. And that's the best model to test the physiopathology. I have a question for the, from the people uh, watching uh, remotely. Will there be a phase one vaccine uh, trials in Africa? Well, of course it is possible and something we wish for because in the prophylactic HIV trial in collaboration with NIH, what we are looking at is uh, doing a trial in South Africa with our South African colleagues within the HVTN network. Doesn't mean that we will not extend it later to other colleagues, but as I said, 
We have a partnership now with Western African countries, especially Guinea, Guinea uh, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Mali, and the VRI has uh, developed, set up this, the trials and the laboratories which are capable of assessing the immune response locally. The infrastructure is there. It's a decision that depends mostly on the uh, advancement of uh, the scientific research. And when we move the trial to the next uh, phase, just one more question from the audience. Uh, yes, the gentleman up there. Oh, it's a lady, sorry. <laughs> never mind, never mind. It's okay. Good morning. I'd like to ask, what guided your choice to test the uh, anti-cancer vaccine HPDS18 on head and neck cancers rather than, for instance, cervical cancers? Well, you're right. You're right. And the next trial will be on cervical centers. So we are working on inter with international colleagues, especially in the US, but also with the Gates Foundation. HPV 16 is 70%, 80% of head and neck cancers. Whereas for cervical cancer, cancer of the cervix, we're thinking about the uh, next generation, second generation of vaccines. HPV 16 is about 14, HPV 18, 30, 35%. So it's the next generation of cancers. We're going to enrich the antigens and the epitopes to try and look, go for cancer prevention uh, for women who have CIN 2 or 3 and for whom we are wondering about whether to uh, whether we can develop a preventative, a prophylactic cancer. It's in the pipeline and it's in the Lincoln Vax pipeline. And it's definitely the reason why we are developing this spin-off because that's why it's helping us speed up the program. Thank you very much, Yves Levy. Thank you for this presentation and thank you for having answered the questions. And I'll give back the floor to Anne-Sophie for the rest of the session. Okay, we now welcome Sylvain Bez on stage. Sylvain works at uh, the P4 laboratory in Lyon. He's in charge of the leave uh, session and the CNR session regarding uh, virus-induced uh, viral fevers, uh, infectious fevers. He's worked on Ebola and he's going to tell us about the Lassa fever and the strategy, the vaccine strategy, the very early stages, from the early stages to the uh, final stages that he has been developing. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you to Yazdan and Hervé for having given me the opportunity to introduce my work to you. Not obvious to uh, speak after Professors Hill and Livy and talk about vaccines. I'll try to do it, but you know, I'm, I'm sort of a more on a handicraft level than uh, their level. We're going to talk about vaccines and emerging infectious diseases. And I'd like to take the example of the Lassa fever because it's very special and has very specific requirements for vaccinations. Uh, Lassa fever is a hemorrhagic fever caused by the uh, virus uh, Lassa, described for the first time in 1969 in Nigeria. It's endemic in Western Africa. The epidemiological data is not very reliable. We don't know how many people are affected every year. We do know for a fact that there are many asymptomatic cases and the uh, global lethality goes from 3 to 15 percent, difficult to estimate, but clinical case, severe clinical cases who are recovered in the hospital, they uh, have a mortality that goes from 15 to 40 percent. The disease is underdiagnosed because the initial clinical signs are very similar to uh, other diseases which are more frequent, uh, such as malaria, dysentery, and the sequelae are often observed in survivors. At the bottom of the slide, you have the circulation map for the Lassa fever. Western Africa is mostly affected. The orange countries are the endemic countries where the uh, virus is circulating. And uh, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. And then we have Nigeria. Nigeria has epidemics and outbreaks every year. Hundreds of cases are confirmed and hundreds of people die. There are countries where the virus is starting to circulate. The green countries, Ivory Coast, uh, uh, Ghana, Burkina Faso, and Southern Mali, and Togo as well. And then Benin, a country which was not affected but now has regular outbreaks. Apparently, the circulation area seems to grow. 
The natural history, it is a zoonosis, uh, the reservoir is uh, commences. It's a very specific type of uh, rodent uh, which lives close to uh, humans, especially in the dry season. So there are repeated contacts between rodents and the people. Obviously, that allows for the zoonosis to be transmitted. Uh, contact with the rodent, uh, the feces, the urine, the tissues, and then infection between people is due to biological fluid contact between patients and often during outbreaks there can be a transmission from the rodent to man because an outbreak means that there is a very high circulation area of the uh, virus in the rodent population. At the bottom, you have a model of the number of people who live at risk of the Lassa fever. 180 million people are at risk of uh, being infected, there is no efficient treatment. There's a historic treatment, ribavirin, recommended by WHO since 30 years, but it does not seem to be that efficient. There is no vaccine on the market for that particular disease. Genomic organization, I mean, that's not the point today, just so you understand how the vaccines were created or the, the vaccines were defined. It's a single uh, strand uh, NRI uh, virus. Uh, Subsegments, uh, ARN polymerases, uh, protein Z, and on the segment S, we have nucleoprotein and glycoprotein. The two proteins are the ones that we're most interested in. Now, the problem of vaccination against the emerging infectious diseases can be summarized as follows three words who, how, where. Who is affected? How does the agent circu circulate? Uh, and where does it circulate? Because when the, a respiratory and pandemic uh, transmission virus uh, starts circulating, such as a syncytial virus, this is fortuitous. However, we have many big pharma companies interested. There's a lot of funding. As the Professor Hill said, there is there are many candidate vaccines. However, when viruses emerge, such as Ebola or Lassa fever, we're talking about something completely different because big pharma are not fighting to be involved and develop vaccines in this case. Take the example of Ebola. You remember the virus was isolated in 76, emergence in Zaire and Sudan. And the 25 first years when the virus circulated, very few people were working on that virus, especially the, only the soldiers mostly. Biopreparat thought it might be interesting to put it in a bomb. But uh, put the viruses in a bomb, but some teams tried to develop vaccines to counter the uh, effects. And some uh, teams, such as the CDC, but not very many people. Then, uh, following 9-11 uh, uh, and anthrax uh, threats, uh, people started focusing on the agents because they were thinking about bioterrorism and money started uh, being invested in the NRBC program at the time in the US in 2003. 13 billion per year were dedicated to defense, but that was not uh, enough to uh, really make progress with the agents. And uh, the Ebola outbreak in 2014, 2016 in Western Africa started things going because people said, okay, there's this virus circulating in, uh, in Western Africa, but it could be a danger for northern countries because there were borders uh, between uh, countries uh, affected that had contacts with northern countries. And so industrial countries thought, okay, maybe we have to look into those viruses. And there were virtuous initiatives being started, such as the WHO list on priority diseases for which it was absolutely essential to start working without waiting including Lassa and Ebola. And then there was the CEPI being created and other similar bodies to try and help with the development of vaccines. Now, the Western Africa epidemic allowed uh, for accelerated licensing of the first licensed uh, vaccine for Ebola in uh, Zaire. Another one was, uh, follow was uh, subsequently uh, released, but uh, this one is uh, used uh, uh, to stop the epidemic, but not as a preventative measure. Then we started looking at uh, Lassa fever. We've been wanting to do so for many years, to look at the pathogenesis and the virology. We wanted to develop vaccines, and we developed two vaccine candidates in parallel, attenuated live vaccines in both cases. The first one was based on the Mopeya virus. The Mopeya virus, as you can see, is close to Lassa fever virus, but Mopeya is not pathogenetic for men and not for... for, for monkeys, there's never been a single human case. And because it was very similar, we thought, okay, we can use it to develop a vaccine against Lassa fever. At 
Recently, uh, other teams have described the fact that the nuclear proteins contained in this virus were a major virulence factor for the uh, virus. It uh, codes for exonucleases, uh, it's uh, the intermediary of viruses inducing type 1 interference. So the exonuclease will uh, work on the capacity of the cells to uh, release a uh, major immunosuppressing factor. This mutant uh, was used in uh, several areas of the catalytic domain. We replaced the Mopeia glycoprotein with the Lassa glycoprotein to induce specific responses, and that gave us an attenuated light vaccine. In parallel, we used uh, the uh, measles uh, platform developed here at Pasteur to develop a Lassa fever virus, and we use the same antigens, the mutated uh, nuclear protein and glycoprotein. And the fact in that we uh, mutated the nuclear protein lies in the fact that the virus with the wild type nuclear protein is immunosuppressed and not capable of inducing a lot of interference in the cells. Whereas if you mutate the nuclear protein, we still have the capacity of the measles virus to induce an interference response. So that's the candidate we chose to keep. We developed a proof of concept regarding the Simulmagus uh, monkey, the only one that can be used for Lassa. We studied the efficacy of both vaccines and we showed that both vaccines after a single injection could protect the primates in an efficient way against a lethal challenge with Lassa virus, was a fever virus. On the left-hand side, you see the only clinical signs in the vaccinated uh, monkeys were slight fever, transient fever, and no alteration in the biological parameters in the vaccinated uh, animals, and very low viral load, transient after vaccination, very few uh, infectious particles detected, very little transient mRNA. So the efficient, the vaccine was efficient after single dose. Now the, it's mediated by a humoral response after immunization. We have antibodies and some neutralizing antibodies, and that's especially for Mokovac because the uh, measles vaccine does not induce it as much. But we have a very good response, which is uh, limited, but we look at the blood and that is definitely not the best compartment. But the T cell response is induced against both antigens being present in the vaccine for both vaccine candidates. And after challenge, we have uh, observed a boost in the humoral response and the T cell response. So clearly, the cell and humoral response plays an essential role. That's where we are regarding the vaccine development. But we were a bit of, at a loss because uh, we needed more money than just the initial budget that was given to us internally. And fortunately, we had the opportunity of the CEPI being created. The CEPI is a coalition, an international coalition between public and private bodies, uh, um, charity bodies, civil society. It's a world consortium that was created following the, Bo the Ebola outbreak. And it was uh, created to encourage the development of vaccines against priority and emerging pathogens. And it's uh, useful because not only it funds uh, vaccine development, but it also funds everything that revolves around it to make progress more rapidly in vaccine development, such as developing the standards, the standard trials, standardized trials, so that all the manufacturers can use the same trials and we can compare the various candidates. It also funds a huge epidemiological trial on the field to understand how does disease circulates, how the virus circulates in the endemic areas, and where to locate the vaccine trial. So it's a very important program for us, a very ambitious one. CEPI was created in 2018. In 2017, in 2018, they, uh, they launched a bid for tender. And uh, we uh, responded with Temis, uh, the biotech, uh, which was in charge of uh, operating the measles vaccines for Pasteur. With Timis, uh, we uh, won the bet for tender. We were among the last six uh, black uh, shortlisted candidates, and we were the first to sign an agreement with the CEPI, the first vaccine that was uh, engaged by the CEPI. The CEPI funded us for the preclinical trial, measuring the efficacy of the vaccine against the different types of strains for Lassa fever, measuring the capacity to protect on the long run, and how long is how long how, how much time we need to acquire protective immunity. And finally the clinical trial, the phase one trial being funded and the phase two, which was planned.
So why the genetic diversity is an issue for Lhasa? Because we have different types of vaccines here with different genetic backgrounds. Seven lineages with 20% divergence between the various lineages. And that is an issue because the vaccine or the vaccines are all built on the uh, Josiah reference uh, strain. And when we develop a uh, Lhasa fever vaccine, it has to protect against a diversity of strains circulating because the uh, mostly the, the mostly f most found uh, are the strain two and three in Nigeria. So we took advantage of uh, isolating two strains uh, during an outbreak in Benin, and we isolated two strains. One is 9 h 2 and one is 9 h 7 and you have the most divergent ones versus like, uh, Josiah, and we use them to test the measles Lassa fever vaccine to protect against all the diversity of Lassa strains. And the T responses induced after immunization are cross-reactive, meaning that they can recognize peptides derived from the proteins from both strains. And when we challenge the animals, they are protected, not quite as well versus the uh, original strain, but still there are very few clinical sales. They, and they run a fever, but a transient one very easily controlled, and that is a success. Well, you, the immunity does not sterilize anything. Okay, fair enough. But if the immunity does not sterilize the disease, that's not really an issue. We then went on to look the, at the capacity of the measles Lassa vaccine to protect against the virus on the long run. Why? Because we are looking at populations living in low-income or medium-income country. And we can't go back every six months or every year to give them a booster injection. I mean, sometimes it's even difficult to give them the initial injection. So we had to develop a vaccine that could protect on the long run. So we immunized the Cynomongus uh, monkeys. We did a prime boost uh, because after the, five, the, five, the phase one trial was uh, planned on a prime boost, we waited one year before we challenged them again. And on the immunomonitoring that we performed during the year, we found that the T cell response lasted for one year. We, we re-stimulated TVMC after one year and we found that the T, specific T cells against the antigens were still there. At day zero, we uh, grafted antibodies and found that the antibodies were still circulating one year after vaccination. And then the challenge was considered a success because we found a very good level of protection, no infectious viral load in the vaccinated uh, uh, monkeys, prime moose, uh, a little viral load in the blood, but very transient. So it's important after one year, the boost uh, was observed after the T response uh, following challenge with the CD4 and CD54 and CD8 uh, producing cytokines. The vaccine that protects on the long term uh, for monkeys is found. And then the next uh, tr phase, the preclinical trial, looked at how long it took for um, monkeys to be immunized after a single injection. Because very often the vaccines, we would like to use them when there is an outbreak, a bit like with Ebola, but differently here for Lhasa, because uh, a nanolasa vaccination means we don't stop the uh, transmission from uh, man to man, but rather we want to vaccinate uh, the, the people in the areas where the, vir the virus is emerging because the virus circulates in the rodent population. So if we vaccinate on the outbreak areas, we can maybe stop or decrease the, the disease transmission. So we immunize the animals 10 days, 15 days later, we challenge them with Lhasa. And again, you find that the protection was efficient. Eight days after immunization, it was excellent. Two monkeys out of three had sterilizing immunity present. And after two weeks, it was uh, one on three. So the T cell response was spectacular in that particular model. The immunized uh, monkeys eight days uh, later before the challenge had up to 12% of CD8 specific T cells uh, for the glycoprotein circulating uh, eight days after the challenge. So the response was quite robust and it definitely played an essential role in the protection. So we closed the preclinical trials and now we had to move on and move to MAN in a phase one trial. The phase one trial was uh, conducted uh, with Timus uh, Bioscience as the promoter, the biotech, which uh, was operating the license. And the phase one uh, trial was conducted in Belgium with three groups, one placebo, two prime boost vaccinated with a low dose and one with a higher dose. And the first one, the readout uh, sh was uh, 
whether the uh, vaccine was innocuous. Uh, I mean, the measles vaccines, we know it's innocuous, but we had to check whether the same happened with Lassa, especially if you consider that with Lassa, we're always afraid of uh, leading to deafness because one of the sequelae of uh, people surviving uh, Lassa fever infection is uh, transient or final deafness. But uh, we had no reason to worry because the vaccine was well tolerated. There was no difference between the groups regarding adverse events uh, induced by the vaccine. So first readout was completed. And the second outcome was to check that there were no pre-existing immunity issues because everybody in Belgium is vaccinated against measles. But we had to check whether the fact that people had antibodies and neutralizing antibodies against measles were not going to be an obstacle decreasing the immunogenicity of our vaccine. Now, that did not happen. I will not share the results, but we were able to show that there were no pre-existing immunity issues and that the vaccine remained efficient even in people who were previously immunized against measles. Now, the second outcome was uh, immunogenicity. The study was not sized uh, for very statistical immunogenicity, but we were able to uh, show that there were high uh, an antibody titers induced by the vaccine, especially with the high dose. All the patients responded well to the high dose. And IgGs uh, had ADCC properties, and that's important. We had no neutralizing antibodies like in monkeys. And the Lassa virus is not a very good uh, inducer of uh, neutralizing antibodies. I mean, that was known in expected. Uh, at least uh, in the ADCC, we were able to show in the preclinical trial that ADCC was involved uh, in uh, the uh, prevention, but the T uh, cell response was not usable because the samples were too small. We were able to show the presence of a CD4 specific T cell response, a little less with CD8, but still, and uh, mostly one year after immunization in the subjects, we still found the presence uh, that we had observed uh, in the uh, monkey model. So the immunogenicity was quite similar to what we had observed in non-human primates. Very promising. If we consider the protection obtained in the monkey model, we're happy to find we have the same immunogenicity level in man. So where do we stand now? The preclinical evaluation has been completed. We have to continue now with a phase one, phase two trial in an endemic area because we have very specific issues with Lassa. Lassa virus circulate in the affected countries. So there is an issue of existing pre uh, pre-existing immunity against Lassa and there is also cross immunization with the virus of people living in African countries. So that's all difficult to manage when we're looking at a Lassa virus trial in the endemic areas. And then if it works, we need to work to move to phase three in an epidemic area because the phase tri trial is difficult. And it means that you have huge, you need lots of people to uh, conduct a phase three trial. So CEPI suggests that we do it in areas where there is an outbreak in progress in order to increase the rate of people being vaccinated and decrease the number of people, the resources we need to do that. And CEPI and others are helping us by uh, funding uh, clinical trial platforms in the countries where Lassa fever is endemic to help us develop the phase three clinical trials. And what it boils down to is that the uh, problem of uh, vaccines against Ebola or Lassa virus, the fact that we are being funded by uh, charities or CEPI non um, uh, public and uh, charity bodies uh, is uh, actually uh, filling the gap that we have between the uh, initial academic uh, research and then the, the clinical development for non-environmental pathogens. However, we still are facing the challenge that the final clinical development, phase three, phase four, licensing, market authorization, use on the field are not guaranteed for that vaccine because CEPI cannot help us go all the way. And for Ebola, we have a vaccine, the EBO vaccine, which has been licensed for more than three years. It's not being used for preventative uh, purposes. So that's the challenge we need to face. And I hope that things will continue improving in the future. I'll close with this uh, slide to thank my collaborators, uh, my co-workers. The Project uh, France 2030 is not shown on this slide, but it's one of the virtuous uh, 
circles that we have developed. We have a grant to continue working on other vaccine uh, developments. Uh, it's, I would like to thank them, although it's not the object of my presentation. And again, I think I'm, I've gone over my time, but I'd like to thank uh, before for preclinical trials, the Institut Pasteur, uh, GPF uh, vaccinology, because without their funding, we would not have had access to CEPI. Uh, Temis, uh, for having uh, supported us with the very first clinical trials and developments. Uh, other teams in the Pasteur Institute who've helped us, CEPI, and the Anvers University, Antwerpen University, and IBSC, and Zalgen, both funded by CEPI and helping us with the standards and the antigen. Thank you for your attention. Merci pour votre présentation. Thank you very much for your talk. We have a couple of minutes for Q&A. Are there any questions in the audience? Any questions for Sylvain Bez? Please wait for the Romeo microphone. Thank you very much, Sylvain, for your talk. It was very interesting. One quick comment. It's true that Seppi is an organization that plays an important role in terms of funding uh, research on emerging vaccines, emerging pathogens. Vaccine research is often underfunded. ANRS also makes it possible to promote uh, phase, fund and promote phase three trials. So don't hesitate, come and talk to us. You're absolutely right. Thank you, Eric, for that reminder. It's true that uh, ANRS MIE is a recent initiative, and we have high hopes that this will make things better. But it is true that the landscape is shifting uh, quickly, hopefully in the right direction. We're hoping that will continue, and the current uh, RFPs uh, are very interesting for us. But these are new things, absolutely. And by CEPI, I mean the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. Right behind you. Somebody raised their hand. Hello. How much does it cost? One dose of the vaccine that you're currently developing with the measles uh, vector? If you find the right industry partners to develop the vaccine, do you think it'll be affordable? in all of those countries that can't afford extravagant prices? Yes. Well, the measles virus, uh, that's pretty cheap, a few dollars per dose. So it's a vaccine that's easy and affordable to produce. We have a lot of experience in measles and measles vaccination. Dozens of years of experience. The only challenge will be shelf life and making sure you don't need the cold chain to uh, conserve the vaccine until it is administered. No other questions? Oh, yes, all the way at the back. Yes, the young lady. And that'll be our last question. Hello, Michel Pietro. I'm not sure I understand what you said about prior immunity. How do you demonstrate that that has no impact on response? We've seen that with the adenovirus uh, vaccine, have antibodies against a vector can influence the response. How do you explain that there was no impact? Yes, it can have an impact because in the measles vector, we keep the, the measles envelope protein. So when the neutralizing antibodies uh, uh, work well how do we show it we establish a correlation between the rate of antibodies anti-measles antibodies present in those vaccinated in the rate of antibody of lhasa antibodies and the humoral response against lhasa that was induced was not correlated with the measles antibodies present at the time of vaccination so this suggests that there's no incidence of the uh, rate of measles antibodies and the latest uh, preclinical uh, trial shows that uh, the monkeys, that was the first time that we used them and there was excellent protection and the immunological parameters were comparable to what we saw in previous clinical trials. 
we clearly think that there's no uh, problem in terms of pre-existing immunity. Thank you very much, Sylvain Bez, for your talk. And Sophie Vignon, please introduce the next speaker. So from LASA, TTB, let us welcome Roland Broche. At the Pasteur Institute is in, is in charge of the Integrated Pathogenomics and Mycobacterial Unit. Uh, Roland is well known for his work on changes in the mycobacterium tuberculosis complex, particularly characterizing the ESX secretory system. Today he's going to show how we can use uh, that fundamental knowledge to improve the vaccine and do better than BCG, which is an old uh, uh, vaccine. It can provide protection, but there are imperfections. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. So we are working on mycobacterium tuberculosis as well as on BCG. So TB vaccine development and implementation challenges, that's the title of the talk I was asked to give. This is my translation, TB vaccination, BCG and beyond. What's next? The problem of tuberculosis, as you all know, it's of course a, a, a huge problem still with more than a quarter of the human population, the global human population infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis. And uh, which uh, causes uh, more than 10.6 million uh, new TB disease uh, in 2021 and uh, more than 1.6 million deaths uh, linked to this disease, including about uh, 190,000 HIV positive people. So this problem remains a, a huge priority and uh, the Stop TB partnership and, and the WHO, of course, they have uh, developed global plans to eliminate TB, uh, but for really having an, an, a crucial impact, a new, uh, more efficient vaccine will be crucial uh, to obtain, to meet these goals. Um, the current vaccine uh, that you all know, the BCG vaccine, uh, recently celebrated its uh, 100th anniversary. Uh, this is just a photo from the commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the first BCG vaccination at the Hôpital de la Charité, which is uh, located uh, today uh, where the, the campus of Saint-Germain-des-Prés of the Université Paris-Cité is situated. Um, a few more words on BCG. Uh, the Carmet, uh, Basile Carmet Guerin was developed by Carmet and Guerin at the Institut Pasteur de Lille at the beginning. Um, it was obtained by 230 passages uh, from a virulent mycobacterium povis isolate, uh, which became successively more attenuated. Uh, so at the end, it was used in 1921 uh, as a human vaccine, and since then, there were about 3 billion doses used worldwide uh, for vaccination. It shows very good uh, protection against childhood forms of tuberculosis. It has likely saved millions of lives of infants. Um, originally, it was uh, administered by the oral route. Uh, this has changed today. It's the intradermal route. Um, however, the protection of adolescents and uh, adults against pulmonary tuberculosis remains limited and variable, uh, depending on the countries and uh, the pre-exposure to, to environmental mycobacteria and the climate. Um, and despite the massive use of BCG vaccination, which is still ongoing, uh, the TB pandemic continues and we need the development and implementation of new and improved vaccines, uh, which is a crucial point. So uh, the challenges are, are, there are several challenges and, and some of them is of course the causative agent of uh, tuberculosis. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is an intracellular pathogen which has many mechanisms to manipulate the immune uh, system of the host and to escape uh, the immune responses of the host. Uh, there are problems for prediction. Uh, 
We have uh, uncertain predictive value of animal models. This was shown uh, previously that sometimes vaccines are quite efficient in animal models, uh, which finally turn out not to be that efficient in humans then. Uh, there is a lack of a robust immunological correlate of protection. The vaccines themselves, uh, there are several types of vaccine, life attenuated vaccines like BCG or inactivated whole cell vaccines, uh, subunit vaccines, DNA, RNA vaccines, and then there is the choice of antigens. So, uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis has 4,000 genes, so you can imagine you can choose quite some antigens. Uh, in, in this case, we, we uh, selected uh, secreted antigens, uh, which seem to be recognized by the host very efficiently. And then there are the clinical trial sites, financing and implementation of trials, the site infrastructures and the incidence of TB in the countries where the trial sites are located. So uh, this slide shows you um, an update on the current preventive TB vaccines uh, in clinical development. It's difficult to read. I just want to, uh, this was, is, is taken from the tuberculosis vaccine initiative, the TBVI website, and, and the site is, is mentioned below. Uh, and just in red circles, a few uh, examples that I will present in, in a little bit more detail. Uh, now, so the first example is the MTB VAC. It's an attenuated mycobacterium tuberculosis strain. The rationale behind is that the attenuated mycobacterium tuberculosis strain carries more M. tuberculosis specific antigens, uh, about 1600 epitopes, uh, than the mycobacterium bovis BCG strain, which has about uh, 10,000, uh, 1080 uh, epitopes. Uh, the strain is based on a FOP and FADD26 deletion mutant of mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is lacking the virulence regulator FOP and the virulence lipids PDIM, the diacyrrhol demycoserosates. It was developed by the team of Professor Carlos Martin at the University of Saragossa with the help of TBVI, and produced, it's produced now by Biofabri in Spain. Um, this work uh, began in the, as a project of molecular characterization of the mtb 4 p gene in the laboratory of Professor Brigitte Chigel at the time uh, when Carlos Martin did, Martin did his postdoc at the Institut Pasteur in Paris. Um, mtb vac induces stronger immune responses than BCG, as you can see here in the, in the middle, uh, where mtb vac at 5 times 10 to the 5 and BCG are compared. And um, the MTB VAC results are very encouraging. Um, the results from the phase two study uh, showed that MTB VAC exhibits uh, acceptable reactogenicity and induces a durable CD4 uh, T cell response in infants. Uh, the confirmation of immunogenicity uh, supports the progression of MTB VAC into larger safety and efficacy trials and the phase three study uh, is currently underway. Another example also of a um, life attenuated vaccine is the recombinant BCG, Delta URC, Hemolysin Plus, also called VPM uh, 10,002. Uh, VPM 10,002 uh, is a recombinant URAC deficient Listerolysin expressing uh, BCG vaccine strain developed by the team of Professor Kaufman. Um, this strain was generated to induce a broader immune response against mycobacterial antigens. Uh, together with the Serum uh, Institute in India, several phase two and phase three studies are underway. Uh, they are mentioned here. So they, they range from the prevention of TB disease in adults and adolescents uh, to a multicenter phase three clinical trial in infants in sub-Saharan Africa to evaluate the efficacy and safety of VPM 1002 in comparison to BCG. And there is also a third trial prevention of tuberculosis recurrence in cured in uh, patient, TB patients, so patients who have undergone TB treatment and have been uh, cured. Um, the results of the recently completed phase 2B trial 
um, show that VPM uh, was less reactogenic than PCG, which was surprising, and both vaccines were immunogenic, but responses were higher with PCG. So uh, we will see what uh, uh, the efficiency uh, of uh, the VPM 1002 will be. Another example, the subunit vaccines MVA uh, plus antigen 85. Uh, it's a viral vector modified vaccina Ankara uh, virus, uh, which is expressing the antigen 85A of mycobacterium tuberculosis. It is what developed at uh, the Yen Institute uh, with uh, Helen McShane. It was used as a boost uh, antimicrobacterial immunity acquired through vaccination with BCG or natural antimicrobacterial anti immunity in humans. There was a, a big clinical uh, phase 2B uh, trial uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't show a significant protection against uh, um, compared to BCG alone. So it was given as a boost on top of BCG uh, to infants in, in South Africa. However, this clinical trial um, involving MVA uh, 85A helped to identify potential immune correlates and recently the MVA was replaced by JADOX1, which we have heard uh, before uh, by Adrian Hill, and uh, there were also uh, additional antigens in integrated into the vaccine like the PPE15 antigen um, and in addition, there are different routes of vaccination now tested, uh, for instance, especially the mucosal uh, vaccination, for instance, by aerosol. So a phase one uh, clinical study is underway. As another example, um, another subunit vaccine, which is the M72 AS01E. It's an adjuvanted protein, uh, M72, developed by GSK in, in Belgium, and it's the adjuvant plus uh, two uh, microbacterial antigens, RV1196 and RV125. 1196 is a PP protein, uh, uh, and uh, RV0125 uh, is a peptidase together with the adjuvant AS01E, which is a liposome and agonist of TLR4. Uh, a clinical trial uh, to be uh, showed that uh, this uh, vaccination of about uh, 3,000, uh, no, uh, there was a, a 50 and about 50% efficacy shown um, by vaccination with this vaccine against progression to TB disease versus placebo in patients already latently infected with MTB after three years of follow-up uh, in a phase 2B trial. Among the 3,289 participants, 13 of the 1,626 participants in the vaccinated group versus 26 of the 1,663 participants in the placebo group developed active TB disease, uh, confirmed by bacteriological analysis. So uh, this, this uh, level of 50% protection uh, was, was obtained. And uh, the, the details of these results are described in the publications, which are listed there. And uh, this vaccine is now uh, licensed uh, by uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and it's in preparation for a phase three uh, clinical study. What about our mRNA vaccines? We have heard they are very popular at the moment. Uh, uh, there is no, no one on the market. I just wanted to show you uh, what I found on, on a website for tuberculosis. BioNTech plans to begin clinical trials for testing a vaccine candidate in 2000. Um, 22, so this was last year. I don't know if it has been started, I don't think so. Um, there are also attempts of, of Moderna to work with uh, different research institutions, uh, including the Institut Pasteur, to uh, look for, for TB vaccination with mRNA vaccines and other initiatives. Um, I think we have to be also a little bit cautious because TB is, is probably a much more complex disease where different immune uh, responses are needed apart from uh, antibody responses and the T-cell responses are very important for, 
for TB as well. So uh, just uh, to give you also a little bit uh, of insight into the subject that uh, anne Sophie already mentioned, uh, in our um, laboratory at the Institut Pasteur, we work on ES61 proficient uh, recombinant BCG vaccines. The rationale behind is that BCG uh, during the attenuation phase uh, from passaging Mycobacterium bovis to become an attenuated vaccine, BCG has lost the RD1 region, which harbors the genes for the ES61 type 7 secretion system. And there is a similar vaccine also, which was used in the 1960s in the UK and also in former Czechoslovakia, uh, where more than 500,000 infants were vaccinated with this uh, life attenuated vaccine, Mycobacterium microti. And this vaccine also, as we have shown, uh, lacks part of this RD1 region, which is resulting in a non-functional ESX system in this, also, in this vaccine as well. So this just shows you uh, in, in red the region which is missing from BCG and in light blue the region which is missing uh, from Mycobacterium microti. There are five ESX1, uh, ESX systems in, in Mycobacterium tuberculosis and in tubercle bacilla in general. And uh, so this just uh, the upper part shows you the ESX1. Uh, locus and when you complement this with an, the region for mycobacterium tuberculosis by an integrating vector, uh, you can complement uh, the production of an important uh, antigen uh, EZ6 for instance uh, in this recombinant BCG ES61 uh, system which is work uh, which was done quite some time ago. So um, the ES61 is a paradigm type 7 secretion system of tubercle bacilli. Um, it's shown here, it's located in the interest in the inner membrane of, of Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, it secretes uh, important antigens, but it's also involved in phagosomal rupture, which was first shown by the team of uh, uh, Nicole van der Vel, and, and we also uh, could to repeat some of, of these experiments and uh, could show by other means that indeed it's involved in phagosomal rupture. And uh, you can see here that the ESX1 likely has a, a structure which resembles other ESX uh, systems like the ESX5 or ESX3 for which the uh, structure was recently uh, shown and uh, as, as here it has a six-fold symmetry and uh, these are very nice uh, uh, molecular machines uh, which are involved in the secretion of, of these antigens. Um, ESX doesn't work alone. It also needs the virulent lipids of Mycobacterium tuberculosis, or which are also present in other tubercle bacilli, the phthiosaural d as I mentioned before, the PDIM. Um, both of them act together uh, to cause phagosomal rupture, which is shown here, but I don't go into details just to mention you need both of them. And uh, when you, just as a summary, um, this phagosomal rupture induces that, uh, um, for instance, the secretion of type 1 interference uh, is obtained for my infection of micro with mycobacterium tuberculosis in the host cell, while this is not the, the case for BCG because it doesn't have this uh, ESX1 secretion system. And there is also, as another uh, result, um, the NLRP3 inflammasome activation, which is causing the secretion of interleukin, uh, the increased secretion of interleukin IL-1 beta and IL-18. So our rationale was to increase the protective efficacy of a vaccine by triggering these cytosolic pattern recognitions in the host cell. Uh, because the currently used TB vaccines, Mycobacterium, tuber um, Mycobacterium um, microti and BCG, they are both unable to induce such responses due to the lack of ESX1. Um, these are old data, just to show you that when you introduce the system from, from Mycobacterium tuberculosis, you obtain um, also an increased virulence and as seen here in this uh, severe combined immunodeficient mice. 
Um, but it also gives you a better protection in the guinea pig model, for example. And, but there, our rationale was now more recently to use the E61 system of Mycobacterium marinum, which is a BSL2 organism. So the recombinant BCG vaccine remains a BSL2 uh, organism. And uh, because Mycobacterium marinum, which is a close relative of, of, of the tubercle bacilli, uh, and is, is a waterborne mycobacterium, harbors a similar ES61 system, which also induces phagosomal rupture in the host cell. So this just shows you that this recommended BCG strain with mycobacterium marinum inside uh, acts uh, in virulence uh, is pretty much similar to the, the normal BCG Pasteur strain. Um, and much less than uh, the BCG ES61 um, mycobacterium tuberculosis strain, and uh, but induces similar levels of uh, interferon beta and also IL-1 uh, beta, as seen here. In collaboration with the team of Dr. Sung Chae Jin uh, from the Yonsan University at, in South Korea, um, we obtained this result that the protection of in this mouse model where they use a very virulent uh, MTB strain, a Beijing type HN878 strain. Um, it was more protective than, than the, for instance, BCG Pasteur or BCG Danish, uh, and also showed less uh, lung pathology after in infection with these uh, virulent MTB strains. Another collaboration with uh, Professor Samuel Behar from uh, Harvard University uh, using a collaborative cross-mouse uh, model where you select for mice which were not protected or very little protected by normal BCG vaccination here, the CC004 lineage of, of mice, um, the recombinant BCG strain expressing the um, Marinum ES61 system also gave a better protection in this system. And as a final uh, res example, also in guinea pigs, uh, in collaboration with Dr. Simon Clark here from the uh, previous agency, uh, Public Health England, which has, ch which has changed the name recently in the TBVI uh, group, uh, we obtained this result that at least three guinea pigs here were uh, the showed sterilizing uh, uh, immunity in this assay. Uh, so we also saw some protection and some improvement over BCG in this model. Um, so in, in conclusion, MTB, uh, BCG, ESX1, mycobacterium marinum induces enhanced immune responses and improved protection in preclinical models. This is very likely due to the um, induced um, cytosolic signaling, which uh, causes uh, IL-1 uh, better and IL-18, uh, stronger IL-1 better and IL-18 responses and also interferon, type 1 uh, interferon responses and uh, also increased adaptive immune responses for CD4 plus and CD8 plus responses. Uh, we have a collaboration ongoing with uh, Anne-Sophie, who is <laughs> chairwoman, uh, in, a, in a recently uh, um, accepted project from the INRS on, um, on innate immunity and on trained immunity. Um, and uh, this BCG ASX1 mycobacterium marinum strain is also subject of a collaboration in a recently started uh, a big uh, consortium uh, with TBVI, which is the TBVAC Horizon project, which is about to start soon. And so the conclusions for my talk, uh, I think we have promising results uh, have been obtained in recent years for several vaccine candidates, but still more work remains to be done to obtain the fully protective uh, vaccine against TB. Um, I also want to say that it was a personal selection of the vaccine candidates that I showed you. There are more out, as you have seen on, on the slide. Uh, there are several more uh, reviews and publication outside, so please, uh, look at them when you're interested. Um, we also have to consider that the efficient, the effectiveness of a TB vaccine may also depend on the route of vaccination. As I said, BCG was originally um, 
used as an oral vaccine before being modified into an intradermal injection. At this time, it was also given to nurses working in TB hospital. It showed still also a quite good protection in adults. So maybe the oral vaccination was a better way to than, than uh, the way it's, it's used today. And new studies on different routes are, are promising, including the mucosal routes of, of vaccination. And the implementation of new vaccines will have to take into account the global BCG vaccine policy because it would be unethical to vaccinate uh, infants in, in high endemic uh, TB countries with vaccines that are less potent than BCG. So BCG will remain an important player in the vaccine field and as a vaccine and as a comparator for upcoming years. And uh, just the acknowledgement. So um, from my group, uh, I wanted to acknowledge Rafa Frigi, Alexandra Pavlik, uh, Fadel Sayes, uh, Jan Madaki, and Michael, Michael Orger for the work in the lab on, on these different vaccine projects. And of course, in collaboration with the histology, histopathology platform at, of the Institut Pasteur and different collaborators that I have mentioned. And thank you for your attention and thank you for the funders as well. Merci. Est-ce qu'il y a une question pour. Oui, madame. On en prendra peut-être qu'une ou deux parce que. We only have time for one or two questions because we're running late. Microphone, please. For the lady here. Thank you very much for this presentation. I come from uh, the Ivory Coast uh, and uh, tuberculosis is endemic with multi-resistant forms in the HIV pandemic and ultra-resistant. We've all had been vaccinated in childhood, myself included, but it's been uh, shown now that the BCG vaccination has lost some of its efficacy and you are currently conducting a study. Now, my concern is uh, ties in with what I said earlier regarding COVID. Are you looking into the endemic countries where they have very specific forms of the diseases uh, when you start trials and studies? Uh, are you looking at new vaccine perspectives? This is my concern. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your question. The new vaccines are often tested in Africa. All the vaccines that I have described were tested in South Africa because there is a uh, high incidence of tuberculosis there. There are other centers in Africa that uh, are involved uh, in the uh, tests for tuberculosis vaccination campaigns. In all these countries, the BCG is still being used. It's efficient to protect children, but it's not enough to protect adults against uh, lung tuberculosis. So trials have been uh, conducted to revaccinate uh, people at the age of 13 or maybe 15, but it did not seem to uh, contribute much in terms of efficacy, and these trials were discontinued. Africa is obviously at the heart of all our concerns. But right now, we need to develop new vaccines, new tests, but definitely they will be tested on the field in Africa. Thank you. Okay, no more questions. Thank you very much uh, to you, Roland Broche. We're going to move on to the next presentation. Young researchers, Anne-Sophie, you can introduce the next speaker, Claire Hautefeuille. 
will be delivering a junior presentation. The junior presentations are shorter. She's a veterinarian. She's an epidemiologist by training. And she works uh, for the uh, UMR Sinrad uh, Inray. And she's going to tell us about her work on avian flu and the swine flu. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the presentation. And thank you for having invited me to uh, deliver a presentation on my work. My presentation will be a lot different from what you have heard so far. We're going to talk about epidemiology once the vaccines are available and have shown their efficacy. And we're also going to talk about veterinary issues because uh, avian influenza has a zoonotic potential, but it has a huge impact on uh, breeding farms. That's what I'm going to talk about. Introduction, uh, as you're probably uh, aware of, uh, avian influenza is highly pathogenic and uh, it affects countries across the world. Here we have a map of the uh, outbreak distribution as of 2022. And you can see we have outbreaks across the continents. And this year, mainly, mostly it was uh, Northern America and Europe. Huge economic impact. Uh, morbidity and mortality in the birds uh, is high. It means a loss of production. It also leads to restrictions and bans on international trade, meaning that the exporting countries uh, stand to lose a lot of money. And there are also concerns for the consumers, which leads to a decrease in the uh, poultry meat consumption. If we look at the number of uh, birds uh, dead or slaughtered uh, following uh, an outbreak uh, from uh, MSA, the uh, World Organization for Animal Health, four million birds have been uh, put down. And if we look at the uh, waves uh, before 20, uh, since 2020, the first two years uh, mean uh, counted for 220 million uh, birds being slaughtered. France, the ITAVI, uh, the Technical Avian uh, Center, show, data shows that in 2015, 16, uh, 16, 17, and 2021, the waves, the uh, economic loss was approximately 500 million euros. And for last year's wave, 2021-2022, the losses uh, were in the range of 1 billion euros. How do we protect uh, poultry breeding farms against avian influenza? Well, there are preventative measures such as biosecurity, disinfection and cleaning of the premises, biosanitary uh, airlock at the entrance. Then there is monitoring. And once the disease is present on the territory, we have to implement control measures, limiting uh, movements between the breeding farms, uh, slaughtering of the animals in the infected uh, farms. And when it is not possible to eradicate the disease by slaughtering uh, the infected uh, animals, then there is preventative slaughtering where the animals are slaughtered in all the uh, other farms surrounding the infected farm. Finally, there's vaccination, which is helpful for both prevention and control. For vaccination, there are four different uh, vaccines, inactivated vaccines, recombinant vaccines, uh, virus like particle vaccines, and RNI, RNA vaccines. There are two ways to apply vaccination, either in the farm, and this is for uh, VLP inactivated and RNA uh, vaccines, and the uh, vaccines which is conducted in the hatching premises, and that's the recombinant vaccine. For possible uh, strategies, we have emergency vaccination at the beginning of the outbreak, or preventative vaccination in those countries that do, are not affected by the avian flu and want to limit the uh, presence or introduction of the disease in their country. And finally, there is prophylactic country uh, vaccination in the endemic countries who want to decrease infectious pressure, infectious pressure on the territory or possibly even use vaccination to eradicate the disease. The purpose of our work was to identify the most efficient vaccination strategy to protect the avian poultry, um, avian farms. We use the EVAX uh, tool, Evaluation of Vaccination Strategy. The tool was developed in 2013 by CIRAD and applied uh, within the fight against avian influenza uh, 
public-private uh, collaboration with Seva Santé Animal, uh, a French laboratory. The tool was applied in several countries, Egypt, Vietnam, Bangladesh, uh, Tunisia, Indonesia, and France. And in my presentation, I'd like to share with you very quickly the results in Egypt, Vietnam, and France. So how does Evax work? The first stage consists in developing a, uh, an animal production network. Here we have the uh, broiler network in Vietnam. We have uh, the great parents, uh, which will produce uh, eggs to be hatched. The uh, farms will then, uh, the, the hatching premises will uh, hatch uh, chicken that will go to uh, the other farms, which will produce uh, poultry for the hatching premises. So we had different integrated and independent hatching premises uh, providing uh, chicken for the broiler farms. We had integrated farms, uh, farms uh, or intermediate or large size or small size uh, farms under contract, and finally independent farms, uh, again, small size, medium size or large size. Once the production network has been defined, we can define the uh, vaccination strategy. For the scenario applied in Vietnam, the first scenario was uh, vaccinating only the breeding farms. The second scenario was provide vaccinating in the uh, the chicks, which were destined for the contract farms or the independent farms. And scenario three was vaccination of all the uh, chickens uh, being hatched in the integrated hatching premises. And finally, the last scenario was only uh, vaccinating the birds in the hatching premises. Once these strategies have been defined, we can test them and compare them with a stochastic model based on immunity, presenting the level of immunity depending on the scenario. So once of the uh, readouts of the model would be the percentage of zero protection depending on the scenario applied. On this particular figure, we have uh, the different scenarios in one axis. The other axis is the percentage of the population zero protected. And the, the lines, the curves uh, correspond to the populations protected. And the dotted red line is the total population. <clears throat> and we want to find a, lev a total level of zero protection uh, beyond a certain threshold, 60% here, depending on the epidemiology situation of the country. Once we have defined the immunity level, we can represent it in geographic and geographical ways uh, with the density of population. Here we have the four different scenarii and the results uh, for zero protection uh, ge with geographical distribution. And we look at the uh, densely populated areas, trying not to understand whether the scenario is sufficient to protect the population. We also have a uh, cost-benefit uh, ratio analysis module. I'm not going to go into that today. But what really matters here in this tool is that every stage, whether we're talking about defining the network, defining the vaccination strategies, but also the entry parameters of the stochastic model, are discussed with the uh, industry uh, players uh, in uh, workshops, and this is a photograph of the workshop was conducted in Vietnam. The results, in Egypt, uh, the tool was applied only on the broiler, in, in the broiler industry. We wanted to compare vaccination in the farms uh, versus vaccination in the hatching premises. And the uh, tool showed that it was more interesting to vaccinate the one-day-old chicks. And the application allowed us to define the vaccine strategy against highly pathogenic uh, influenza, such as the one we had in the 2016 outbreak. Vietnam, three industries, uh, broiler, uh, uh, lay, egg laying uh, animals and native uh, chicken. And we find the interest of vaccination in the uh, one-day-old chicks. The uh, tool allowed us to uh, license uh, recombinant vaccines with uh, application in the hatching premises. Now, for France, we applied the uh, tool in five different industries, broilers, laying eggs, uh, turkey, uh, duck, and uh, guinea fowl. And we adapted the tool for regionalized strategies. And we were able to compare vaccine strategies in the western part of France versus vaccine strategy across the whole territory. Discussion and conclusion regarding the tool. AVAC is a tool that gives us an uh, element to better understand the uh, vaccination strategy. So it's a decision-making tool, really. And it's based on a participatory approach 
involving all the players in this industries when we need to define the best vaccination strategy and the tool is uh, easy to adapt to different production uh, structures or to epidemiological situations i.e places where the countries have do not have the disease in places where the disease is endemic and by comparing we were able to show the importance of uh, a discussion between science society and decision making parties in time of peace so it's sort of an outbreak and a crisis and uh, the CIRED was involved here as well as the founding members i'd like to thank all the partners and uh, players uh, who participated in the study and i thank you all for your attention and if there are any questions if there are no questions you can come to me during one of the coffee breaks or lunch breaks Thank you, Pierre Rotefeuille. We're going to finish uh, with a short sequence regarding uh, France 2030 and the national strategy for speeding up uh, with Lisa Alter and Nadia Kelev. Lisa Alter, you are the general manager, uh, general director of the uh, AIS agency and the uh, General Secretariat for Investment. And you're going to introduce the work that was launched uh, in the priority to support uh, project leaders. I'd like to thank Institut Pasteur for having invited me and also the NRS uh, director for having given me the opportunity to uh, tell you about what we do at the uh, Health Innovation Center, Agence Innovation Santé, and the 2030 uh, plan. Uh, I'd like to stand back a little bit from what we heard this morning, which was all very interesting, and uh, talk less about the scientific project, which I really admire, and talk more about the uh, introductory uh, elements, which were covered uh, briefly this morning by the uh, first speakers. The Health Innovation Agency is included within the uh, 2030 plan, 54 billion euros to turn France into one of the um, sovereign and innovative uh, countries. As far as health is concerned, 7.5 billion euros dedicated to health and 7.5 billion euros will be uh, divided uh, among various strate acceleration strategies. Nadia Kelev will tell you about the emerging infectious diseases uh, and NRBC. But there is also the uh, acceleration strategy for bio uh, drugs uh, and uh, bio production and the uh, use of digital in health and the plan for innovative uh, technologies. The agency is going to have to lead the credits and the measures taken for France 2030 regarding those strategies. But while I have the floor, because uh, the research uh, is really a comparative uh, element here, I'd like to focus on the major investment that plan France 2030 is in dedicating to biomedical technologies. Because the whole point, I mean, the whole idea of France 2030 is to invest in innovation. But that means that we have to guarantee a continuum flow, continuous flow between research, innovation, production. I mean, all three dimensions should be tied together. We have to combine the work of uh, researchers, entrepreneurs, industry, because that's fundamental for the 2000, France 2030 plan. And we have to give a lot of importance to emerging players. For medical research, more than 1.2 billion already have been invested. For the uh, site policy, that means investing in excellent centers, uh, teaching hospitals, and also uh, global size uh, clusters, one of which uh, has been chosen recently, the Paris Sacré Grand Serre Cluster. And again, the point is here to establish the connection between the researchers and the uh, industry. Other actions have been taken and funded regarding biomedical research. For instance, uh, anything uh, pertaining to uh, research infrastructure, biobanks, bio cohorts, uh, and uh, trying to attract investments in uh, biomedical research. I, I remember hearing you when you said uh, we needed more young people invested in the field of research. The bid for tender for uh, jobs in biological research uh, is absolutely essential to attract young researchers uh, and keep them in France, uh, attract them uh, in, 
to incite them to stay in France and conduct work uh, and research on ecosystems. Now, beyond biomedical research and the invent investment therein, the role of uh, the agency will be to uh, work on three missions to provide support to the interministerial groups for health. We really do not want to be see innovations being imposed on us. We want to prepare for them. We want to be at the uh, upstream rather than downstream of technological innovations. We know it takes time, it takes organization. We have witnessed this uh, when uh, hepatitis C, uh, new drugs uh, arrived on the market, CAR T cells. Uh, I mean, everything takes time and we have to share the information and we also have to establish priorities for funding. So this work will be conducted to identify uncovered medical needs or insufficiently covered medical needs and then the ministries and the players, the stakeholders will be able to list these uh, uncovered medical needs and place them as priorities uh, in ministerial work. We have partnerships, we have uh, shared work to conduct together. That's it for the first part, perspectives. <coughs> Next, the agency will be divided in two poles which will work together in a tight collaboration. One dedicated to uh, priority innovating projects with three main programs. The first program is priority access. And obviously, the agency is not going to work alone. Uh, it, work, it will work with partners, uh, ANSM, HS, uh, on the fast track uh, system, which uh, uh, label that we will work together on so that the project managers have fast track access, access to fast track for clinical trials, uh, high health authority evaluation, etc. There will be also a program outside of the framework because some uh, projects are so disruptive that actually we have to look at the regulatory framework that they should, in theory, uh, belong to. And finally, there will be a last program for bringing innovating, innovating projects up to scale once they have demonstrated that they have clinical efficacy and value. But we have to help them develop, we have to put, place them between the hands of the final users and the uh, healthcare professionals and help them disseminate internationally. So those are the uh, supporting program. And by supporting project uh, leaders, we can also identify the obstacles. This morning we talked about the stakes and the challenges and the obstacles that uh, project leaders were facing regarding rules and regulation. Well, precisely here with this program, we can identify the obstacles and there will be an, an acceleration uh, program that will help solve some uh, stalling situations, uh, accelerate the process so that the largest number of people can benefit from the results, which means that you have to accelerate access to innovation for patients. I mean, that's the main outcome, the main goal. And I, I know that all the stakeholders uh, believe in it. Priority work for the agency for speeding up processes. We're going to start priority work uh, for clinical research. We're all totally aware that the first stage uh, to make innovation available for patients consists in organizing clinical trials as quickly as possible, as early as the early phases, so that the clinicians can use them, can identify the stakes for toxicity, and also uh, improve the clinical trials when needed. And then we move on to phase two, phase three, and early access uh, to the treatments for patients. And the earlier the uh, work is conducted, the faster the access uh, to the treatments for patients. This will translate in a number of projects in collaboration with FCRA and based on the work already uh, conducted, because I'm not going to reinvent the wheel we will tap into the work that has already been conducted to develop clinical research. There's a lot being done today. For instance, when the randomized clinical trials are not possible or cannot be contemplated for ethical reasons, 
it's important that we can tap into uh, other methods, uh, synthetic arms, uh, and we have started a working group to release recommendations and work in collaboration with the sanitary authorities, both on the French and European and international level, and we want to work on concrete use cases. The work is going to start very soon. The first recommendations are this summer, and it will continue for the next few years to show the uh, relevance of these new methods, including for very concrete use cases. And this will also lead to work on uh, decentralization uh, and digitalization of uh, clinical research to provide faster access to the patients, uh, for the patients to the drugs. And finally, we will work uh, to uh, continue work already started to accelerate the clinical trials in collaboration with all the stakeholders. So that was uh, a quick review of the uh, agency's priority uh, work. We share everything that was said this morning. This has to be done in a partnership. And to close, I would like to quote Pasteur, because, I mean, there's not evading it. Pasteur used to say, chances for those who are well prepared. And by uh, uniting our forces and by uh, preparing ourselves in the best possible way, we will be able to rise to the challenge and prepare for possible sanitary crisis and different uh, threats that we all have in mind. And we're open to any uh, exchange and discussion with any of you if you're interested. Thank you for your attention. And I'll give the floor to Dania Kalev, who's going to make a uh, more precise uh, presentation on the uh, accelerating strategy for emerging uh, infectious diseases. Thank you very much. The coordinatrice strategy, donc, uh, acceleration. You're the uh, strategy coordination. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for inviting us. I'm the last thing standing between you and lunch, so I'll try to keep it short and sweet. As an FYI, the slides will be made available to you, and we'll be here all afternoon. I'll be here most of tomorrow as well. If you have any specific questions, oh, I'm in charge of the slides, okay. There seems to be a slight technical problem. That's okay. Moving on. Is it because of the strike? Oh, you'll have the slides later. Okay. Acceleration strategy for EIDs, NRBC threats, one of the components of our health innovation plan by 2030. The strategy has 750 million euros in endowment. It's a five-year program. You have to understand that the strategy is an interdepartmental, interministerial effort. It comes in addition to the work and institutional funding already received by the different ministries, including research, healthcare, industry. This strategy seeks to operate uh, as part of a One Health uh, approach. Uh, again, human health is the priority, but we also take into account uh, animal health and uh, environmental impacts and impacts on the environment and impacts by the environment. So the strategy also has an NRPC component. The Ministry for the Armies uh, is also working with us. Coordination is provided by LGBI as part of AIS. This is a strategy just like France 2030 and the work of ANRS, uh, the goal is to fund and support a number of measures that will help uh, uh, promote uh, upstream research and also support innovation. Develop countermeasures, whether medical or not. Countermeasures such as therapeutics, diagnostics, uh, vaccines, uh, monitoring equipment, etc., as well as information. Again, the goal is to develop countermeasures that can support the industrialization and national uh, capacities so we can insource and relocate in our country those capabilities. Uh, will I ever see my slides again? 
Can the technical team let us know what's going on? Is there any chance we can display the slides? Okay, well, I will move on. You're okay. I started working in this field a long time ago, so I kind of know what I'm talking about. I'm able to ad lib without the slides. So five components in the strategy. Oh, there's something I forgot to tell you, but it's important. This strategy is rolled out in uh, partnership with the EU, together with ERA, the European Agency for Preparedness and Response to Health Crises. And again, a lot of their priorities are in line with ours. The strategy has five different components, including support to multidisciplinary research. You heard about the MI, the EIDP EPR, which is coordinated and operated by the ANRS MIE. We have representatives of that agency. They can answer any questions you may have regarding the call for tender, which was initiated in February. There was an information session on that request for projects early March, and there's a matchmaking effort going on between Actually, that will take place on March 23rd. I think you can still sign up. And now I can show you my slides. I already told you all of that. We'll get back to the background of the challenges, the objectives. Oh, I forgot to talk about the objectives. The goals of the strategy. The strategy was designed during the COVID crisis. Again, the goal is to start addressing the pandemic and also prepare for the next one. We need to capitalize on uh, what we've learned from COVID. The goal is to strengthen public sector and private sector research so you can get ready. We need to accumulate new knowledge and also transfer to industry. I mean, de develop our ability to, to put together countermeasures, increase our production capacities, and also train the young generation. We've all said that. And that's, a, that's an outcome that we all want. We want to generate the next generation of researchers. There are areas where there are huge needs for researchers. So five priorities, interdisciplinary research, innovation, developing countermeasure production capabilities, developing organizational measures. It's not just about finance. Please alter, talk about everything the agency is going to do. As part of the strategy, there'll, there'll be a special focus on organization, uh, getting ready ahead of time before, we, before the crisis emerges so we can better respond to it. So we can support our biomedical research and interaction capabilities, as well as additional aspects that are specifically intended for health crisis preparedness and also information that I already mentioned. So the two PEPRs, we talked about the MIE or EID PEPR, have an endowment of 80 million euros. The RFP was already initiated, as I said before, and there's a second PEPR called PRESENT. It will work in coordination with the EID PPR. Now the representatives of that second PPR are here. Now this PEPR is jointly coordinated by CIRAM, IRA, -E and ERD. And the goal of these uh, of this research for priority equipments and programs is, is to look at the risk of factors for the emergence of pathogens before they can actually emerge and become transmissible. Uh, please look at the terms of reference of that uh, RFP. For this PEPR, things are done slightly differently. There are letters of intent, which are expected. I'm speaking too fast at the speaker, the interpreter agrees. So those letters of intent will be uh, an opportunity to set up meetings, volunteer meetings between project owners and uh, financiers. And Feel free to watch the replay of that webinar, which was held on March 9th, and talk to the PEPR representatives. So, like I said, the endowment is 80 million euros, which comes to a total of 110 million euros for research. Support to innovation. Three main priorities. First of all, supporting pre-maturing and maturing of countermeasures. 
upstream research outcomes can receive financial support. That support means transferring, uh, or rather supporting, technology transfer and acceleration organizations. So one consortium won the endowment of 20 million euros. They will use that money to structure national representation, or rather the national ecosystem of uh, technology transfer organizations. Looking at all the projects that can receive that financial support and help them grow and mature. Very soon, in the next few days, we will initiate another RFP specifically for developing countermeasures at higher mature levels with larger project sizes. This RFP is mostly intended for research partnerships between private sector and public sector entities. Again, the goal is to help those countermeasures mature and grow. Whether as part of clinical trials, this will include uh, uh, preclinical regulatory aspects or other aspects. Now, we're, none, we're not looking at the, having projects that range every step of the way, but uh, we have 66 million euros that are already being committed uh, at the time of implementing that strategy um, via a, a call for manifesting interest. Mm -hmm. And there are 15 other projects are being supported. So we're very happy to see that those projects are moving forward and are growing. Uh, on the innovation front, there's a measure designed to support what we call the demonstrator validation platforms for, um, for countermeasures with a national scale. So we're working with academia and industry. These are platforms to validation. Uh, I'm sure that the entire ecosystem is familiar with them. Some of those platforms, well, let me give you the list. It's just as here, Covireva, Discovery, Emergen, Obepin. These are academic consortia. And they're all hands on deck. Many thanks to them. Many thanks to all our researchers and our frontliners uh, for their efforts during the COVID crisis. Um, they've worked hard to pool their respective resources with help from the research and healthcare uh, ministries. And so these platforms have been mandated to propose an organization, a governance system, an action plan to expand their scope of action and include other EIDs besides COVID and to propose a sustainable model that can be supported over time. So proposals will be looked at by an independent uh, jury. The evaluation will soon be over. We'll know what the outcomes are, and you will continue to use um, those capabilities. Very soon, work will be done to continue to mobilize new platforms or existing platforms for validation and demonstration of those new countermeasures. And 100 million euros has been earmarked for that effort. Out of the 750 million euros, two thirds will go to upstream research and also downstream research for maturation purposes. I'll I'll be more I'll be quicker when it comes to measure number seven. This is the second to last aspect. This is a request for projects to support industry so they can scale up and also onshore develop production units which were set up during the crisis of refocusing their existing capabilities and activities in addition to that uh, financial support which comes to 300 million euros we have decided to do, we have decided to define a new policy for dynamic management of strategic stockpiling in connection with a new uh, government contract policy. You probably know that uh, it is extremely difficult for industry players to commit to producing and storing countermeasures. I'd like to remind you that for EIDs, there's a list of priority pathogens 
you must have seen that list uh, in the calls for tender. There's a list of priority pathogens, which is pretty long. And there's a list of countermeasures against those pathogens, which is also pretty long. A list of NRBC measures that we want to develop. And we it is difficult to develop and uh, stockpile uh, all of those countermeasures for threats that may very well never materialize a crisis that may never actually break out or, or we don't know when they're going to break out. So stock or inventory management, those are capabilities that we need to revisit and develop. One last slide. All of that information is public. You can find it on our website. There's information on the organizational measures that will help the government to work at the national and regional level and better organized to respond to the next crises better. A quick focus on the regional and national level. Of course, um, the uh, overseas territories and regions in France are part and parcel of that effort, particularly when it comes to research, PEPR programs. And that will be my final word on that training effort. We have supported the creation of new um, research universities and designed a tool train researchers. Very soon there'll be a presentation on those activities. I'm sorry I took longer than in 10 minutes allotted to me, but I hope I've said it all. Thank you very much. That was really important. <coughs> to focus on our acceleration strategy. Thank you very much for being here this morning. Thank you to Sophie for being a moderator and let's reconvene in about an hour. Thank you. being back for the second session which will be just as interesting as the one this morning we're going to talk about interventional research with the uh, difficult populations how can an intervention be efficient if we take in consideration the local situation in order to really root the research in the local population how do we involve the uh, people concerned in the project in the methods in the questions so that they can get on board and uh, play their role the moderators will be Perrine Roux who is a uh, research manager at INSERM uh, economic and social science uh, research uh, unit in uh, Marseille and Valentine Becquet UNAID uh, demography southern demography uh, research uh, and sexual and reproductive science uh, and you are both um, specialists of demography and you have the floor thank you very much i'd like to thank uh, um, anrs uh, for having given us the opportunity to organize this session we believe that this session is of the utmost importance as daniel said because assessing interventions in increasingly difficult situations with social and society related issues uh, with uh, populations who are increasingly precarious or people who are left uh, on, on the side of the uh, community uh, makes our intervention even more important. And I hope that the uh, presentations will give you a better idea of how we can assess and uh, factor in these key populations. I'm going to start with Joseph Lamaran. Joseph, Joseph uh, specializes in demography at UNCEPED, is an ERD uh, researcher, works on HIV in Africa, and he's going to tell us about interventional research, how to move from efficacy to efficiency. Thank you very much, Perrine, for your, your introduction. Dear colleagues, it is a pleasure to be with you this afternoon to start the present the afternoon to be the first speaker. We're going to start talking about interventional research, how to turn efficient innovation into uh, efficient interventions. And I'd like to give you a few examples derived from the uh, fight against HIV. If we uh, look back to the history of HIV, the translational research was conducted by the scientific community and we will see several examples showing out that these interventions, these innovations are not sufficient to make a big change in the epidemic. Remember in the 90s, the antiretroviral drugs 
extensive work describing the way the virus operates, uh, new therapies, everybody remembers 1996, uh, and three therapies with protease inhibitors are coming on the market, and that was a big, big revolution for the patients. But for lack of funding, these uh, treatments were not accessible for the largest population. They were mostly used for northern uh, country uh, patients, but not southern country patients. And it took politi political innovations to develop programs so that more people had access to antiretroviral drugs. 2001, the first uh, generic drugs. 2002, the creation of the uh, World Fund. Uh, the PEPFAR program in the US in 2003. And starting in 2004, Free of charge access to antiretroviral drugs was uh, became possible across the world. However, reinforcing this was necessary in order to innovate uh, the uh, the way the diagnosis was, the screening was funded, and we also had to train healthcare professionals. Now there have been success stories. In 2003, 100,000 people were on antiretroviral drugs in uh, Saharan Africa. We now. I have moved to 19.5 uh, billion million in 2020, and we have a huge decrease now in the ways uh, connected with HIV treatment. Treatments are available in the countries, but it's useless if people don't know whether they are infected or not, and are not supported uh, towards uh, benefiting from the treatment. In the year 2000, we knew that screening covered less than a quarter of the people who uh, lived with HIV. Quick. Screening tests were an innovation developed in the 90s. They allow a point of care screening and the result is available in 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes. As early as 1997, WHO developed screening strategies with the, the quick tests. However, there were no programs to organize access to treatment and therefore the screening programs actually were never or hardly implemented in southern countries. 2007, a few years after the antiretroviral drugs uh, became available, and we thought we had to review the way screening was organized. WHO started uh, recommending uh, screening uh, the, uh, the Conseil de dépistage à initiative des partenaires, CDIP. So rather than asking for people's uh, consent, active consent, it was offered the screening was offered to the people and uh, they were allowed to say no. Transmission to children uh, was important and the program uh, developed uh, in many countries because if uh, many women know whether they are affected now, it's thanks to the PTME program. However, it's not enough yet. And in 2013, WHO started recommending community screening approaches, approaches based uh, on uh, approach outside of the villages, uh, outside of the uh, screening center, increasing the rate of, uh, of um, diagnosis in the local populations. The whole challenge in the screening uh, strategies uh, consisted in reaching new populations. There are hyperendemic areas in uh, Africa, and we show how efficient it is to have an approach, a door-to-door -door approach uh, for the local populations. We can talk uh, about ERDS work and the set task in uh, South, uh, South Africa, because with repeated screening campaigns, it was possible to increase the antiretroviral coverage uh, of the populations in the concerned areas. We also changed the investigation and uh, inquiry method. Uh, we had thought until then that transmission was heterosexual or maternal-fetal, and the homosexual population was not uh, actually considered. In 2004, the first uh, investigation was conducted to understand the prevalence among male homosexuals, and it was an RDS program repeated in 2007. And in the meantime, we have increased the number of investigations or inquiries, and uh, we can now ask the question to the political decision-making bodies, and we now know that male homosexuals are a key population in sub-Saharan Africa. But because we don't have a badge for, for polls, uh, we use the uh, ADS respondent-driven sampling. The RDS method is a new strategy, a new method to conduct uh, investigations, and it's a new strategy to recruit populations, to offer services to the populations, especially drug users, 
And in Vietnam, there have been programs co-financed by ANRS uh, and they will be presented this afternoon. But other key uh, populations also such as prostitutes and sex workers and male homosexuals. There will be an innovation presented later this afternoon. During the last decade, the main revolution in the field of uh, HIV prevention was uh, pre-exposure prophylactic, uh, known in short as PrEP. There have been many trials, but in 2014, we got the result from the INRS IPERGAY in France and Proud in UK with male homosexual populations showing that PrEP is efficient to prevent the HIV infection. 2015, PrEP is recommended by WHO for people who are at substantial risk of contracting HIV. And 2016, France is one of the first countries reimbursing the PrEP. Hypergay ARS studies showed that it is important to uh, make it available in the community and also to uh, improve uh, sexual health and uh, screening in several areas where the epidemic is uh, fueled by uh, male homosexuals, uh, Eastern United States, San Francisco, Australia, the Paris area. With the PrEP, we have observed a decrease in the number of infections, but the PrEP doesn't always work. And before 2014, most of the PrEP trials that were conducted in Sub-Saharan Africa for women did not work. And this graph comes from AVAC, and it shows on the horizontal line the percentage of participants uh, who uh, had PrEP in their blood a PrEP level in the blood, and the vertical axis is the efficacy of the trials, and PrEP is efficient if it's taken. However, some of the trials were non-conclusive because it's simply the subjects did not take the PrEP or did not take it correctly. Now, who can benefit from PrEP? Not everybody. In the ANRS Prevenir cohort that was organized in France, more than 3,000 people were included, 99% were male homosexuals, median age 35. In one of the pioneer works on PrEP and sex workers conducted in Cotonou in Benin, they were able to include women, but um, the retention was not sufficient. Only 60% of the women were still under care after one year. In the DREAMS program in Austral Africa and Eastern Africa, Western Africa and Southern Africa and Eastern Africa for teenagers in Kenya, PrEP is well accepted. However, the girls do not come back. They come once, but only one third will come back three months later. One month ago, there was an article published regarding a national program data in South Africa for sex workers. It, between 2016, 2020, there were 20,000 initiation, but only 1,200 women were still on PrEP in December 2021. So very often they give you the number of initiations, but they don't give you the number of people who are still on PrEP. It's difficult to recruit the populations and once they are recruited to retain them, especially for sex workers, trans migrants or teenager, female teenagers. This is a preliminary result from the Princess uh, trial, ANRS Princess, mobile clinic for sex workers in the Ivory Coast uh, offering uh, PrEP. And when they are included in the trial, most women are interested. 96% say they would like to go on PrEP, initiate PrEP. Or we have to give them a checkup before we initiate the, the PrEP. And 56% drop out within the, two the first six weeks and don't come back for their PrEP. And for those who initiate the treatment, 52% do not come back for the recall visit. So you see, some people will come maybe six months later, nine months later, will reinitiate the, pro the process, but many are, are lost from sight. We're talking about precarious women with a lot of mobility, and the quality uh, interviews uh, conducted by Valentine here shows that the drug is taken by women, although they are not sick. So for a woman, taking a drug when you're not sick, they understand why it's needed, but they don't realize that it's going to prepare pre pre protect them against a possible disease. So they think it's a hassle to take a drug when you're not sick. And they, we realize that women will tend to revalue, review the uh, benefit constraint ratio every time they come back for the treatment. And, you know, maybe they have one opinion now and they may have a different opinion two months later. Preventative uh, follow-up, uh, which is can, becoming standard for key populations, has now become heavier than the therapeutic uh, care. For people who are on HIV, 
who have HIV. We try to see them every six months. We try to give them uh, how to get their pills and drugs outside of the hospital. Whereas here, preventing the disease is actually a heavier process than treating the disease. So we are thinking on, on how we can make it lighter. There are new tools. There will be presentations this afternoon. Long duration uh, antiretroviral drugs. It's a therapeutic innovation uh, which has uh, Risen uh, led to a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, here we have injectable injectable diseases every two or three months intramuscular injection. It will there will be a presentation later today. It's still very expensive, too expensive. There's no generic drug accessible to all. There are also production issues, insufficient quantities. So it's, there is a uh, supply issue, and very often priority is given to patients who are observant, who come back to the clinic on a regular basis, because if you want to be injected, you have to come back every two months for the injection. Some uh, patients will have compliance taking a drug every day, but for those who come every two months, then you have to have follow-up, and capotegravir is only uh, good for people who come every two months. There are also social issues, which we will look into this afternoon, so it's not necessarily the best solution for everybody. There are other tools in the pipeline. Lena Capovir is in phase three. It's a subcutaneous injection every six months, or possibly even every 12 months. Lena Capovir is interesting because subcutaneous is then painful. Trouble is, we will not get any phase three results before 2027. There are vaginal gels, there are implants, but they will not be available before five years. And they would help us rethink our prevention model and how to make prevention earlier. And although they're not available yet, we don't have to wait for the question of preparation because this is something we use for chronic diseases in general. So we have to start thinking about how these innovations could be implemented on the ground, on the field. Regardless of what innovation is coming, it will have to be integrated in the general service offer. When we went moved from uh, clinical trials of PrEP to use of PrEP in real life, we understood that we had to change our offer from uh, sexual health and PrEP, but turn it into PrEP with sexual health. So we need sexual health clinics for vulnerable populations and key populations, healthcare interventions and community support. And this also will be the subject of the uh, sexual health presentation later this afternoon. There is no miracle solution. One innovation may be extremely efficient in one clinical trial and will not be efficient if it is not ad adjusted to the local constraints, social, legal, that the populations are facing. And also the structure the local structure of the health care, you have to think, how is the intervention going to be uh, given by the local healthcare professionals? We're talking about a global stake, and therefore there must be a collective uh, answer. We can't all think of our own answer in our local uh, community. How a local experiment may also be used to rethink the international recommendations and improve them. We also have to think how international recommendations, such as the WHO recommendations, can be used so that policies can be uh, organized in a different way, depending to the, local, to the local constraints. You can't apply the same program across 15 different countries. It won't work everywhere. All these questions about implementing uh, an innovation and bringing it to scale. And we haven't even talked about the economic programming. This is not just an operational issue. It's about research. And really, we have to develop an implementation <coughs> science to look into it. And we have to think about how these interventions can be uh, integrated in people's lives in the healthcare system and the healthcare programs. We need research. It's not just field work. We need research. Implementation sciences must be interdisciplinary. We need people with uh, clinical skills, epidemiology, demographic, public health, social skills. And together, they will make progress. On the other hand, this research must be across the board in all the different areas. It must involve everybody, researchers, decision makers, populations. And so we need a kind of research which is both interventional and community based. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm available if you have any questions. Merci, Joseph, pour cette présentation.
Thank you, Joseph, for this beautiful presentation. Are there any questions? Moi, j'en ai une. I have a question. I guess there are peer trainings. Uh, you say that sex workers t tend to drop out. Uh, do we have peers, pe little, similar people who might be used as role model and drag the others along? Well, in all the program, Princess, uh, Princess, Commissum, Many, many uh, programs uh, rely on uh, peer educators, associations, people drawn from the community and trained to train their peers. But it doesn't solve everything. It's an essential item, but it doesn't uh, always uh, remove the uh, reticence of some people. We were talking about peer educator-led uh, trainings. Often these people are not retributed. They're not paid. The statute is not very clear. In France, there is a discussion to find exactly what the role is of health mediators, but it's not always like that. We are working to give them some acknowledgement, some recognition, and a salary, some a wage. There are trainings, uh, peer uh, training for peers to make them to turn people into peer researchers. There are small initiatives, uh, community programs. For instance, the Academy of Research that was organized last year by Cid Action. It's a duplicate of the University of Young Researchers, except in Africa. Yes, sir. Dr. Noel, congratulations. for this beautiful work. But I would like to refer to something that's happened in the late 90s, 96, until 2005. During that period, WHO did not play the role it was supposed to play. What happened was that in our countries, in Africa especially, maybe you remember, at the time antiretroviral drugs were available in northern countries, but there was not enough for southern country populations. They were not available. So in Senegal, we launched a project the uh, 1215 from ANRS, to show the efficacy of antiretroviral drugs in Africa. And that was an essential part. What that research led to was a negotiation with all five pharma companies, BMS, etc., MSD. October 20, uh, 2000 in Dakar, to bring down the cost of antiretroviral drugs in Africa and bring it to $5 per year. <coughs> now, it, we must remind people that, okay, progress has been made for screening, but if you screen someone, then you have to treat that person if he or she is infected. And people were reluctant to get screened because they thought, okay, I'm going to be screened and then what? I will not be treated. So in the intervention, you have to make sure people understand that access to treatment has been improved. So I agree with you, innovation, but also um, in the future, you must have uh, maybe referred to uh, what I just said. Yes, I confirm that uh, until there is a treatment, there's no point in organizing screening. And for those of you who are interested, if you look at the very initial work conducted by WHO regarding HIV screening and the questions they raised at the time, it's exactly what happened uh, during the COVID pandemic, except it's a whole different issue here. More questions? No more questions. Okay. No questions, no questions. We move on to the next speaker. 
Merci Joseph. Donc maintenant on va écouter. Thank you Joseph. Now we have Nicolas Nago. Nicolas Nago teaches uh, public health at the uh, Montpellier University Hospital and is the director of the PCCEI uh, EMR and he coordinates a research consortium uh, targeting um, drug users in Vietnam. Thank you. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you to the agency for having invited me to take the floor and talk about vulnerable populations especially as far as the recruitment strategies are concerned, vulnerable populations have in common the fact that they are marginalized, stigmatized, which means they have uh, less access to prevention, care, and they are increasingly exposed to infections, outbreaks, comorbidity, as is the case with the uh, hepatitis C uh, virus uh, in this map uh, regarding uh, drug users. Recruitment strategies are at the, of the utmost importance, both for epidemiology purposes, because we really have to be aware of the epidemiology situation in those countries, but also for intervention purposes, anything done to control the uh, outbreaks, uh, as Joseph said during his presentation. I am going to focus on the three main vulnerable populations, which are all well fairly known, sex workers, drug users, and HSH, homosexuals. So if we want to recruit people from vulnerable populations, a very simple solution consists in identifying them in the healthcare centers those provided they already are being taken care of, HIV treatment, uh, reproductive health uh, attempt to uh, decrease the damage. And it sounds simple, but it isn't that simple. And it's not all that efficient either, at least less than what would have been expected. Take hepatitis C with drug users in France. Based on a study that I'm going to describe later, which was conducted in Montpellier, we observed that, that uh, people who go to uh, the Ecurud, 14% uh, of them have uh, active hepatitis C, which would warrant a treatment. So the strategy is not totally efficient. And besides, it does not necessarily reach the people who are already on, on, in, on treatment or in care, and uh, it's not enough to control the outbreak. Uh, we have community strategies. Uh, Joseph uh, talked about the going towards, quote unquote, strategies uh, tested for screening and treatment, but there is insufficient coverage. And there is also the possibility to assess the whole cascade from screening to treatment and curing. And uh, this is uh, partially not evaluated and we still are lacking data. The network recruitment strategies uh, started developing uh, in the last 20 years based on the, the theory of uh, social media social connections within those vulnerable populations, whereby it's easier for them to recruit each other. These uh, strategies uh, are relatively simple because no need to go towards the people. People come to the site, which is even more, more convenient for the people in charge of screening. It's not all that simple, but it works. And the coverage potential is fairly large. And these approaches have uh, spread with different strategies that I would not go over, so-called snowballing or random walk strategies. And I will uh, come focus on the RDS, respondent driven sampling, because that is definitely the, the one that is uh, most widely spread for vulnerable populations. Now, RDS was uh, developed by Douglas Hegerton in the United States 20 years ago 
to uh, obtain good epidemiology data regarding uh, epidemiology status of vulnerable populations. The idea was to obtain a sample which would be fairly representative of the target population. The ODS approach is based on uh, recruit, recruiting people who will initiate the study, the seed people, as we call them. We recruit them in the community and uh, they match the general characteristics of the population we're interested in. So we give them participation vouchers or coupons and uh, they will distribute them to other members of the uh, same population and RDS is based on an encouragement to participate either with money or well, the idea is to in, is to give people an encouragement to participate. It's really a restricted uh, snowballing approach. We try not to saturate the networks of the participants so that we get a sample that is really representative for several RDS validation criteria, which I will not dwell over. Now, based on the same, on the epidemiology based strategy, we elaborated a model, a more global model with three purposes preserve the uh, epidemiology importance. We need to be fully aware of the situation regarding this or that infection. I mean, that is an absolute prerequisite. Second aim, knowing the uh, size of the population, because if you want to do something and, and have an intervention study, then you have to be aware of the size of the population and the coverage offered by RDS. And the model is based on very strong uh, community application. I mean, that's absolutely essential for those populations, especially the vulnerable populations. We're talking about how to organize the RDS site in a community location and uh, involvement within the uh, site, welcoming the participants, uh, screening them, collecting RDRD data prevention. And finally, referring to them to the uh, to the right uh, healthcare professional for care, because if you screen people and then you don't treat them, you've only half solved the problem. One example of application of the model I just described, the uh, DRIVE trial in Vietnam in the population of injectable drug users the city is Haiphong, 2 million inhabitants. We tried to apply the model. And in order to encourage a large coverage, there were three consecutive RDSs. The first RDS served as the uh, epidemiology baseline situation. And it also served to calculate the size of the sample with this capture, recapture, relatively conventional approach. For each RDS, the community uh, representatives or the community groups that we work with, uh, there are seven of those, they conducted the HIV uh, screening tests. They also uh, asked the people to fill in questionnaires regarding their use, their behavior, and they provided support to the participants with help and support to uh, join the methadone program or HIV uh, treatment for those who needed it. Evaluation of the strategy was carried out uh, using an ex ante ex post approach, and we performed a fourth RDS effort. We estimated the prevalence of iremia. That is the proportion of uh, participants within the population that have a detectable viral load that is, is higher than a thousand copies. That's the cutoff we used, and we compared that to Varimia, uh, that Varimia uh, prevalence, which represents the potential transmission of HIV within the population. So we recruited over 1,300, 1,400 participants for each RDS effort. And uh, we've been able to estimate that there are about 5,000 uh, injectable uh, drug users uh, 
who were injecting drugs at the time of the study. And this has given us better knowledge uh, of the distribution of uh, users in Haiphong, uh, the number of people on methadone who no longer inject or, or people who are held in detention centers or rehabilitation centers. So the outcomes of that uh, program have shown that this is a very effective and efficient strategy. We, the population coverage ratio is about 60 percent. Looking at injectable drug users, so uh, 3,000 different people were recruited into the RDS uh, effort, uh, and we have uh, significantly improved the care cascade. And our baseline was pretty high already for that population, reduced by 60 percent HIV viremia. Uh, down from 8 to 3 percent with a significant uh, contribution of uh, intervention to that reduction. So epidemiology, intervention. I know this may not be uh, fashionable these days, but coordinating the two means you need to perform a first uh, RDS effort. Uh, first, you need to estimate the epidemic, see whether or not it's under control. I, I used HIV as an example, but you can apply the same recipe to other infections. And if the epidemic is not uh, under control, repeat further RDS efforts so as to improve coverage and identify the different gaps or obstacles that may stand in the way of that uh, care came, that care cascade. So the model works really well for HIV. It has helped uh, eliminate uh, HIV among uh, this uh, injectable drug user population in Vietnam. Can it work in other fields against other infections? That is the question. So as part of the DRIVE program, which is funded by the agency, actually we have included in that DRIVE C uh, a particular aspect. So, Hep C control using the exact same approach, and we use the third RDS uh, drive. Uh, plus, uh, users who were included from cohorts, so we included them in a community based strategy. So, screening was performed at the time of the RDS uh, drive, uh, and also peer references in three different clinics across the city for an, uh, for an HVC consultation and a simplified antiretroviral strategy. We have identified over 1,200 people with a Hep C in Haiphong, well, talking about injectable drug users. And by and large, we've been able to cure over 75% of them, so more specifically 77%. And if we limit the scope to people who completed the treatment, we find the same rates that we find in literature. So 96% cure rate. Now, what about those lost to follow-up? Those are individuals who either deceased or a 4% mortality rate in that population. So they either died or were in prison at the time of follow-up. Now, this is often the case, but these are drug users uh, are, are prone to mental health problems. And in Vietnam, there is zero access to mental care, even uh, when the person's been diagnosed. And this is why we've worked with Laurent Michel, who's an addictologist right here in Paris. And together with this gentleman, we have, ident we have uh, put together a strategy. At community level, we use very simple, suitable questionnaires. We ask uh, questions uh, from DRIVE project participants that may present with significant uh, 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 risks of depression or even suicide ideation. So we're working with psychiatrists at community level. And the outcome, once again, is very, very good. We're reducing those mental health disorders among the participants. So this is an effective model on several fronts against several infections. Can this be adapted to other circumstances besides Vietnam? I understand that uh, Vietnam is not like any other place, that this is a challenge that we decided to address. So maybe we can adapt that model in France. And we decided to keep things simple. 
we did this back home in Montpellier. So this is an iconic project, and it's called Icon. And it's being driven by Hélène Donadieu, who's an addictologist at the University Hospital in uh, Montpellier. She's working in our department. So we used the exact same model, but we adapted it. We performed an RDS drive with financial incentives. So 50 uh, euro after participating and 20 euro per coupon and three coupons per person. And also there's a temporary and neutral RDS site. And we have an only one approach. So the drug users would come to the site. They, they are screened. There is a gene expert on site in case they test positive. There's a medical consultation using a fibro scan and they go home with a prescription for antiretrovirals. So they get peer support. We recruited the peers for that study and uh, they, they, they're escorted uh, to the pharmacy to go get the drugs. The pharmacy is nearby. So the eligibility criteria, the participants have to be drug users, not necessarily injectable drug users, but uh, other drugs besides uh, cannabis, alcohol, or, or, or tobacco. So this was a very effective uh, recruitment strategy. So this is the scheme. You have the, gre the seeds on the left and every recruiting wave in total over 550 participants recruited over 10 weeks. So as you can see, the curve continues to go up. We, we discontinue the process because we simply ran out of money, but we could have gone on longer. Now, what are the characteristics? What is the profile of those participants? Well, pretty traditional. Uh, 4.7 products uh, consumed on average, a lot of men, a lot of nationalities, and maybe 75% without fixed abode. Um, 29 nationalities, 35% uh, um, to drug users, uh, one third of participants uh, test a positive for hep C. And uh, out of the 49 that had hep C, we were able to treat uh, 37. 27 were cured out of the 29 different consultations. We decided that those who did not come weren't healed. So the results are extremely satisfactory. And the overall cost, the overall screening cost per user with hep C is 1,300 euros. So in absolute terms, it sounds like a lot of money, but considering the circumstances, it's peanuts. So I talked to a great length about injectable drug users. Can we adapt this model to other populations? Population peut Will the model prove as relevant for other populations? Maybe less so, but it's still a relevant approach. Uh, the model is remarkable. It's extremely adaptable. Now, this is an article that looks like uh, MSMs, men who have uh, sexual intercourse with other men. So in, we use coupons, but we can also use other products that will be more suitable for MSM networks. We can use other incentives besides money. We have several examples. Joseph talked about Senegal as an example. Senegal where this approach was also used. Also, when it comes to uh, female sex workers, I'd like to uh, reference the FACETS uh, project uh, managed by Louis Monnier in Marseille. It's a remarkable project. Uh, they're working with uh, a migrant uh, female sex workers for whom we have zero data and they use the exact same model. Again, this model is extremely suitable for that particular situation. So you have to work within this particular community. It's a, it was an extremely community-based approach. And as you can see, this network is extremely fragmented, compartmentalized based on where those female sex workers come from, based on their origin. Uh, the outcomes are really interesting. Over 132 women were recruited out of Marseille, which is remarkable. And this means that later down the line, we can collect a whole lot of data, intervention data in particular for that population. So far, we've uh, carried out research progress. The, They've been supervised and funded by the agency. But can those projects turn, in, turn into programs? The answer is yes. In Vietnam, this has turned into the CHEER 
program. Uh, the drive a project has been stripped away of its research components, been turned into a program, a national HIV program funded by the World Fund, implemented in five different provinces in injectable drug users and among MSMs. Now, I talked about the ICON project in France. Thanks to funding from the agency, we will start the second edition of ICON. This is an implementation project, which is very significant. There's a whole evaluation aspect. We evaluate the problems in relation to implementation. Perrine and her team will work on four different sites, Marseille, Lyon, Paris, and Fort de France. This is where the RDS efforts will be carried out. In parallel to the second edition of ICON, ICON 2, we have submitted, we have submitted a new project under the new legislation to promote healthcare innovations, which means that RDS efforts can now be paid for by Social Security. So this application is currently uh, being evaluated. So we have cleared all the milestones and we are pretty confident that they will say yes. One final word before we conclude. This is a question that a lot of you may be asking yourselves. All of this is extremely interesting, but from an ethical point of view, how acceptable is it? Well, that is a question we did ask ourselves, obviously, and uh, we, we got the reassurance. We received a lot of questions from the ethics boards, whether in France or Vietnam, and as part of Article 51, the CCNE, well, the matter was referred to by the health insurance authorities to the CCNE. Now the future will tell which way they lean and where what they decide, but we're, we're pretty confident. And also there's a quality driven review that has looked at the problem uh, with a very specific focus that shows that there's a minimum risk for the participants and the re potential residual risk has to be addressed while involving um, the users uh, and the key populations as joint researchers. And this joint approach has been used in every project that I talked about. By way of conclusion, I hope I've convinced you that network-based uh, recruiting efforts uh, is extremely effective and efficient in terms of coverage. We address different populations, different circumstances. It's a very adaptable model. It's probably not sufficiently used in France. Clearly, it is more used, it is more widely used in uh, English-speaking countries. It's a very cost-effective model. And you can turn a project into a program, and I hope that uh, we'll be able to achieve that in the next few years. Uh, many thanks to all of our friends and colleagues at community level in Vietnam. Many thanks to all of the teams who were involved in the work that I presented today. Uh, the ICON project team, our friends and colleagues in Vietnam, our friends at FACETS, Didier Loreillard as well. Who's, who's been driving the Drive C project in Vietnam, and also our friends in the US have been part of this adventure from the get-go, and also the ANRS, of course, for their, uh, for their support to all of our projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola, for this fascinating presentation. Are there any questions? I have a quick question, a practical one. We're open to suggestions, obviously, that's a discussion we need to have with the beneficiaries, the potential participants to the RDA, stay reasonable. But but those populations are already pretty reasonable, so the incentives can be adapted. Maybe simply access to prevention efforts or reproductive health care, access to care. It's a big thing already because these are things that they, that those populations may not already have access to. Before turning 
to the audience for q and I'd like to mention that well, as you rightly said, together with your team, we're going to assess uh, uh, acceptability of RDS efforts uh, uh, based on different circumstances. Now, your experience in implementing RDS in different uh, uh, contexts, whether Haiphong in Vietnam or Montpellier or elsewhere, um, are there any country specific uh, uh, factors that uh, may make your lives easier or harder? Huh. Obstacles? I think that the if there are obstacles, they are more structural in nature. This has to do with the uh, local organizations or the regulatory bodies. They have less to do with the community per se. Um, what is it that makes us that makes it hard to set up that kind of intervention? Well, acceptability is not easy to achieve. For example, uh, drug users. The idea of financially incentivizing drug users doesn't go down well in most populations. That's where the obstacles lie. Basically, the headwinds are structural in nature. Questions? Thank you very much. That was fascinating. Maybe it's because it's an English sounding acronym. I love network based recruitment by definition. And the other reason why I enjoyed your talk so much is that uh, at the end of the day, we're talking about health. We're talking about prevention and we're addressing the needs of a community that may not have organized themselves uh, on the basis of nonprofits or groups, but over and beyond the less healthy aspects. And I don't know whether in Montpellier you have added additional care to that prevention effort, for example, HIV screening, STIs, sexually transmitted infections. Basically, bring health to people who don't usually have access to it. Is that something that's possible? I mean, peer educators, I don't like the term either, but peer educators, they, that's a, an effective solution in Africa. Could it not work in France as well? Because peer educators take a, a personal interest in advancing the, the health of their own community. You're absolutely right, that's the idea. Little people who are not exposed to prevention services or care and uh, and we give them that opportunity and we use their own peers to give them the services they need, the guidance that they need, the prevention they need. So those peers, we recruited them in Montpellier. Anyone who were not familiar with the CSAPA or the CARUD uh, facilities, we introduced them to them. In Montpellier, we focus on Hep C to try to see whether or not this would work. And for ICON too, we are going to branch out and include the Hep C, but also HIV and mental health. We'll see what happens. It's a challenge. Mental health is a challenge in France as well. Mental health among drug users, of course. And we need to find the mental health professionals. We need to find the psychiatrists and also STIs as well. You're absolutely right. So that's the idea. Now the question is, how do we bring them in? How do we uh, get them to come to that pop off, that temporary healthcare center and incentivize <coughs> them to come in? That's the question. But of course, there's a whole underlying package that we provide and uh, no. But obviously, the sky's the limit. We could offer screening services for cervical, cervic, cervical cancer, for example. But sampling is important because we need data. In Montpellier, we realized that we didn't have the data, that we weren't up to scratch when it comes to uh, eliminating hep C from drug-using populations. We had zero data on that because the only data we have comes from the 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 users of CSAPA or CAHOOT services. 
and this accounts for 50% of the target population. So this is a very powerful tool. Epidemiological accuracy is extremely powerful. It's not perfect, obviously, that's open to discussion, but it's accurate enough. So you combine the best of both worlds, epidemiology on the one hand and intervention on the other. And like I said, when an epidemic is not under control, you can uh, perform RDS efforts over and over and over again for intervention purposes to expand coverage as long as you need. Uh, do the peers do it all? Testing, uh, treatment, fiber scans on site, or do we have healthcare professionals on site as well? We have healthcare professionals on site. No, we didn't go that far. We didn't go as far as having the fiber scans performed by the peers. Yes. So there is a medical consultation on site and the healthcare professional performs the assessment. They evaluate the, the liver disease or they prescribe the anti, the direct antiretrovirals directly. So we have uh, uh, a rotation system. Uh, and physicians coming in from the CSAPA centers or the local university hospital. Thank you very <coughs> much. Thank you all. Oh, maybe one last question. There are two questions, actually. The lady who's already holding the microphone, and then please wait your turn. My name is Stephanie Ingo from MDM Médecins du Monde. Thank you for your talk. We're being, we are working with those populations specifically. What about the study in Vietnam? I have a question. When you set up that study, I mean, you're saying that out of the 700 participants, you have 27 people who were cured, but what is the, f what the, what is the loss to follow up rate? And what are your strategies for those people? The 27, actually the 27 people who were cured, that was in France, not in Vietnam, sorry, maybe I misspoke. We cured many more people in Vietnam. 25% of the uh, uh, 1,200 people who were diagnosed with hep C. Um, thank you for your question. You're absolutely right. This is not something that I addressed, but the contribution from the community, the role played by the community goes over and beyond the RDS drive. They, they ensure linkage to care, and then they, they follow up with the participants as they go through the care pathway. And so within the consultation itself, there's a, there's a representative as well. Uh, same thing as for HIV, sort of. Whatever works with HIV will work elsewhere. So the, that person in the care system was then tasked to Maintain contact, non-formal contact with the community and support the beneficiary and make sure that the patient actually adheres to the antiretroviral treatment. So that person is involved in the entire uh, care cascade. One last question, make it short, please. Now the project in Vietnam was successful in many ways. In particular, thanks to the amazing commitment and involvement of the teams there, that did a lot. I wonder whether or not you're enjoying the same uh, positive momentum in Montpellier. And what about ICON two? Or do are you, are you seeing the same support and the same involvement from the local community organizations? In France, huh, uh, France being what it is, it's going to be difficult for me to keep my answer short and sweet. Um, there's no equivalent. Uh, maybe to some extent, Nouvelle Lobe is one organization in Marseille, but there are very few purely community-based organizations that are involved in risk reduction, harm and risk reduction. So we recruited peers. They are, they are CARU type uh, beneficiaries and we worked with local um, organizations that manage those centers to find peers and train them and 
so that they would involve themselves in the RDS drives. Interestingly, the peers that we used, again, are drug users themselves. Okay, but their addiction is pretty much under control now. And so they've been employed by the nonprofits, by the association, and they're working full time now for those structures. So they're involved in this growing awareness and it's it's pretty interesting. Because it is important to add structure to the community and involve the members of the community even more. Thank you very much, Nicola. Now, I have the pleasure of welcoming Younes Yatin, who is National Coordinator for Prevention Problems, working with MSMs for the ALCS, Anti-AIDS Association in Morocco. He's also in charge of uh, remote medicine, and he will talk about respondent-driven sampling from the point of view of the community itself in Morocco. <laughs> Thank you very much for this kind introduction. I'd like to thank ANRS uh, for having invited me to deliver this presentation uh, regarding our work and the experience of this uh, community association, ASCS, uh, to fight HIV. But before my colleague delivers, uh, well, before my colleague uh, talked about ARDS methodology, the scientific part, I prefer to talk about the community share in the RDS uh, investigations. But before I talk about that, I'd like to uh, talk about the context and uh, the fight against HIV, which consists in reaching the key populations in Morocco. First of all, 4.3% uh, HSH uh, sex workers, 1.3 and 0.1 for the general population. This is a prevalence in the uh, of HIV and there is an, a hidden epidemic due to uh, the law, due to the legal aspects, uh, because uh, being a homosexual in Morocco means that you're discriminated. And there is also the legal status of sub-Saharan migrants in Morocco. And we also have to factor in the uh, issues uh, connected with having access to healthcare services, uh, the uh, schedule which is not respected, uh, uh, privacy which is not protected and people are afraid uh, that their privacy will not be complied with. There are several challenges regarding vulnerable populations in Morocco. S they are difficult to, to reach. There are vulnerable groups. There is no uh, structure for uh, investigation for these populations. Uh, there is uh, a big issue with the privacy. There is also the geographical social and cultural uh, representation issue if we want to have a good sample that is representative of the population. And finally, the fact that key populations are discriminated against and stigmatized. Now, for my presentation, I would like to uh, add to the RDS uh, part of uh, what my colleague said earlier with the local involvement uh, of uh, associations on again fighting HIV, focusing on new methods being used to recruit uh, <coughs> key populations and especially hidden populations. <coughs> Now, the contribution made by the community in the RDS uh, investigations, especially for uh, training purposes, because that's where the community can help, can help scientists and research on the field. The location of the site, 
on the relationship between the uh, study site and the mapping all around, identifying the seeds, so the community should identify the seeds, should uh, distribute the coupons, but in the community there is a very important role played by the screener. The screener can identify precisely what is happening, whether the coupon matches the uh, study criteria, whether this coupon is also a part of the uh, population uh, that the uh, study is investigating. Now, the process uh, of participation, there are two parts. There's the first visit, registration, the beneficiary is, is registered registered, sorry, to validate the coupon and also to obtain uh, consent. After that, we have a questionnaire re uh, regarding behavioral issues, biobehavioral issue. And there is also the uh, medical checkup with blood tests uh, for HIV and uh, hepatitis C. And finally, there is a medical examination in compliance with the association ethical rules and also the Ministry of Health ethical rules. The next phase is the explanation for the coupons so that coupons will be distributed to other peer educators and at the end of each visit we uh, distribute uh, condoms and gel and uh, also uh, information material. This is a slide of the RDS website, of the RDS site. We always try to find a site a location which is close to the association so that we can orient the beneficiaries towards people who will take action so that we don't cut the connection. We don't want to sever the link and we want people to continue being involved in the association prevention uh, programs. We always start with the screener because the screener is the one who delivers the coupon. And then there will be surveyors, investigators, and we use new technologies. We have a tablet-based uh, questionnaires. And finally, there is the examination phase. <coughs> Two or three doctors to manage the uh, large turnout because sometimes in one afternoon we will see 30 or 40 different uh, beneficiaries. <clears throat> At the end, the manager coupon is redistributed to them so that they can uh, give them to other peer educators. So the second stage is the uh, second appointment. Beneficiary comes back, the screener will validate the coupon. The uh, beneficiary will get the uh, blood test results uh, plus some counseling for other infectious diseases. And finally, there is secondary compensation. Now, the uh, coordinator or the program coordinator are always there to orient the person towards the uh, right type of action or the sexual health clinic. This is a survey conducted uh, with HSHs uh, in Morocco. We This is the page of a report uh, which was published after this report in partnership with the Ministry of Health and HAS. The idea was to expose evidence-based orientation to reinforce the involvement within the population. The investigation was, the survey was conducted in three uh, Moroccan towns, uh, Acadia, Marrakesh and Casablanca. The, uh, you have to be a man, you have to have had uh, annual intercourse with penetration with another man during the last six months. You must be uh, over 
18 and have either the French or Moroccan, or the Moroccan or foreign uh, nationality and having been in Morocco for the last six months and being able to give a consent. <coughs> and here we have the size of participants. And uh, here we have RDS with recru recruitment uh, schemes. In some sites, we uh, went to the ninth wave or sometimes in the, the, the 11th wave. But again, this is all a matter with uh, normative research. If we choose the seed well, we can go very far for as far as the waves are concerned. If we don't choose the seeds well, this may stop at the second or third wave. The RDS method has its advantages, but also its limitations. RDS allows to recruit people who are normally difficult to reach, especially from the fifth wave on. From wave one to wave four, these are people that we sometimes meet in our clinics or in our action territories. But starting with wave number six, those are people we have difficulties reaching with conventional programs. However, RDS is still relatively expensive for a uh, program to fight HIV. Here I have an estimate for all three sites. It's 21,600 euros. So it's still too expensive. Too time consuming also. Five weeks versus a uh, conventional program based on the peer educator approach. Second part of my uh, presentation regarding uh, social media based recruitment prevention uh, through the internet. We have repeatedly uh, mentioned that this uh, system was an advantage during COVID because uh, people did not have access. So we use the uh, social media, especially the chat applications, Grindr and uh, Gay Romeo. I'm not promoting any of those uh, websites. But I know what I'm talking about. Thanks to their help, we developed an informal partnership uh, to have access to data, to uh, disseminate information, and you know, stay in contact with the population in general. The uh, general objective was to provide adapted counseling remotely to internet users. The specific objectives consisted in going towards the uh, population's uh, increasing awareness so that we could vary the kind of approach. Well, on the one hand, we have the conventional approach and uh, in places where people meet and uh, over the internet to reinforce the data. And we also have, on the other hand, promotion of uh, services, especially the PrEP and the self-test projects. Because for ACS, uh, the two programs were the main object of promotion, chat applications. This platform is made of a uh, remote counseling uh, manager and counselors uh, who uh, provide counseling on uh, internet-based uh, prevention. We have five sites in Morocco, and we're looking at implementing three new sites on the eastern side. Here we have two pictures uh, from a counselor who is uh, doing the prep. Uh, he's uh, being challenged by a uh, social media user, and he's uh, either describing or promoting the, the association services. According to a mission on the diagnosis of the uh, internet-based prevention in 2020, 
61% of users uh, claimed that they had access to screening, medical consultations and uh, medical care through the chat applications. Example of community uh, survey on social networks. What I just said was that it was a community survey regarding the use of uh, prevention in thanks to the internet uh, in July 2022. There is also the sex tra survey for professional uh, MSMs, sex workers. EPIC is a survey regarding the impact on uh, professional sex work uh, MSM. And other results uh, from the study are based on social network, plus a, a vector to distribute brochures, videos, and organize webinars with the target population. The advantages and disadvantages or limitations. Advantages uh, that are provided by populations who do not come to our prevention structures. Sometimes those populations have a slightly different statute. I mean, we live in an Arab Muslim uh, context and there are social issues. Having seeds or subpopulations would be okay, but the only way to reach them is prevention or social media. And it also helps determine where the, popula the target population can receive services. But social networks do not allow to reach all of the population, unfortunately, because there is an issue with access to internet, to access to technologies. And we also have to give a reference for service or orientation towards uh, service access. In conclusion, during my presentation, I did not go into too many scientific details. I mean, there are researchers who will do that better than I can. But I'm here to reinforce, coordinate the, science, the work of researchers so that we can share a community research. It's a kind of collaboration or partnership with the population. It's called it that way. We need researchers to improve the programs and the researchers, they need us because we're on the field and they, they want us to go on the field. So it's really a partnership between us. And facing the uh, context uh, challenge, uh, adoption of innovate, innovating techniques is absolutely essential if we want to implement research programs. The SCS community reaches the most vulnerable populations. Thank you very much for your attention. Merci, Younes. Valentin, thank you. Thank you, Younes. Valentin, you have a question? Yes, I have a question regarding the seeds, because you showed how important it is to choose the right seed. So who does that? Who chooses it? Who chooses them? Are there any objective criteria? Yes, of course. Well, there is a preparation work before we do anything else. So it's about finding educators, mapping the situation, finding where the sites are, and then targeting or looking for subpopulations. For MSMs, there are subpopulations. We have professional sex worker MSMs, uh, but there are bisexuals. And according to the latest research, there are even transvestites. But again, we take in consideration all the work. I have a question. Was it simple for a network like Grindr to accept messages? Well, I, I'm not hiding anything. I know that in Europe, uh, in northern countries, you have difficulties uh, negotiating with Grindr. Otherwise, it's too expensive 
to uh, disseminate the links or promote the services. So what we did was that we based ourselves on a relational report. I have one contact who is a manager in the foundation and I told him about our association, how much work we were doing, what we were doing on the field, the clinics we organized. And the gentleman said, yes, but uh, do we know whether these people have activities? Because Morocco is a country in Africa where we have this kind of issue. And I said, oh, there's only one solution. I have invited the uh, Moroccan grinder, mine, grinder manager, and I've organized a meeting in the association, and they we discussed the uh, territories for action, and then I got the uh, authorization to use grinder databases to promote services, to look for data. But it's um, I had to negotiate with the foundation. Are there any more questions? Thank you very much, Younes, uh, and we move on to the next speaker. The next speaker will be Marion Di Ciaccio. She uh, has a PhD on uh, sociology of health, and she is going to tell us about the hypergay trial. She then went on to work with the uh, Coalition Plus community laboratory that she, where she still works on PrEP, uh, on MSMs, uh, HIV uh, population, key populations, and the access to uh, PrEP for to uh, prevention for people who inject drugs. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank ANRS for giving me the opportunity to be with you today to talk about innovation, players, and stakeholders in community healthcare based on the EPIC program. First of all, I'd like to introduce the uh, EPIC program with its objectives and design, and then more specifically, the quality study that was conducted with the uh, health community actors, both male and female. The EPIC program is a community research which was conducted in between 2020 and 2022 with three main op uh, objectives. First of all, study the impact of the sanitary crisis on populations vulnerable to HIV and uh, hepatitis C virus, and study the impact uh, this has on those people who work with the community, local communities, and local community uh, healthcare agents. Finally, the idea was to study the adjustment of HIV players uh, living in a particular area, but that could be extended well beyond the uh, sanitary crisis. The EPIC uh, program uh, regarded uh, 87 structu 80 structures, and there was a total of 13,000 people who responded from 32 countries. 140 people were trained to process the questionnaires and conduct a quality interview. 67 quality interviews were conducted. And the objective of the study was to document how people adjust to innovation and uh, community uh, actions during the COVID-19 crisis. The quality study was based on semi-directive interviews uh, with uh, community healthcare agents. The, uh, to guarantee privacy, all the interviews were conducted by uh, consultants who were outside, came from outside of the association, and no one had access neither to the script nor to the audio of the interviews. The interview was multi-country. There was a guide shared by all the countries with two main parts. The first part was based on the person's history and how he or she had adjusted to the COVID crisis, professional habits, uh, how to manage stress and relationship with other community agents and uh, questions regarding HIV vaccination. And then the other part was based more on the strategies they had implemented to remain in contact with the beneficiaries and how they uh, were they concerned regarding the vulnerability of the beneficiaries. In order to analyze all the interviews, uh, we conducted a content uh, analysis with the NVivo in vivo uh, software. The first analysis was a vertical analysis in order to identify all the uh, problems related to um, 
the community, uh, the way the, the agents do adapted the community. And the second part was the horizontal analysis, where we talked only about the data we extracted during the first phase to start a process of uh, data organization by themes in order to make them consistent and well organized. In the study, in the uh, survey, there were 53 interviews conducted, uh, 10 in Mauritania, 13 in Burundi, 13 in Lebanon, 25 men, 27 women, and one who was non-binary, and the age uh, ranged from 27 to 56 years. Community agents were a wide panel of um, healthcare professionals with 20 people with a medical role, doctors, nurses, or specialized doctors such as dermatologists, and 33 were the non-medical role, peer educators, coordinators, project coordinators, mediators, uh, and people who also acted as support for the administration or the uh, organization management. Among the main items that emerged, we have four teams. Quick integration of interventional prevention protocols for COVID-19 and, and uh, awareness uh, regarding COVID for the beneficiaries. Now, that is not what I'm going to uh, look into in more detail. And I'd like to focus on how the uh, community agents were able to continue working during the COVID which means uh, reorganize, reorganizing the non-medical studies and the new services to meet the emerging needs and the reorganization of the antiretroviral drugs distribution. Non-medical activities. During the crisis, uh, most community organizations focused on essential and medical activities which were preserved as face-to-face -face interviews of so peer educators and non-medical community agents. Their work was obviously uh, very much impacted. They could no longer do their work in the structures. They could no longer be present on the field, especially after curfew. And they had fewer possibilities to be in contact or prolonged contact with the beneficiaries. So they had to reorganize their work online or with new modalities that were adapted to the, to the uh, uh, legal uh, constraints. An offer was made online, uh, virtual uh, counseling, for instance, during uh, psychological counseling during this period, and there could be a virtual response to the, to the request regarding awareness on sexual health, HIV and hepatitis C, normally done on the field, and now it was transferred to an online activity, and COVID prevention was also integrated, regular publications on social media, and also the possibility to discuss directly with a peer educator through uh, instant messaging to understand what people were offering and give them, make them, offer them services. Uh, condom distribution could not be organized online, uh, obviously. But during the COVID crisis, uh, we were out of stock uh, regarding on condoms, so sex workers did not have them anymore, MSMs either, and associations had trouble finding them. And local agents, uh, peer edu educators, they really used their network to get hold of some condoms, and they were distributing them in spite of the restrictions at night in the dark, so people would not be out of stock for preventive, preventative uh, measures. The COVID-19 crisis and the associated measures to prevent it led to uh, new vulnerabilities in key populations or populations living with HIV. Evil economic and uh, food-related vulnerability emerged, and also hygiene-related vulnerability, and uh, it led to uh, difficult situations in healthcare uh, centers. People were afraid of being contaminated when they went to get their treatment. They were afraid of bringing back the virus to their own family if they became contaminated. So we had to organize a community response and the money from the uh, community, the distribution of uh, hygiene kit uh, was organized. People on the field were distributing milk for the children. They were distributing masks and uh, hydraulic uh, hydroalcoholic gel for the hands, and also network uh, work on the network developed uh, to meet the needs of the populations. Because we're working in the Coalition Plus network, and those were people who had been working together for years to fight HIV, except here it was more a humanitarian kind of assistance that the people needed, so their skills were different, uh, and uh, we gave precedence to uh, skills that allowed them to help people. And also we wanted to, to work more on screening because uh, screening continued for HIV during this period, except 
that the people who were screened with an HIV positive test did not want to go to a center to do the confirmation test because they were afraid of catching HIV. So peer educators took the samples and took them to the laboratory so that people would have a confirmation test and uh, give them assistance uh, to, for access to care if needed. Regarding uh, ARV distribution, this sanitary crisis gave us an opportunity to develop new modalities, uh, limit uh, the travel because there were less uh, transports uh, available, and limit the exposure to COVID by uh, limiting the number of visits to the centers and also helping the people who were simply afraid of getting out of the home. Several things were implemented. Uh, the drug was distributed for a longer period of, of time. People got enough drugs for three to six months, whereas normally they only got uh, blisters for two months. And also there was uh, a community relay. And so one representative went to the center, took the drugs for all the people in his community, and then redistributed the treatment and the drugs within the, the community. And finally, peer educators organized also uh, home delivery and people would give them the code uh, and say, look, my code is this, but I don't want to go to the center. I'm afraid of getting out of my home. And so the peer community um, educators would actually deliver the, uh, the drugs at home so there would be no uh, discontinuity in the treatment. In conclusion, healthcare professionals and uh, play players uh, were they able to adapt their services to preserve them, either in face-to-face -face or online to uh, take in consideration the new emerging needs and provide solutions for those needs and integrate COVID-19 prevention in their daily activity, which means that the community system is very resilient and it's capable and it should be needed to involve them more in the public uh, policy response to help us reach the most vulnerable populations, which are very often not reached by the public uh, health uh, public policies. And also innovations were implemented by peer educator in other they sometimes belong to the most precarious populations. Sometimes uh, this afternoon people will talk about how precarious it can be to be a peer educator even outside of the crisis. But on the other hand, these peer educators quite get paid uh, by their research funds and that stopped during the COVID. So they, they, they had no more income. They, one of them was diabetic yeah, and uh, actually had not uh, received the treatment for the diabetes uh, throughout the crisis because he no longer had a uh, an, an income and yet he continued distributing condoms to uh, very precarious populations. And regarding the modality for ARV uh, retribution, it raises questions. What about the long term? Because when people come to the center to get hold of their treatment, it also gives us a chance to talk to them and see how things are going, if they have difficulty with their medication, if they need psychosocial support, legal support. So coming less often obviously means that we sometimes lost them from sight or it may also have jeopardized the uh, trust relation, trust-based relationship between us and them. I mean, those are all issues that we need to address in the coming years. Thank you very much for your attention. No questions, because you're a young researcher, and that was not the plan, but we will meet again in 15 minutes to talk about long-acting antiretrovirals. We'll hear more about it. We'll talk about uh, sexual health community centers in action. 15-minute break. Thank you. Let's uh, get uh, started with part two of today's session. We will discuss long-acting antiretrovirals, uh, uh, sexual uh, health uh, community centers, and sexual health in action. I hand over to the moderator. Let us now welcome Clutu Dalavena. She is an infectiologist at the University at the Teaching Hospital in Nantes. She's been, she's had clinical activity for over 30 years. She's uh, heavily involved uh, in clinical research and she's the main investigator in a project that looks at HIV and aging. Hello. Let me talk to you about the long acting antiretrovirals, ARVs, on a personal note. I am faced with two different challenges. Please speak closer to the mic, thank you. So two personal challenges. 
I'm a clinician. And here, uh, I'm dealing with an audience mostly comprised of social scientists. That's my first challenge. Secondly, uh, I only have 20 minutes. Let me start by uh, painting the big picture. What's available, what's almost available in terms of long-acting treatment, uh, both in terms of treatment and in terms of uh, prevention. New formulations, new drugs, new systems currently being developed, and then we'll discuss the challenges and the difficulties. Long-acting drugs, it's a new thing for HIV. It's not a new thing in medicine in general. We use it with annual infusions for the treatment of osteoporosis and antipsychotics with intramuscular uh, injections of three months or also contraceptives, uh, contraceptive implants in particular. So there's a wide variety of different uh, technologies and devices to ensure delivery of the drug in a long acting way. So what about HIV? This is a very busy slide, but it's on purpose. I simply want to show you how many drugs that are lots of long acting drugs currently under development or existing drugs that have been around for a long time or that are being developed with new uh, formulas to become long acting. At the moment, there are three products available, three quote unquote molecules. Two of these molecules, well, it's a combination of cobaltogravil and uh, vilpivirine. And these products are being developed as part of a virally, virologically controlled patients, vir virologically controlled patient program. So this combination of CAB and RPV has shown to be non-inferior to the other standards of care, uh, pair os Safety at the injection site goes down over time, but is by and large satisfactory. Very few people discontinue. The uh, failure rate is low. Virological uh, failure rate is low, between 1 and 1.5 percent. It depends on the study. The virological failure rate may be low, but four factors have been associated uh, with the risk of failure. The presence of uh, resistance mutations, of resistance uh, to ropivirine at baseline, uh, subtypes, in particular. But the risk of failure is very significant when there are at least two of these factors present. In 80% of cases, those failures happened during the first 48 weeks of treatment. But very often, there are mutation resistance that emerge. Uh, when it comes to the integrase in particular, at the time of failure, but in 80% of cases, we had the presence of at least two factors associated with the risk of failure or errors in the prescription indications. For example, the drug was injected late. And based on those uh, studies, uh, this uh, long acting combination was approved by the American, the, the regulatory authorities in America, Australia, and France in December 2021. And it's now indicated for virologically controlled patients. There's a second molecule that is available, and it's called lenacapavir. It's the first product of its class. It's a capsid inhibitor. This inhibitor is active both at the early stage and the late stage of the replication cycle. It's a small molecule uh, active at picomolar doses. And it's got two specificities. First of all, high synergy and no cross resistance with currently approved uh, ARVs. And also it can be administered orally as well as subcutaneously every six months. Now, based on those two assets, on the one hand, it's been, uh, it's been used in patients uh, uh, who failed uh, following previous high-dose treatment. And 
Lecapivir injected subcutaneously every six months is combined with the optimized treatment, which is obviously uh, taken orally once a day. So the efficacy results in this multi-resistant uh, population is interesting, 80% efficacy, whether at uh, 28 to 52 weeks. What you need to bear in mind is that even in cases of failure, we see the emergence of resistance mutations, particularly when lenacapivir is used as a single agent, functionally speaking. Now, lenacapivir was also evaluated as a first line. At the moment, it is the only long-acting ARV that has been evaluated as a first line of treatment. Because it is long-acting, well, it needs to be combined with molecules that are not long-acting. In this study called Calibrate, uh, those other drugs are administered every day. So first, lenacapivir is administered every six months, associated with uh, the other drug uh, uh, for 24 weeks. And then after the 24 weeks, you replace it with either TAF or BIC. So at 80 weeks, and this was uh, presented uh, recently, um, for a first line uh, treatment, the results aren't that outstanding. The failure rate, this is a phase two trial. The number of virological failures comes to six for lenacapivir. And in four out of those six cases, uh, resistance mutations appeared. What we're saying is that this virological uh, failure can be in part uh, uh, explained by failure to adhere to the other drug treatment combined with uh, lenacapivir. So the problem with those long-acting products is that they need to be combined with other long-acting uh, drugs to ensure a proper efficacy to make sure that there are no adherence problem. So lenacapivir was approved for early access by the HAS, uh, Health Authority in France, uh, in uh, populations that uh, that have received a previous uh, high-dose uh, treatment and who failed to respond to treatment. And here we're using it as just a new ARV. Now, Islaprovil is the other molecule. It is, all, it is also the first molecule of its class. It's a uh, it's a nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. Uh, it inhibits wild tap and multi-drug resistant HIV strains. There's a high genetic barrier to resistance. It has a very long half-life. It can be used orally, per os, uh, every day, every week, every month, or it can be injected every two months. It can also be administered in the form of implants. So the laboratory has developed a plan for all situations, both orally in combination with dorovirin with a new non-nucleoside analog taken orally uh, every week, or in combination with lenacapavir, either taken orally or as an injectable. And as part of PrEP programs, it can be taken orally once a month or once a year in the form of implants. Wow. It's a perfect combination, isn't it? But in 2021, uh, because there was an unexplained drop in the CD4s in the studies, particularly the PrEP studies, there was also a drop in uh, lymphocytes. And so um, this continuation was requested by the authorities. So how can we explain that? Well, maybe there are those related immunological concerns. Maybe it's a question of mitochondrial toxicity. Or maybe it's an accelerated apoptotic process. So the FDA authorized once again a couple more studies. There's one in particular on Islaprovil taken every day and Isletravir developed as a long-acting drug. Well, nothing is clear there. In any case, the studies have been interrupted. Ibelizumab is a monoclonal antibody, an anti-CD4 
monoclonal antibody, which is indicated in patients who have virologically failed. It's uh, considered in, in association in combination with an optimized treatment. It's a long acting product to be injected every two weeks. Uh, so the study looks at uh, a highly pretreated, highly resistant population. And the study has shown that ibelizumab associated with uh, uh, an optimized treatment shows satisfactory efficacy in that population. And the US authorities have approved marketing of that drug in March 2018. And in Europe, an announcement was made in April 2022. The laboratory announced that they would not market that drug in European countries because they simply could not come to an agreement uh, uh, in terms of prices and uh, and uh, reasonment bent by the health authorities. Now, this is a long-standing problem, the cost of treatment. Now, broadly neutralizing antibodies, again, those are not ARVs. Those BNABs are indicated and developed for curative purposes, and the goal is to reduce the reservoir, but that can also be used uh, as a treatment or even as a pre-exposure pre-prophylaxis and also in combination with ARVs also because of the long half-life over two months. So the can and should be used in combination to avoid resistance. Why do I mention them? Because that is a phase one study that combines two B NABs with lenacapavir in patients under maintenance therapy. So the initial results uh, were published. And at this stage, they're interesting. So the studies are, are ongoing. What about prevention? We have cabotegravir. Two major uh, trials, HPTN 083 and 084. Uh, cabotegravir was compared with the benchmark PrEP, TTFFTC taken orally in two different populations. On the one hand, in the US, so MSMs in the US and transgender women, and in Africa, in women at a high risk of contracting HIV. This is a subsidy in adolescents, which is still ongoing. Now, when we, when we look at the results, no doubt about it, Cabotegravir is superior to TDFFTC, to Nafavir and Tracitabin. And the incidence of contaminations were, goes from 66 to 80%. Actually, the reduction in the rate of incidence. Now, the information was presented at the CROI uh, seminar. It is sometimes difficult to diagnose uh, certain infections for patients who were receiving uh, cabotegravir as a PrEP treatment. However, we found that the screening tests were being challenged because, well, it, did, it happened late and the contamination was very different than the primary infection. There were no clinical signs, very few. The viral load was extremely low. And in terms of zero conversion, that was diagnosed very late, which raises an issue when it comes to uh, post-prep uh, uh, surveillance. Since December 2021, uh, the U.S. has authorized cabotegravir as a PrEP treatment, but the WHO recommends incrementing cabotegravir as long as possible as a PrEP treatment. But Another question is, what test should you use for surveillance purposes? Maybe you need to look at the viral load during surveillance. But again, there's an economic problem. Uh, you have rapid uh, tests, and it's a different cost than constant monitoring. Lenacapavir is also being developed as a PrEP drug, and there are two uh, trials with similar designs. 
as uh, HPTN 83 and 84, same population, same designs. And so the, the studies are underway. The upside here is that this is a different mode of administration. The drugs are self-administered. It's one subcutaneous injection every six months. So these are the products currently available. But we find, particularly at the, the, the latest CRU edition, we've seen a lot of new things, new devices and long-acting formulas. In terms of CAB, cabotegravir, we know that uh, there are cabotegravir implants currently under development. And there are other formats as well. Cabotegravir was concentrated so as to reduce the injection volume so people could self-inject in the thigh or subcutaneously. Now the caveat, the upside, the downside is that even if you do reduce the injection volume, it's still high enough. It's still high enough that uh, um, that uh, you can uh, inject uh, once a month instead of every two months. And also the cabotegravir implants have to be removable. They're also working on ultra long acting devices, ULA. And you don't need to worry about it for a whole year. So new technologies uh, to inject uh, polymers and you've affixed a molecule onto the polymers. It's a subcutaneous injection. So it's sort of a liquid implant. And this is the delivery system for the product. And the delivery takes place very, very slowly. Now, Another uh, ultra long acting device with a big tegravir. Again, these are nano formulas. You affix the molecule to the uh, nano uh, polymer, and this allows for very long release. This is currently being evaluated in rhesus macaques at the moment. This is still in the early stages. Proof of concept using tenofovir affixed to nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles which are also injected, so very long half-life. There are Isla-Preville circuitous implants that could be rechargeable. Again, this is a new technology that uses nanoparticles. These studies are, are currently underway in rhesus macaque monkeys. I know this sounds like a catalog, but you have the drugs, the devices, the new molecules, the new products, the new technologies. And because of all of that, uh, the field has expanded so much. You have biodegradable vaginal isla Prevere uh, implants uh, currently being studied in macaques. Intravaginal rings. Uh, of the piverine that you can leave in uh, three months. So we have the results, the efficacy results. This The efficacy level is not as good as for PrEP per os or, or PrEP injections, but this is still being developed particularly because those new delivery systems are more acceptable. The RACHER study on acceptability of those studies is currently underway. So uh, TAF and uh, Evitegravir vaginal inserts, uh, this will be turned into a vaginal insert. The study is underway in macaques and also at enough of your vaginal rings, which you can leave in three months. So phase one studies are currently underway. So this gives you an idea of what we're dealing with and uh, what uh, we can look forward to. Obviously, there are still challenges ahead. There are populations uh, that are still left by the wayside for many different reasons. Uh, pregnant women for cabotegravir result. Cabotegravir studies. Again, this is not an inclusion criterion, but say one of the cohort members of becomes pregnant, uh, uh, they can still continue the trial under surveillance. Same thing for PrEP. And then you have children. that are a number of studies underway. Moshe or CREM for even younger children from 2 to 12 year olds. Uh, and then 
the co-infection between Hep V and HIV for those studies when there are in those studies we need to do screening, propose vaccination. This should be combined with care. Other challenges include at the moment we have four long acting products. Two for maintenance purposes. We have lenacapivir and maybe even maybe even ibalizumab, but not in Europe uh, for for multi-resistant uh, and highly treated patients. And we have a single long-acting strategy that has been validated right now, the combination between cabotegravir and rolpivirin. There's nothing else. Uh, as a first line, we have lenacapivir, which is currently being assessed, and we have no long-acting strategy. And we have very little data on toxicity, long-term safety of those long-acting products, particularly when injected. The challenge will be to find the right partner. For long-acting treatments, you need, to, you need at least two players. And we need to find a long-acting player, a long-acting partner that will have the same half-life so as to avoid uh, adherence problems. We have very few long-acting ARVs currently evaluated as a first-line treatment. Another problem is the virological uh, problem, the genetic barrier, stability of plasma concentration between the dough, the two regimens, the two administrations. Uh, many things have yet to be evaluated. How do you manage interaction, potential interaction? What about uh, weight gain? What about obesity, uh, which can cause a reduction in the drug concentration, uh, self-administration should be looked at. And also, cost is still a challenge. And uh, Severine Carrion will talk about implementation problems. In terms of uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, based on the data presented at the CROI uh, seminar, how do we diagnose failures? How do we monitor PrEP patients? We know that there are very few cases of virologic failure, at least they're less frequent than with TDFFTC, but there are frequent uh, resistance mutations for both classes of drugs. The question is maybe that's the price to pay today, the price to pay for better quality of life, better quality of life for PrEP users. Should we agree to paying such a dear price those cases of failure. That's a discussion that we need to have. And also, we have very we have very little data on long-term toxicity and low tolerability at the ejection site. So challenges include, we need an, a bespoke approach to PrEP for each profile. We need a specific prevention scheme, even for contraceptives today. That's what's happening. You need a tailored approach. And also, how are you going to monitor risks under PrEP, uh, measure the viral load, continue the rapid detection test, etc. Maybe think about developing long-acting combinations that uh, would uh, combine HIV prevention and prevention of STIs plus contraception. In female PrEP users. Lastly, I believe that we are at the crossroads. Uh, we are at the eve of a uh, paradigm shift. We are switching from triple therapy to dual therapy. We had four ARV classes that we used to combine. In the future, we'll have many other classes and maybe BNABs or monoclonal antibodies, and we wanted to combine all those different products. Uh, we're switching from oral QD to long-acting, uh, long-acting drugs to be uh, taken once a week, once a month, every six months. There are many drugs in clinical stages and preclinical pre stages at the moment. Maybe what we need is to stay ahead of the curve and anticipate uh, the time when they arrive on the market. So switching from 
uh, QD oral prep to long acting or even ultra long acting injectables or subcutaneous drugs or implants or patches, etc. We absolutely need to develop an a la carte approach to prep. We need the prep to be self-administered. We need to allow for that possibility. There are many new drugs and new devices uh, in the preclinical and clinical stages. Anything having to do with implementation and acceptability of those new modes of administration will be presented uh, in a moment by Séverine Carillon. And lastly, I would say that over and beyond the new products, the new formulas currently available, what we're interested in is the nanotechnologies. It is the nanotechnologies that will overhaul our therapeutic strategies and our prevention strategies. Thank you very much. Thank you for this overview. Yes, it did feel like you were reading out of a catalog so many proposed uh, solutions. Are, are there any questions for Clotilde Alavena? What is it that will determine your choice? Priority goes to the participants. Clotilde, I have a quick question. Yes, I'm Laurence. When PrEP fails, when Cabo based couple based prep fails i assume it's because the virus has become resistant to cabotegravir is that is that it yes you're right well that was a quick question there's a short answer uh, any other questions go ahead sir and then the other gentleman in the front go ahead Valérie Leroy from Toulouse University. Thank you very much, Clotilde Alavena, for this presentation. Yes, you listed a lot of things, but it's fascinating. Is it clearly we are moving forward, and that's a source of uh, encouragement. I do have one caveat, however, interaction with B. There's a real a challenge when it comes to implementation and feasibility. We're putting a lot of hope into these treatments. Young people, vulnerable populations in particular, are putting a lot of hope into those drugs. But what about Africa? Isn't that going to be a problem? Say you perform a routine hep B a screening. There's going to be major implementation problems uh, in places where the prevalence rate is so high. So how do we handle the other potential co-infections, which are so prevalent in those countries? I agree with you. The more we move forward, the more we gradually resolve some problems and the more new problems we find. Now, I haven't looked at that heavy in implementation of those uh, treatments in Africa, but it's going to be a real issue indeed. Now, they're also developing tenofovir, uh, long-acting tenofovir in the form of nanoparticles. Now, the POC publication just came out. We also need to look at developing long-acting drugs that could also work against Hep B. We have the same approach to HIV at the moment. We need a long act, uh, we need a long acting approach to affect both HIV and Hep B, and it's not undoable if you look at the drugs currently being developed. <coughs> Where's the microphone? I'm sorry, because of the uh, because of the spotlights, we can't see where the questions are coming from. What about co-infection with TB? In co-infected patients. Have you tried that? Well, we haven't gotten to that stage yet. We are not capable of, or rather, we know how to handle interaction with anti-TB drugs. Mm. Oral, oral once daily treatments, we know how to handle that, but we need to learn to handle interaction with long-acting treatments. 
And I think that uh, the onus is on pharmacologists to change the way they work. Their role is going to change over the next few years. Allow me to be provocative. And to keep it short, there are no more interactions with ARVs today. But when it comes to long-acting drugs, we will be faced with those new challenges. And we don't know how to resolve those problems yet. But we're learning. We have made a lot of progress already. And these are questions that we need to address. Uh, uh, François de Caux, Société Française, Société du Public, the French Public Health uh, Society, have a couple of uh, questions. Uh, do we still have people interested in PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis? Uh, Joseph Lamange talked about prevention. But these are things that date back to when I was much, much younger. Is that still a topic for research? Second question, what about your point of view as a clinician when it comes to long-term community engagement? Once those drugs and devices are available and implemented, how do you ensure long-term community engagement? What's your take on that? Alors, le, le, la PEP, uh Okay, when it comes to PEP, I did, I was pretty quick, but there are TAF and l vaginal implants, the studies on uh, macaque, on macaques to, to, to study PEP. Now, how do you combine PEP and long-acting drugs? Not today. I don't think it's a priority right now, but we still have PEP consultations in hospitals. We have departments for that with traditional treatments. Those treatments are changing much, but we still have a traditional approach, but it's not as though the treatments aren't working. Well, we have to be humble. When I said, when I started, I always used to say, always combine PrEP and PEP, basically, pre-exposure and post-exposure prophylaxis. When it comes to long-term community engagement, you're absolutely right. Mais je, je dirais, uh, on travaille avec, avec les communautés, avec les associations, mais on travaille pas mal. We work with the associations, we don't work now. We have always worked with associations and communities. These implementations for long-acting treatments, and we're not going to uh, check on the treatments. We get the feeling we're not going to uh, control them. Uh, you know, we don't. We're not there to check that the person takes uh, the pill and a glass of water. It does bother us. We don't go and see our patients every two months to give them their injections. The, the hospitals are completely overwhelmed, so it has to be done in the community. But we don't have the information whether the injections have been carried out or not. And we need to organize ourselves. It's uh, kind of uh, getting uh, organized so that people can contact us or inform us, you know, applications, uh, connection, uh, injection carried out at that date. And that gives us some certainty that the treatment was uh, done and we don't discover it several months later. We have a question from somebody watching remotely. Do you have any data regarding long-acting injectable PrEP drugs in pregnant women? No, not now, not as I speak. We know that there were a few pregnancies during the trial HASPT-084. So when it does happen, if the woman wants to continue the treatment, we give her capotegraphy. But we don't have any data. There is no alert regarding capotegraphy and pregnancy. There are pharmacology, uh, there is pharmacology data regarding uh, the dosage at the end of the uh, pregnancy. Maybe the dose is too low. 
So we'll have to look into that if we give Abu Jaber fear during pregnancy. But there were no um, problems with babies uh, suffering from malformations or anything. Okay, we need to move on. Thank you, Claudine. On va maintenant écouter Séverine Carillon, qui est anthropologue et chercheur associé au CEPED. Elle s'intéresse aux inégalités de santé, sociales de santé depuis une quinzaine d'années dans différents projets interdisciplinaires. Séverine Carillon a été en charge de plusieurs projets interdisciplinaires et elle a travaillé pour l'ANRS et Dakar. Elle va parler des injectables de longueur. Elle va parler des injectables de longueur. Merci. For having invited me, I'm Séverine Carillon, anthropologist in the field of healthcare. I've worked on two ANRS projects regarding injectable, long-acting uh, antiretroviral drugs, and I also worked on access to PrEP in migrant population in France. And that's what the starting point from for a uh, thinking process regarding uh, long-acting injectable uh, antiretroviral drugs. And this is what I'm going to try and uh, share with you on this present in this presentation, which will be uh, focusing on uh, injectable ARVs. So the use of ARV drugs uh, injected every eight weeks could be a good alternative to uh, tablets for both treatment and prevention of the infection. The studies carried out so within these studies uh, with the subjects uh, also um, showed the good acceptance by the subjects and good tolerance. Thanks to these trials, we can claim that there is clinical efficacy according to myomedical regime in a control experimental situation with some given subjects and in a given situation. Now, Beyond the efficacy, we don't know much regarding the uh, biomedical promise in the social context. We know very little regarding the distribution and uh, the real life use. Uh, anthropology work have shown that there is a lot of interpretation, logic, uh, constraints, negotiations uh, with a number of players being involved. Injectable ARV drugs do not are not an exception, and they are a social object at the stake of multiple challenges. I'm going to focus on social challenges uh, with the use of existing literature, but also uh, uh, with the use of two projects that I was involved in. The uh, CLAPT project, which was conducted in France in 2018-2019, aiming at identifying the perception and opinion of uh, potential users of injectable ARVs, both for treatment and prevention purposes. The qualitative study was conducted uh, by interviews with potential users, and uh, there were two publications, one paper showing the uh, very high level of interest uh, from the participants for injectable ARVs, and the second that actually shows ambivalent perception for the treatment and actually mitigates the uh, initial enthusiasm that was uh, quoted in the clinical project. The project was conducted uh, in Senegal 2021-2022 called TIVIH, Conditions of Acceptability of Injectable ARVs in Senegal. A qualitative study was conducted with interviews uh, with um, both uh, HIV patients and the healthcare professionals and players, showing the hopes that injectable ARVs had uh, raised, uh, but the difficulty also implementing the uh, the treatment. The preliminary results were pre presented last year at APRV, and uh, along the same lines, we also have a pilot project to introduce uh, injectable ARVs in Sen Senegal, which has recently been funded by ANRS. Both projects belong to the limited number of uh, studies on social sciences regarding in injectable ARV drugs. Social sciences were involved to improve acceptability and feasibility of the treatments in a very tight connection with the willingness to implement the treatments, to uh, program the treatments. So we're talking about research for access to ARVs. Research continues. The Cabulado project is a testimony. It's an interdisciplinary project regarding the feasibility for a treatment, an injectable treatment, in teenagers uh, living with HIV in five Western African and Central Africa countries. Also, social sciences can actually uh, address other questions. 
The drug is at the very heart of the response to the HIV epidemic. Uh, putting patients on ARVs uh, is a uh, public health strategy on the global level. It is an essential part of the uh, project to eradicate the disease within a larger context uh, connected with a larger presence of drugs in our societies and the extension of the pharmace pharmaceutical industry powers. There are new uh, administration modalities being implemented and tested and the diversification, according to the official recommendations, would aim at optimizing ARV use, improving patients' quality of life by offering uh, alternative treatment to the patients. A injectable ARVs or injectable treatments rather are used outside of the HIV infection for other healthcare uh, treatments, uh, including um, birth control. And it shows that it's it prevents uh, fatigue due to the to taking of drugs or the re lack of compliance. People grow tired of taking tablets and they have multiple expectations. They believe that there will be the protection of their private life. Uh, there will be a lesser risk of people discovering that you're actually on ARVs. And uh, it also improves the uh, difficulties uh, being observant to the treatment. So injectable ARVs, I, uh, my medical system uh, involved in a number of stakes and posing challenges. Just uh, as a reminder, not all patients are eligible for injectable ARVs. I won't go into details because my colleague uh, talked about that earlier. And the treatments are not available everywhere. To treat an infection, they are routinely prescribed in high-income countries, but not yet available in uh, low-income countries apart from clinical trials. To prevent infection, they, the injectables are not accessible outside of the clinical trials except in the US. And uh, obtaining the products even for a clinical trial is sometimes uh, quite difficult, as is shown by the QMSM project conducted in Western Africa, which was funded, if I'm not mistaken, by ANRS in September 2021. And they haven't yet gotten hold of the products. For treatment and prevention of the infection, there is also the challenge of uh, availability and uh, equality of access. There is the issue of cost, accessibility, and those are major challenges that we need to address. I don't want to go into too many details. I don't want to draw an exhaustive list of the challenges. I simply will limit myself to three social issues, medicalization, inequalities for in the access to treatment, and stigmatization. These are three challenges well known by those working on the social sciences regarding HIV. But uh, the uh, issue of injectable ARVs and prevention are actually shedding a new light on those issues. Medicalization. In 2016, the uh, appearance of tree therapies uh, allows uh, the disease to become a chronic disease rather than a lethal one. The paradigm of treatment uh, and prevention is the switch towards prevention. Injectable drugs uh, are part of the uh, process where treatments are changed and paradigms shift. The new in treatment injection must be carried out by a healthcare professional in hospital settings and sometimes in community settings. To treat infection, the products are administered in the form of two intramuscular injections every eight weeks, and there is a window of flexibility for seven days uh, versus the uh, scheduled date. The product is prof prevention is one in intramuscular infection every two months. Medical visits are therefore more frequent with injectable uh, medication rather versus uh, peros drugs. Um, however, we can ask whether injections are leading us to uh, exaggerate the, uh, the, treat the management of the patient. And this obviously has uh, an importance uh, because right now our uh, healthcare systems are already overwhelmed and understaffed, especially if we consider that uh, we uh, are trying to actually decrease medicalization for HIV rather than the other way around. For prevention and treatment, resources are limited, and the attempt to reduce uh, medicalization is actually making them easier to accept. But injectable ARVs, are they going to redefine the healthcare model or not? 
what role can association uh, stakeholders can play? And uh, I brings me to two observations. Research is needed on the implementation to understand how uh, injectables can be possibly uh, distributed by non-specialized uh, professionals. And also we have to think about uh, participation of associations uh, to develop this kind of process. Another question, how is the use of injectable ARVs going to change the life of the patient and the figure of the patient? In the CLAP uh, study in France, we uh, illustrated the fact that people were afraid they were going to lose autonomy because they were receiving uh, injections from a third party rather than taking pills themselves. In Senegal, this was not mentioned by the people participating in the research. Much the contrary, people actually talked about being free, having more freedom with injectable ARVs. They felt that they uh, had less responsibility and felt free. So in which context, for whom, and based on what decision will the injectable become uh, a, uh, a new uh, distribution? We have to reconfigure the autonomy of patients, the place they hold in the healthcare process. And these are all questions that we need to address. And medicalization, is this means that we are going to uh, change the political decision Taking the drug himself, uh, yourself rather than have using a healthcare professional, that is a, a political decision. These questions will be raised again and again and possibly even uh, repeated when uh, subcutaneous injected ARVs come on the market. Injections would be one of the uh, factors of over-medicalization or healthcare management. And the studies conducted within clinical trials mention injections uh, in connection with pain at the site of injection or adverse events. And they claim that these uh, adverse events decrease in time and injections are therefore not drawing any more interest in terms of uh, complications and adverse events. Injection in the literature does not seem to be totally innocuous. Uh, the study conducted in France in the CLAP project <coughs> shows that injections have a very ambivalent uh, perception and the uh, fact that they uh, remove the daily taking of the drug is uh, compensated by the, the danger and the fear of losing autonomy. In Senegal, there is both the hope of a lighter treatment and the fear of injection and the fear of uh, badly uh, conducted injection related uh, adverse events. This uh, is uh, certainly uh, to be taken seriously. So this ambivalence, how is it manifesting itself in the long term? The fear, will it be counterbalanced by the uh, perceived effects in which context for whom? And the fear relative to non-secure injections with uh, the thought of uh, pathogen transmission, uh, infections, everybody thinks about HIV. So. The safety of injections should be a priority in the uh, introduction of injectable ARVs, both for their implementation in practice, but both for research purposes. Outside of HIV for psychiatry, studies have shown uh, the efficacy of neuroleptic drugs injected uh, to the patients, but there are concerns regarding uh, the freedom left to the patient to, uh, or whether they uh, should be injected under constraint. And the fact that injectables can be forcefully injected is something that has been shown in the use of birth control drugs for women. And this is something that we need to take in consideration for both practical and research purposes, especially taking in consideration the uh, shared decision-making process. Injections should not be limited to, to uh, the fact that uh, healthcare professionals can impose this onto the patient unilaterally. It simply involves that we uh, regulate the way patients are managed uh, and we have to introduce a new kind of relationship between the patient and the healthcare professional, but this needs to be investigated. This brings me to the second challenge. Uh, inequalities, racial, social, economic, structural, which condition access to treatment. This has been analyzed in social science work. Uh, we know that access to treatment is hampered by inequalities between northern and southern countries, inequalities for the access to care, inequalities for prescriptions, and I will dwell on these two last points. 
the deployment of injectable ARVs regarding regardless of the context should not uh, hide uh, how difficult it may be for patients to go to the consultation for the injection and there are underlying uh, social inequalities here at stake. Injectables uh, contribute to biomedicalization of observance but doesn't solve the problem of therapeutic observance. They actually shift the matter of, uh, of compliance to uh, the treatment towards uh, the need to go to the clinic for the injection and the observance thereof. Therefore, injectables do not uh, remove the vulnerability of the patients uh, if they drop out of they discontinue the treatment. They also do not delete the inequalities, but we might may wonder whether they reproduce the inequalities, shift them, re reduce them, mitigate them, reconfigure them. And we have to take in consideration the social determining factors uh, in the implementation of the treatment to explore possible reconfiguration and reorganization of the latter. Inequalities of treatment could also be present during prescription. I mentioned this, not all patients are eligible for injectable treatment. Identifying the eligible candidates uh, has been mentioned in literature like a uh, one of the obstacles to the implementation. This has been mentioned by many infectiologists. To whom do we prescribe injectable ARVs? Question mark. In France, there is a literature, sociological literature showing that healthcare professionals actually categorize the patients who are eligible or not to a certain type of treatment. And this categorization is based on medical indications and eligibility and also uh, an, an, evalu an assessment of the patient's capacity or incapacity to take the treatment or have the necessary attitude and uh, preconceived ideas uh, are actually influencing the healthcare professional relationship to the patient. This begs the question. The proposed injections, on the basis of what uh, criteria is it uh, based? Uh, the ability to go to a medical appointment, their uh, lifestyle, their migration journey, etc. Those questions are more important uh, because uh, a study carried out at the PT hospital in Paris was recently published, and the study shows differences in pair uh, uh, ARV uh, treatment uh, prescriptions between patients, whether they're born in France or in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this difference cannot be explained solely on the basis of the uh, different vir virological or clinical situation. This means we need to uh, study the personal motivations of the uh, doctor who chooses a treatment on the basis of the person's ethnicity. So uh, look at the rationale behind the treatment to support uh, prescribers as they prescribe the drugs. Third challenge, stigma. We know the fear of stigma is a long-standing obstacle to access to care. It still shapes. Uh, it still shapes what happens with ARVs. Uh, now, injectable ARVs, uh, both in North and South, uh, uh, have a huge uh, potential for reducing stigma. In Senegal. In terms of people living with uh, HIV, injectables are unanimously hailed as a, a factor for a better discretion. And this is absolutely key. With injectables, the treatment becomes invisible. It's no longer materially visible. So injectables are yet one more a step towards making the disease invisible. And this would help to reduce stigma. This is in line with uh, uh, the analysis of ARVs as technologies for making the treatment invisible. And ARVs could actually help resolve social problems. So, yeah, invisibility may be a problem for some, but uh, these are still cross-cutting issues. This is an optimistic view. Which raises a lot of questions when it comes to reducing stigmas. People living with AIDS or PrEP users, what is their experience? What will injectables do to that visibility or lack thereof? Can we inject, uh, can we use injectables to reduce stigma? How much power do injectables wield when it comes to how people experience stigma? 
will injectables help produce new identities, new lives? Because it makes treatment invisible. Thanks for all these questions. We need to look at what injectables do to people's lives, sexual, emotional lives, and how they build their own identities from an operational point of view. If we explore those questions, this could help produce the proper messages when it comes to injectables in relation to stigma. Our optimism based on studies uh, looking at people that are not receiving injectables obviously should not uh, fuel uh, our self-complacency. But instead, we need to remember to exercise a critical thinking when it comes to the prerequisites that underlie those treatments and their emergence. In the course of this presentation, I shared with you my research. I evidenced three different challenges, but the list is not uh, exhaustive. Those challenges must be fine-tuned, explored further in a wide variety of different contexts, taking into account the different specificities, uh, treatment versus PrEP, key populations. We also need to look at the wide diversity of experiences, depending on the situation. Uh, injectable ERVs are heuristics. They're, they help us look at a variety of different questions, the reality of the disease in particular. And also this means new medical regulations for HIV prevention. And this means developing a critical and uh, global social science approach. We need to develop new schemes and arrangements based on existing theory. So based practice on theory, we also need to support clinical research and develop self-sending social questions in support of research. This is an incentive to continue exploring those themes. We need to understand what those new treatments mean in the lives of the people who use them. Treatment as prevention, for example. What is the experience for users, beneficiaries, and also caregivers? We need to look at convergence and divergence between promises and actual tools, between the experience and the promises. That way, we set up interdisciplinary research efforts that are both inclusive and suitable, while continuing to develop research efforts with the people concerned, taking into account changes in future therapeutics and context. However, this is contingent upon access to treatment, whether in the North or the South, and for everyone who needs it. Thank you for your attention. Could this lady speak any faster? Mm -mm. Thank you for this presentation, Sevrin. Sweet for thought. Any questions? Please wait for the room and microphone. Thank you very much for this presentation. Okay, je crois que c'est ça. Et après la présentation de la madame, hein, sur le développement des... I have a question when it comes to the development of new long-acting injectable ERVs. We're not getting any younger. And from time to time, we need to look back at the history of medicine. Streptomycin used to be prescribed against TB for one month. You stayed in hospital because you had TB in, a, in hospital because doctors were afraid that uh, people would not uh, take the drug and so they received one injection per day for an entire month and they had to stay in hospital and the injection was painful not forgetting the side effects now we doctors we interns were afraid of those side effects so when oral anti-tb drugs were developed and they proved to be effective we were happy because we no longer had to prescribe streptomycin Secondly, interferon, injectables, twice a week. 
That made such a difference, both for patients and for doctors. You could do this as an outpatient procedure, inject the interferon, monitor the patient, and then release him. And we were so happy when uh, the oral treatment became available. So I think that this is great progress. Long-acting injectables, it's a great step in the right direction, but maybe we need to look at specific targets as opposed to have a, a broad spectrum treatment. Because when you compare this with the use of contraceptives in women, well, contraception doesn't last an entire lifetime. Only while you want to regulate your ability to procreate, only then do you use a, a contraception. But in terms of long-acting treatments, you need to take into account all of those observations. And sometimes you need to go back, go down memory lane, look at the history of medicine. Hasn't this been done before? Why did they discontinue this, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And that way, we can maybe uh, propose even more effective uh, procedures because it, progress is important, but it should not happen to the detriment of patients. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, kind lady. Yes, we always need to take a step back, look at our history, take a broader view. Anything you'd like to add, Severine? Mm. What about you? Thank you very much. What you talked about actually reminds me of what we used to say and what we're still saying. Uh, engagement in clinical trials and is, uh, is, is often driven by uh, the uh, caregiver's uh, own misconceptions about whether or not the patient is capable of engaging with the process over the long term, sustainably. Second question, what else can we learn from other uh, fields uh, besides uh, infectious diseases? What must in that? Because there are a number of groups affected by other diseases, and therefore they're clinicians as well, and they have a long-standing practice of those, uh, of those modes of delivery, uh, self-surveillance, uh, self-testing, self-administration, etc., transgender individuals who self-administer hormones, for example. But what can we learn from literature? Anything that the literature can shed light on? Thank you very much, Francois, for this question. Yes. Yes, I think we can learn a lot from literature. J'ai évidemment parlé de la contraception dans la mesure où il y a l'idée. I talked about contraceptives because we want to have several tools that we can give women, and depending on their needs, we prescribe the right tool. And there's a wide variety of needs. So there are things we can learn from the field of contraceptives. What we need to do is to review literature to find out what we can learn from other diseases, diabetes particularly, particularly uh, injectable ARVs, for example. I'm not familiar with other types of literature, but uh, I think a lot can be done. We can learn a lot from other diseases. We need to review existing literature. And also, it's an opportunity to cross-pollinate. Let's not just focus on HIV. That's yet another opportunity to bring together different healthcare professionals and researchers who don't just work in the field of HIV. Let's look at where they agree, where they disagree, and also learn from what's already available. Thank you, Severin, for your talk. We can look at long-acting drugs uh, uh, as a maintenance uh, or substitute as, as a replacement treatment for opioids. This was presented as revolutionary for patients because it does reduce stigma, stigma attached to having to take a treatment every single day. But uh, the communities may disagree, and the international. Association of Drug Users did explain that you need to be careful with that kind of treatment because it feels like 
coercion. The person feels disempowered uh, when it comes to their own treatment and the choices they make every day. I don't think there's any work on long-acting drugs, and maybe that's something that we need to do, but I'm sure we can discuss that further in the future. Thank you. It's a good comparison. Thank you. In any case, Séverine Carignon. <coughs> Next speaker, please. I have the pleasure of welcoming Daniela Rojas Castro, Director of the Community Research and Strategic Information Department of Coalition, Coalition Plus. She's an esteemed researcher and she's a primary investigator for many projects, some of which have already been introduced, including EPIC and Sextra. Thank you, Daniela. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Okay, Stan I are the last two speakers after a very long day, so we, it's going to be difficult, but we need to wake you up. I'm sure you will address that challenge beautifully. Let's keep everybody awake. Okay, I took a trip down memory lane. I look at her history and the previous, uh, the previous speakers uh, have brought me back uh, to have brought me back to what truly matters, the nitty-gritty in the field. And let me tell you, preparing for this presentation has not been easy. There's a difference between what I think and what I can put into words and then what I say to other people and then what people actually understand, what they actually take home. So it's a series of concentric circles. So I'm having a lot of existential doubts about the message you're trying to get across, and we need to always get back to breast acts, head back to the words that we're using, okay? So in the title of my talk in particular, operationalizing, that's not even a f word in French, and I found that pretty interesting. <coughs> I think it's a concept used mostly in physics, which emerged in the 1930s. And then, okay, to operationalize, that's one thing. And then to innovate. What does it mean <coughs> to innovate? Well, there's a definition. You can look at the dictionary. And I know you can't read this because the font is too small. But basically, to innovate is to introduce something new and replace something old. Okay. But obviously, if we talk about innovating, we talk about lots of other things. We're talking about scale up, specificities, adaptation. So this is not an issue that I want to address. I just wanted to put a light on it, put a lantern on it. When we ask ourselves questions, we need to pay attention to the words we use, whether we talk about research and project implementation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One thing is clear when it comes to words. If we look at the history of medicine, if we look at uh, the history of uh, nonprofit movements, we need to look at the contribution of HIV to research. This is a request that emerged at the very beginning of the pandemic. And this has helped us move forward when it comes to community health issues. This is particularly true for HIV. We have always advocated that need to identify why what we needed to do for the community in order to meet their primary needs. And their primary need is to, for them to be involved in implementing research projects, interventions, services, you name it. You can't do for people without them being involved. This is a picture that I include on the screen. I know. We have a lot of tools available. But here, we're not talking about tools. We're talking about providing services, making sure that these services are delivered to people the right way. And how do we achieve that? We need to base ourselves on the principle of community health. And this is a principle we need to revisit regularly. 
So on the one hand, we have a holistic approach to community health, uh, which is based on the person's needs. And very often, those needs are impossible to identify, or maybe these solutions are ill-suited. We also need to uh, uh, the right. We also need the right approach to public health rationales. We need to innovate and provide uh, suitable services, health services. But as we do that, let's always defend human rights. Health care and human rights go hand in hand. We need to look at inequalities, discrimination, and stigma. We have the capabilities to extract information from the field. What's happening to the people experiencing HIV or Hep C or Hep B? We can extract that information. Thirdly, the community approach. Providing health <coughs> services requires a community, a community approach. Now, we'll talk about CoMSM co in a minute. I believe that the key factor is to build bridges. That's my favorite picture today. Sometimes you're not done building that bridge and it doesn't work because you can't get to the other side. And sometimes you have a beautiful bridge, okay? You have doctors and researchers and they do beautiful, beautiful things. And if you're lucky, then you can meet halfway. Sometimes you have amazing bridges that go side by side and some people go in one direction and and the others go in the other direction and you never cross paths. Now, this is a bridge in Peru and what I love is that people got together to build it and I know it looks very fragile, but it works. And maybe one day we will achieve bridges such as this one. I'm making you laugh. Very good. I'm keeping you awake. Okay, a couple of examples. This is not a research project. But we did use science. I think it's important as well. Yes. This is a research framework and this event is being funded by research, but I know it's possible to do research outside of the field of research. Like I said, this project is being funded by the initiative. And the goal is to evaluate uh, evaluation tools uh, for key populations <coughs> in the field. So community screening efforts. So once you've done that, once you've screened the population, when you've looked at the linkage to care, what is it that you can achieve or not? We know that linkage to care can be defined in many different ways. And that is why there is a need to perform an evaluation. Are we really having an impact on linkage to care and retention in care? Are we talking about this contribution to the community? So we have data. We have activities. We can show those activities, they're different, depending on the place. So like I said, the initiative is being funded in three different countries, uh, including Mali, Morocco, and Romania. So we wanted to look at how things are done over there. Because those community organizations, those community centers, have their own experience of research. And over and beyond, a formal evaluation uh, process. There is a need to put together the right energy in the right time to develop collaborative efforts. So we talk to doctors, people living with AIDS, uh, community players, etc. We wanted to hear different points of view. So this is still underway. And the, the outcomes are pretty uh, pretty traditional, and they do resonate with the other presentations we just heard. Now, there are different barriers that have to do with discrimination, the legal framework, the lack of information among 
caregivers acceptability of a person's sexual preference uh, among the family economic barriers mental health problems etc etc there's no such thing as a silver bullet the only silver bullet is is having an, a a holistic approach that takes into account the entire person and their ecosystem also there are innovative efforts to try and respond to those needs having workshops to help people develop their self-esteem improve their mental health financial aid so people have access to care training professionals looking at nutrition therapeutic mediation etc etc So we need to find new populations, reach new populations, and develop new services. It's the service we need to uh, obviously uh, devise. We don't want to reach populations for the sake of reaching the populations. This project funded by ANRS uh, started from an observation made in several countries, according to which, well, countries that thought, okay, we know that there are sex, male sex worker populations who use the internet and therefore escape, evade our action. We know they're there, but we don't know them. We don't know their needs. We don't see them. They're under the radar. We don't know whether we can provide a good answer and if our clean, in our clinic we can uh, do things that might be relevant to them. And this is the reason why we decided to uh, implement this project. It was supposed to start in April 2020. It was conducted in the end. But what I really want to share with you is how we got to a population which initially did not exist. We didn't know this population. Well, we used people, the help of people like UNES, because we had people on the field who had the right expertise, they had developed a mutual trust and they had a deep understanding of the research needs and they helped us reach those people, introduce the project to them. They uh, obviously gave us a lot of their time and uh, spent time with those people asking questions. Now, these are the preliminary results. We're conducting the uh, in-depth analysis. But what was interesting and in that way came out was that almost 1,800 male sex workers, which is one of the biggest samples of such a population, for whom sex working is uh, a secondary income and uh, who do not use uh, specialized escort websites. What my point is, if we had not had these people in the community, we would never have been able to reach people who claim for 40% of them having never had any relationship to a community, having never actually admitted to being sex workers to anyone in the community. Some of them had never been identified as uh, sex workers, although they did actually have intercourse in exchange for food or uh, other kinds of benefits. And 40% had never had access to any community service. But what really struck me most is that although we don't have the results yet. A service has already started in Bolivia. The fact that this study was conducted, the fact that we said, okay, we want to learn more about this population, actually gave birth to that structure. The structure was perceived like something who was uh, interested by their destiny and the services started. In conclusion, we have uh, many experiences that we should tap into from which we can learn, but I would never be able to uh, close my presentation without delivering a message. P 
peer educators play an essential role and the lack of knowledge, the lack of funding, the lack of statute and the uh, lack of uh, knowledge of these peer educators on a daily basis is really an issue. Thank you very much for your attention. Le dernier pont là, il est, il est où ce pont? What was the, where was the last bridge? China. Okay. Thank you very much, Daniela. Are there any questions? Younes, you have a question? Can we have a microphone? Uh, moi, je veux juste uh, ajouter uh, un petit... I'd like to add a comment regarding the end of Daniela's uh, presentation. A peer educator needs acknowledgement for the program, but that's not enough. They need commitment in the uh, association's policy making process because with policies, we can actually validate all the programs. So peer educators should not be only somebody who uses the services. They have to play a role in the policy determination. Yes, that was important, obviously. Thank you very much. More questions. Okay, Younes. There is one question here. No, sorry, my apologies. You talked about a statute, a status. You talked about political involvement in the noble sense of the, the word. How do you perceive this? Well, things are sometimes uh, only expressed in terms of regulations, but peer Educators, it's a word we use, but it's not a job, it's not a position, it's not something regulated, it's not legal. Acknowledgement for me is uh, very important. It gives peer educators a chance to have a contract, a, a, a proper retribution. We also can also uh, help them be safe because sometimes they work at night in dangerous places. So this is what I mean by a, a question of uh, status and also the role they play, what place we give them in a forum such as this. I mean, this is exceptional, this meeting, and it's really a model that I would like to continue. Maybe it has to do also with what we call peer mediations, peer mediators. It's a hot topic right now. And uh, it seems that uh, this issue is being promoted also on the institutional level. So it's, it's, it's an important issue. And maybe, Christian, you can uh, chime in. Yes, uh, Fabrice Pilochet, I'm from AIDS. I think we need to make a distinction between two things here. There are people who work for health services and they uh, make the connection between the healthcare services and the populations. And some of them do that plus something else. If they uh, are based in structures, which is not the structure that they work for in an association, a charity, they can also help people regain autonomy. And uh, they help them restore the balance of power between the offer of healthcare and what people are really, what we are really aiming to achieve, an offer that is adapted to the demand, to the, the requirements. So there is a slight difference here between healthcare mediator, somebody who, who is works for a hospital department, and people who uh, are there to help provide uh, support in the community. Actually, they the more or less they do the same thing. I mean, we're talking about collective empowerment. <coughs> we're talking of empowerment in the healthcare system. A lot was made possible in the fight against HIV. Simply the fact that you're here, ladies, when power was changed, the power 
balance was changed in the system that is fighting HIV. I'd like to make a comment following this very nice presentation. What Perrin said uh, regarding uh, healthcare mediation. I'm always a bit reluctant. Maybe that's me. Maybe that's personal. But healthcare mediation is actually a way for the institution to take hold of the work conducted by the association. They say we're going to do what the associations do, but we will not use people who have that particular profile. We will take people, we will train them top down, and they will do the work that the associations do normally. Whereas what we mean by peer educators, it, in peer education there's peer. So people who have been through the same problems and people who are not professionals, they are amateurs. They are laymen, and uh, it's very different from uh, underpaid uh, professionals who do not have this, this layman experience, derived knowledge. Mediation is a very French word. This is what we use in France. If you look at the literature, in, in, in English, they don't talk about mediation. They talk about peer navigation or peer working or community uh, workers. So maybe it's also a matter of terminology. Maybe we should find a better way to say this in French and uh, take the opportunity of the fact that we want to go to the community with people who are directly involved to make their role more professional, give them a real professional role, because actually what they do is mediation. Thank you. Thank you. And we have to build something together like that uh, bridge in Peru. Beautiful example. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Daniela. Well, this will be the last uh, presentation for today. Auguste Banks, uh, who is a PhD worker and she's going to talk about uh, sexual health uh, centers in action co msm uh, prep in uh, western africa thank you uh, for staying until the end i'd like to uh, share the results of commissem prep it was my phd work but it's also the princip article for the cohort this is the uh, summary of my presentation. I'll start with some background context and the methods uh, for COMESEM PREP, the main results, and there will be a discussion. For starters, regarding the HIV uh, epidemic in West Africa, it's a mixed type uh, epidemic uh, with a variable prevalence. 2021, 74% of the new infections uh, affected the key uh, populations and sexual partners. Uh, an example is MSMs, uh, where the prevalence is uh, multiplied tenfold in the last 10 years. But in spite of this concentrated epidemic, uh, MSMs have been kept outside of the HIV program. They are stigmatized, uh, marginalized, uh, they suffer from discriminatory attitude, and there is a lack of institutional support for them. So community structures dedicated to key populations are part of, are among the rare structures uh, which provide uh, diversified and adapted help and support to MSMs. In the same type of uh, community uh, structures, uh, CoMSM, uh, a cohort was uh, set up between 2015 and 2020. The aim was to assess the feasibility and the relevance of an overall management, preventative uh, management, uh, quarterly base uh, for MSMs in Western Africa. And the results showed that the participants who were eligible for the PrEP and that the PrEP was feasible in this context. However, one decade after the efficacy of PrEP was uh, shown, data in the African context uh, is uh, limited uh, and deployment uh, is halting. Very uh, few countries have national programs for PrEP, and uh, PrEP is mostly concentrated in Eastern and uh, Southern Africa and uh, other kinds of populations such as young women. 
Only rare studies in MSM in sub-Saharan Africa have shown that uh, there is a lack of knowledge for this tool, although it is felt to be interesting, and its use is very variable with observance and retention issues in the care after in, with passing years. This is one of the rare interventions uh, giving uh, PrEP to MSMs uh, in uh, Western Africa. It is a cohort study that attempted to uh, fill some of the uh, uncertainty uh, gaps. The uh, aim for Commissem PrEP was to assess acceptability and feasibility of PrEP uh, as part of a combined uh, offer for prevention in four clinics, the OASIS uh, uh, Center for uh, African Solidarity in Ouagadougou, the uh, Clinique de Confiance in Abidjan, the Teal Clinique Arcade Sida in Bamako, and the Lucia Center in Nou Lou Lome. These associations are pioneers in the fight against HIV. They conduct prevention activities, screening, and targeted management for MSMs, uh, and they have done this for years in collaboration with National Program to Fight uh, HIV. Commissem PrEP was the follow-up of COMSM. Inclusion started in November 2007. Yes, 2017, sorry, says the speaker, in Togo, then January 2018, Mali and Ivory Coast. After approximately three and a half years of follow-up, Commissem PrEP uh, was uh, stopped in uh, June of 2021 in all the countries. The work is conducted in partnership by academic teams and community association team, both European and African, funded by a NRSN initiative. 647 MSMs uh, with uh, the right eligibility criteria were recruited directly by CoMSM or outside of CoMSM. The CoMSM PrEP intervention was a global uh, management of sexual health, uh, quarterly based, including PrEP, in a continuous uh, fashion or on demand. The uh, participants having the choice to change, discontinue uh, the treatment. Uh, and uh, the follow-up included a clinical examination, IST uh, screening, uh, HIV screening, post-exposure treatment, uh, uh, hepatitis B vaccination, and distribution of condoms and lubricating uh, fluids. It was given free of charge, including the uh, reimbursement of transportation. Also, uh, individualized counseling was uh, provided by peer educators. If the, the uh, uh, screening was positive. The participants were taken in, uh, were managed immediately. And the last part of the intervention was collect collecting the social behavioral uh, data collected every three months with a questionnaire and the clinical data which was collected at every appointment. Now we're going to move to the main results. The microphone has gone off. Just uh, before I start talking about the results, I'd like to give you an idea of the main characteristics of the 647 participants. 40% uh, came from Mali, 20% uh, from the other countries, 60% from the other countries. The average age was 25. Most uh, defined themselves as being uh, bisexual, 35% as gay or homosexual. Half of them were unemployed. Regarding the gender identity, the vast majority define themselves as uh, being men or boys. And uh, regarding their sex partners for the last three months, months uh, more than a third said they had had more than two partners and 60% had occasional male partners. The principal article paper of the agreement was published in the Lancet HIV in July 2021. Almost 600 participants had been followed for a median duration of 18 months. At inclusion, 74% of participants chose PrEP on demand, and the proportion continued to remain the same throughout the trial. The study also raised observance issue, especially for those who chose uh, PrEP on demand, because 15 on 17 zero conversions were diagnosed among these users. In spite of these observance issues, uh, it was shown that adopting PrEP actually helped prevent 
new infections, new HIV infections, if we compare the incidence between the two cohorts, CoMSM and CoMSM PrEP. Finally, no uh, indication for risk compensation could be found because the uh, prevalence of the anal uh, intercourse without a, a condom, NASC, remained stable throughout the trial. In uh, another study uh, published in Journal of AIDS in 2020, we tried to understand uh, why introducing PrEP could uh, help uh, recruit participants with a very specific profile. After PrEP was incorporated, 91% of the CoMSM participants who were eligible actually registered for CoMSM PrEP. <coughs> Some of them were lost from sight uh, and others had to be recruited in CoMSM and we call them new participants outside of CoMSM. An analysis at inclusion was conducted to identify the fac factors uh, combined with the type of recruitment. 524 participants filled in the questionnaire at inclusion and 41% of them were new recruited, uh, newly recruited participants. They, uh, the new recruited uh, patients had a more uh, vulnerable profile than uh, those uh, recruited directly from CoMSM. Therefore, CoMSM actually uh, recruited uh, MSM uh, closer and uh, it was possible to widen uh, the uh, program to reach uh, populations which were further away from CoMSM and uh, we were able to use the uh, MSM networks uh, over time. Just to uh, go more in depth in the uh, results of the PRINCEP paper, we looked at the factors associated with PrEP, the use of PrEP and those associated with good compliance to CoMSM PrEP. The article was published in uh, CoMSC Public Health in September 2022. There were two uh, variables, uh, relevant variables, the use of PrEP and the observance of PrEP and uh, recent anal intercourse with only male uh, partners uh, and in the in intercourse where PrEP was used, we measured whether observers was correct or incorrect. And observers was correct, was considered as correct when the users used the uh, four uh, pills uh, in the week before the intercourse. Uh, and for PrEP on demand, it was considered as correct if they took the PrEP as prescribed, plus two plus one plus one. And uh, among those who declared anal intercourse, uh, the uh, PrEP uh, use rate was 70% and the observance uh, was 73% for correct observance when they uh, had used PrEP on demand. Three key messages uh, from the multivariate analysis. PrEP users have a greater chance of coming to the center outside of their appointment. And those who had contacted the peer educators outside of the appointment had more chances of having correct absorbance. Le plan socio-économique. Those who had vulnerabilities, uh, whether socioeconomic or psychosocial vulnerabilities, uh, were more were less likely to be uh, properly adherent to treatment. Those results indicate that the center's attractiveness and the support provided are actually drivers of helping to, for helping with the prep. <coughs> However, it also shows that vulnerability is a barrier to prep adherence. Now, we need more background information behind uh, the results of the uh, lead article. So we need to know who's at risk of a zero conversion and also their, pro their factors that determine HIV protection as part of a combined prevention offer. This article was published in AIDS and Behavior in April 2022. So the goal of this study is to investigate the rate and the predictive factors behind inefficient HIV protection. We built a, a variable of epidemiological interest to determine the rate of HIV protection, inefficient HIV protection. At the uh, latest anal intercourse with a male partner, we categorized the level um, of protection as efficient or inefficient. So after a mean follow-up time of 12 months from M3 to M36, an inefficient protection rate of 17% was found in the 2,839 <coughs> cases of intercourse. After apologies for that scream, mm, the interpreter got distracted. Bye-bye, dear colleague. Based on the multivariate analysis, participants with inefficient protection were more likely to be socially vulnerable. By way of conclusion, even though 
despite all those factors, the rate of inefficient protection uh, was uh, non negligible and persisted uh, after, or rather during follow up. But consequently, the PrEP programs uh, should be adapted based on MSM needs, uh, the needs of MSM who are socially vulnerable and could have a hard time adapting PrEP as part of their daily lives. In the fifth and last study that I'm going to present to you, we presented a longitudinal analysis. Our goal is to estimate the proportion of uh, participants lost to follow up at the end of the cohort and identify the related factors. This article was published in Viruses in October 2022. So we took an interest in the first uh, uh, loss to follow up uh, event, which is defined as uh, one participant who does not return after six months, even though he may have come back later. Here you see the median of follow up duration, which came to 15 months, and the participants accounted for a total of uh, almost uh, 5,000 uh, follow up uh, consultations uh, programmed at enrollment at M42. During the follow up, uh, almost 60% uh, of the participants were lost to follow up, and out of the 275 participants who were not lost to follow up, 25. Uh, Zero converted. One participant uh, dis died, and about 40% completed the follow up. The median duration of follow up for lost to follow up uh, participants was eight months, and out of the 372 uh, participants lost to follow up, but one third returned to care later, which shows, which means that uh, two thirds were lost to follow up for good. 50% of the participants uh, were lost to follow up between M0 and M12. One third the second year and the rest of them after M27. Uh, reasons behind the last to follow up uh, could be collected in half the cases. The reason um, provided most often was that they no longer wanted to be part of the study or, and then they left for another country. Now, in terms of the participants who re engaged with care based on the uh, study uh, personnel, uh, participants who missed their appointments because they were very mobile and they traveled a lot for work, etc. Or they said they had enough prep or they didn't feel the need to go to the clinic anymore. Now, based on the Cox multivariate analysis uh, uh, model, key risk factors are connected to the social, economic, and psychosocial vulnerability, as well as risk perception. There's a key protection factor that's contact with peer educators outside of the consultations, outside of the visits. And this study shows that retention in care is a key a problem to be addressed during prep programs, as well as potential drivers and barriers. Now, discussion. What are the key messages from CoSMSM PrEP? The rate of proper use and adherence for PrEP was high, and this has helped to reduce the incidence of, e of HIV between the two cohorts, CoMSM and CoMSM PrEP. In addition, the STI prevalence and uh, anal uh, intercourse without condoms, that remains stable during follow-up, but the inefficient protection rate against HIV was non-negligible. Uh, despite the retention problems, one-third of the participants lost their follow-up were able to return to care later. And one interesting outcome is that 75% uh, of participants chose PrEP on demand. Even though that scheme appeared more suitable to the participants in actual practice, the users had more observance or adherence problems, and uh, they represent the vast majority of uh, zero conversions. There's a cross-cutting uh, takeaway from all those results. A community approach is a potential driver for improving several steps in the PrEP care cascade. In our studies, peer awareness raising over time has made it possible to achieve a new uh, MSM profile at the beginning of PrEP, has influenced the uh, supply of PrEP at, in community uh, clinics, uh, and also peer education facilitated proper adherence to PrEP and also helped to protect participants from loss to follow up. Secondly, social and economic as well as psychosocial vulnerability is a barrier uh, several steps in the cascade. Uh, for example, users on demand who are financially precarious were less likely to adhere to treatment properly and were um, 
and we're more uh, more susceptible, we're more vulnerable to inefficient protection against the HIV. And also feeling alone uh, means that you're less likely to adhere to the PrEP treatment. Depression is also a risk factor when it comes to becoming lost to follow up. Isolation of the MSM community or isolation uh, as an MSM individual is a key predictive factor in terms of inefficient protection. Alcohol abuse is also a problem. So three key points. Firstly, COMSM PrEP results clearly uh, support uh, guidelines uh, for urgent implementation of PrEP in HIV prevention programs for MSM in West Africa. Our data indicates that uh, PrEP on demand uh, should be uh, proposed uh, on an ongoing basis in programs to help MSM adapt uh, PrEP intake to their needs. Uh, thanks in part to, to preliminary results from the cohort, every country in the study has now included PrEP in their national programs. Our results also show that retention in care and PrEP observance, PrEP adherence, requires specific attention so that PrEP can achieve its full potential in the region, particularly in uh, uh, socially and economically or even psychosocially vulnerable MSMs. Lastly, community methods and support from peer educators can help to improve uh, PrEP uh, initiation, engagement, and uh, disengagement. We recommend sustainable funding of community actions. Mm. Such funding will help to hire and train community stakeholders, particularly peer educators, who can help to improve a follow-up of PrEP users, also help improve the capabilities of nonprofits and local community clinics and promote advocacy work to better defend the rights of LGBTQ plus uh, individuals. Many thanks to MSM participants, peer educators, and the local teams who've taken part in the co-MSM prep study. Many thanks to ANRS and CIDAction for funding my dissertation. Many thanks to ANRS and Initiative for funding co-MSM prep and all of our partners. Thank you. Thank you for once again demonstrating uh, the upside of a community approach. I'm sure no one had any doubt about it, but just in case, a quick comment before Q&A, because this is very interesting. We're seeing strong correlations with uh, the Princess Project in Côte d'Ivoire, particularly when it comes to a loss, loss to follow up. Uh, when it comes to the most precarious people, like I said, three you said 75%, right? But they have specific problems. Did you change the approach for those populations? Um, last to follow up, is it higher in those populations? Is there a switch to and from prep on demand or a continuous prep? I know that there have been quite a few changes. Do you? Proportion of PrEP on demand users remains stable throughout the follow up process. I don't have much more information on that. We need to dig deeper. We cross referenced the information. That was a social and economic variable, and that was significant, but only for those populations. So, yeah, it's interesting. We need to dig deeper. And uh, were you able to explore this further qualitatively? No, because there's a, another project, specifically quality-driven project. And I don't know whether they looked at that. It could be interesting to do it, actually. Okay. Questions? This uh, resonates with what you said at the end of the day. If we look at the results, um, I hope I understood this properly because the font was too small for me to read. So the score is not as good for PrEP on demand as opposed to continuous PrEP. In the program, did you change anything to promote uh, continuous PrEP in some of the program beneficiaries? Because it's, it's, a, it's a problem. The, the failures you're seeing uh, when it comes to on-demand prep. Um, obviously, we leave this at the discretion uh, of the participants. Uh, it's up to them to choose which scheme they prefer. 
we can't go as far as saying that it's a failure because we're seeing difference differences in terms of incidence between prep and no prep at all i think we need to promote follow-up guidance and peer education for those users i think we mostly need to propose a scheme that best suits the needs of the beneficiaries okay so more customization okay bruno spear yes i'd like to say something people had a choice but if we tell them a continuous prep you should take continuous prep because it's better for you there's no guarantee that they will say that they will do it because we're not going to send a doctor to the person's home to put the tablet in their mouth no these are human beings and they behave as human beings and besides they're not sick so they make their own choices and for 75 percent of those individuals they preferred prep on demand and then we have that information so what we need to say is that be careful be even more careful and there are things we need to explore further one of the assumptions i liked very often we present prep on demand as something that you need to take before a high risk intercourse as opposed to uh, any kind of intercourse you got to understand that every uh, intercourse uh, presents a risk so that's something that we need to work on further so that people will realize that prep on demand should take place before any intercourse and not just uh, what you think is a high-risk intercourse. An additional thought, if I may. Things are going to shift over time. Individual learning. People learn as individuals, but the whole community learns as well. So when the message gets around prep educators, well, they talk about it, people start talking about it, and then they talk to each other and the choice between prep on demand and daily prep, that choice may change because the whole community is learning. Also, regarding self-testing and the fact that in countries that are self-test available and self-tests are proposed to peers so that they can distribute them around them, secondary distribution actually grew over time because it takes time for peer educators to grab hold of it, embrace it, and the whole community afterwards. So things are going to shift over time. We learn as a community, and this has an impact on the choices we make as individuals. Thank you very much for clarifying that. Thank you for staying awake so late. It's been a busy it's been a busy day and we're looking forward to another busy and informative day tomorrow. Have a great evening. The drinks are served. <laughs>